morning. Can we? Can, we, can I just uh, share my screen once and see? Hi. Can I just share my screen once and please, see? Please, please, ma'am. Please. So you will have to stop share from there. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Ma Already stop. Already stopped. Already stopped, stopped it, okay. I'll just one second. Can you see it? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes ma'am. Ma okay. 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 I'll just now stop share. All right. Thank you.
good morning all of you am i audible yes ma'am yes ma'am good morning all of you i dr hiba sami assistant professor in the department of microbiology jawaharlal nehru medical college aligarh bid a very warm welcome to all the esteemed faculty and delegates to the second day of 17th annual conference of hospital infection society of india sterilization and disinfection are the backbone of hospital infection control activities so there is a chance of transmission of infection from patient to patient from patient or to healthcare personnel and vice versa for as an example of hepatitis b or from the environment to the patient like as in pseudomonas aeruginosa acinetobacter through the improperly sterilized or disinfected devices not only the devices and instruments the sterilization and decontamination are important in hospital environment ot environment labs and everywhere so to cover this important aspect of hospital infection control i would like to invite our first speaker dr manisha biswal so dr manisha biswal is a professor in the department of medical microbiology pgimar chandigarh ma'am area of interest are hospital acquired infection and neglected bacterial diseases ma'am has worked a lot on typhus she has 60 publication in the field in national and international journals so i like to request ma'am to kindly deliver the talk on role of surface environment in infection prevention and control please ma'am good morning everybody the topic i'm going to speak about is the role of surface environment in infection prevention and control since this is only a 10 minute talk i am going to be touching upon briefly the following subheadings firstly the evidence that microbes are transferred from surfaces to patients which then go on to cause nosocomial infection and again briefly the role of cleaning which agents to use for cleaning a uh, little bit about the logistics of cleaning and what requirements um, are there in terms of what agents to use for clean and how do we test finally the efficacy of cleaning of surfaces all surfaces uh, all studies on surface contamination have the following caveats the results are dependent on the culturability of the organism the degree of shedding by the patient the ease of contamination of uh, or the difficulty of cleaning of that particular environment whether there is an ongoing outbreak at the time of sampling so this means at the time of outbreaks we are going to have more number of those organisms it totally depends on the sampling method that we have chosen and also the culture and whether we have used any molecular techniques to pick up these organisms so the experts believe that the studies on surface contamination are generally uh, under reporting the concentration and the spectrum of organisms that contaminate hospital surfaces because of the caveats so mostly the high touch surfaces are contaminated this is logical to reason out why usually the range of organisms is between 1 to 100 cfu per square centimeter of course organisms like norovirus for example are uh, much more concentrated on surfaces because when patients vomit etc etc the load is much higher than um, 100 cfu it can go up to 10 to the power 12 uh, cfu per a uh, centimeter square but in general it stays within this range not only do organisms contaminate surfaces some of them stay for very long on surfaces people have studied this is a compilation this is a review by kramer et al and bmc where they say that organisms and some of these are notorious nosocomial agents like acinetobacter klebsiella enterococcus they persist from hours to up to months for example acinetobacter for 5 months in certain studies c difficile spores 5 months in certain studies so this is a pretty long time and they remain viable on these surfaces same for fungi candida mostly aspergillus they persist on surfaces same for viruses also although the persistent period is less it is up to from a few hours to 3 months adenovirus is notorious for persistence so they persist and they remain clinically relevant on even dry inanimate surfaces so data is now emerging on covid viruses also all the red dots that are seen in this picture are where they have picked up the virus by pcr in another study where they have compared uh, the loads they have seen that uh relatively high city value the virus stays in um, 
surfaces like ambu mask and iv mask and then the load keeps on decreasing as the contact with the patient uh, decreases they have also cultured the virus all the red dots in this picture show where the virus was uh, isolated in culture so this is generally between 2 meters surface or uh, 2 meters distance of the surface where the virus was viable so just picking up the organism is not enough for a cause and effect criteria uh, to attribute significance the organisms that are picked up can actually should be proven to survive after inoculation onto the fomite the explanation the infection cannot be explained by any other recognized modes of uh, transmission of infection study is either retrospective or prospective should be able to show a definite association with that uh, infection and finally decontamination of those surfaces should result in a decrease or an elimination of infection under those scenarios so all these criteria need to be fulfilled for us to attribute causality to um, organisms with cause contamination this is a very elegant study from cid in 2013 where they have studied a so 6350 admissions over a 30 month period and they have found that after an mdro patient stays and goes and hydrogen peroxide is used for wound decontamination then the subsequent patients are 64% less likely to acquire any mdro and 80% less 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 likely to acquire bre so this is pretty strong evidence that the surface organisms contaminating hospital surface are actually contributing to nosocomial infection now there are many reviews on many other organisms and many other settings is uh, which are adding evidence to this fact the postulate is that the patient infected or colonized is shedding the organisms gram positive gram negative viruses and um, fungi on to equipment on to air and then from there on equipment for example can contaminate Uh, healthcare worker hands and then transmit to susceptible patients or they can be direct patient contact from one patient to the other so this is the postulate these are the various routes of transmission the focus here has been on mrsa and bre but there are similar postulates for gram negatives also so why is it that organisms persist for such a long time it is because people have seen microscopically that biofilms are formed on surfaces even on dry inanimate surfaces and they persist for a very long time even if there is even after terminal cleaning this is a study that looked at bre and uh, c diff after um, so called routine housekeeping cleaning and here you can see that a substantial proportion of surfaces continue to stay contaminated even after terminal after housekeeping cleaning which was eliminated after thorough cleaning by the research team this is showing uh, bre growing from a call button after cleaning by the housekeeping staff so this is the real life scenario and this is why we are able to culture so many organisms even after cleaning so we should clean but the clean role of cleaning should be practical it's not to eliminate or sterilize the environment but rather to significantly decrease the pathogen load so there are various um, guidelines many people have given many standards for clean surfaces in general they say um enterobacteria and also comel infection should be less than 1 cfu per cm2 although there are many guidelines if one wants to go into the details how to clean lots of guidelines generally it has to be planned and cleaned and left to dry the cdc guideline and the came out in 2019 best details out all the logistics the definitions of routine cleaning the scheduled cleaning the terminal cleaning and what how to go about cleaning is given very beautifully in this extensive document in india we have our own guidelines set out by uh kayakal and uh, they came out in 2015 where they give a list of uh, who is to clean what to wear while cleaning what surfaces to clean and the frequency of cleaning the basic cleaning methods everybody agrees are a dry method and a wet method which can be used for routine as well as terminal cleaning so the dry method we use um, either 
plain mops or microfiber cloths which are now coming out for the wet method the size of the double bucket or the single bucket what's important is the mop policy which everybody is generally very very ignored is the mop should be cleaned very regularly how to clean the actual process of cleaning is also detailed out in these uh, documents and a shape pattern so what to use for cleaning now there are microfiber cloths which are in, impregnated with disinfectants which are sometimes even biodegradable and flushable so it increases the cost um, however the results are usually excellent for the floor the z shaped or the s shaped uh, method of cleaning is generally recommended how do we test all these disinfectants there are so many in the market so in india we have the indian pharmacopeia commission who looks at handra uh, specifications we do not as yet have a regulatory body for disinfectants and bicidal products unless i am not updated so in general the choice of what disinfectant to be used is depends on the hospital the infection control team goes by the literature that is provided by the manufacturers of disinfectants the specifications are made and the literature certifies gives a certification then that is procured by the hospital the kayakal gives a list of hospital grade disinfectants alcohols chlorines phenolics water ammonium compounds of watts iodophores and then finally hydrogen peroxide this is the national um, ministry of health and family welfare guidelines up till now so these are the ones that have been recommended so these are all newer methods of decontamination the um, ultraviolet uh, light and hydrogen peroxide system lots of data i think a subsequent speaker is going to be detailing this out but in general this is being used very very frequently as these are non contact methods generally quite rapid and um, various forms it's been standardized as to what biological indicators have to be used same for ultraviolet as well as for hydrogen peroxide in general hydrogen peroxide is found to be very very efficacious wherever it has been used against a variety of organisms so there are many studies that have gone on to show the um, efficacy so this is um, uv light on uh, total bacteria and pathogenic bacteria so there is a reduction um, using these non touch techniques more details would be provided by the next speakers there are surfaces now copper is known for a long time to inhibit the growth of bacteria now there are self disinfecting surface technologies also this is also going to be talked about by a subsequent speaker so these surfaces are said to be bacteriostatic fungostatic and the material is such that it affords enables extremely efficient cleaning so how are we supposed to clean uh, assess the cleaning so there are non microbiological and microbiological um, methods non microbiological the commonest method is used as visual cleaning it should look clean other than that there are atp based and fluorescent dye methods which are being used in some setups but the microbiological uh, method either we culture or we perform molecular methods this it's important to note that we should not be conducting any random undirected microbiological sampling anywhere and it should only be as part of an epidemiologic uh, investigation I can place out certain units in the hospital where uh, routine monitoring should be done. Um, the list is there in their guidelines and how to assess uh, the cleaning has been done. Uh, also, has been the advantages and disadvantages of each method has also been listed out in the um, guidelines. These are the fluorescence, the glow germ method, uh, which is being increasingly adopted in many settings, as is the uh, bioluminescence um, assay. so how is uh, microbiological sampling if you decide to do microbiological sampling how is it supposed to be done this is a excellent review in general of hospital infection by rollinson et al they have listed out the all the methods and most commonly the swabs are used but other than that wipes sponges or that plates and dip slides also can be used they give an extensive uh, review of uh, which organisms are picked up by which methods and the sensitivity of each type of method anybody interested in detail should go through this review the method of sampling also depending uh, on which organism you want to pick up the method uh, should be standardized according to that and how to sample exactly how much area to sample how many swabs to take per sample etc etc is given in this review so suppose we pick up a few organisms do we have guidelines for uh, limits on surfaces we do um 
there are um, some studies which say that in general studies uh, say that we should have less than uh, one uh, CFU per centimeter square for certain indicator organisms like Staphylococcus aureus, C. difficile and then MDR. Uh, gram negative bacilli. So keep it at less than one CFU per centimeter square is the general recommendation for um, hospital services, intrabacteria and staph aureus. So that is a good guideline to go by. That would mean that surfaces are relatively clean and important for the hospital. So thank you. I conclude this uh, lecture of mine and we're looking forward to answering your questions um, in the discussion session. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am, for that informative session. Yes, as ma'am emphasized, washing that mop is very important so that it uh, should not serve the purpose in the opposite direction. I would like to now invite our next speaker, Dr. M.S. Ratnamani. Ma'am is the head and senior consultant microbiologist at Apollo Hospitals, Hyderabad. She has an advanced management program for healthcare from Indian School of Business. She is a trained medical she has trained many medical mycologists and has served as a faculty for various infection control certificate programs. She has uh, presented in various national and international conferences and has numerous publications in national and international journals. So I, I'm delighted to invite ma'am for her talk on new techniques for terminal decontamination of rooms. Please ma'am. Uh, good morning all, can you see my screen? Yes, ma'am, we can see. Yeah. So at the outset, I thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity and a special thanks to Dr. Raman Sardana and Dr. Fatima. And it's indeed a pleasure and a privilege to be here. So for the next 10 minutes, I'm going to talk about new techniques for the terminal decontamination of the rooms. So when we say terminal decontamination, what we mean is that once the room has been vacated by the patient post the start. Hospitals should always ensure that patient safety is important and infection control is an important component of patient safety and in the infection control, environmental hygiene always plays a very important role. If you see way back in 1826 itself, it was mentioned in this book in theory and factors that uh, environmental or uh, contamination of the surfaces can lead to transmission of various infections. And in this article in American Journal of Infection Control, it has been seen that cleaning of the surfaces and disinfection definitely reduces the healthcare associated infections. So environmental cleaning has always been there as a part of infection control practices. Maybe for the past few years, it has come into the front because there has been a lot of debate or a lot of studies going on, which has proved that surface contamination leads to transmission of infections, not only among the patients, but also from the patients to the healthcare workers. So in the last one decade, there has been a lot of advancement in the field of decontamination or disinfection of the rooms. So that has led to a development of many new technologies. As my previous speaker has told about the significance of the uh, decontamination and how the pathogens survive on different surfaces, you can see that Organisms or pathogens like C. difficile survive for almost more than uh, five months and the viruses survive for weeks or months. So that is the reason a thorough cleaning and disinfection is required for all the rooms which are occupied by the patient. Now, very important to remember during disinfection is that disinfection and cleaning are not interchangeable. They are a supplement, so they should never replace a manual cleaning of the patient rooms as surfaces must be free of dirt, debris prior to their use. So they are not standalone means of a cleaning. Well, what do we want in a disinfectant? We want it to be rapid. We want it to be safe to use. And does it kill the most prevalent healthcare pathogen? So we want it to be a cidal, a virucidal, a fungicidal, and a bactericidal. It should be cheap, easy to use, and should be stored and have a long shelf life. 
So it's not only for disinfectant, but we look some of these qualities also in a decontaminant, what you call a non-chemical disinfectants, like maybe anything which can a very has a very fast turnaround time. I put it for five, 10 minutes and my room is cleaned. So something like that is the expectation as a infection control practitioner when we are working in a healthcare setup. Well, disinfectants are good, nothing against it. So there are challenges with it, like they might be applied in inadequate contact times. You know that you have to keep it for half an hour or 20 minutes, but it's removed because a uh, hospital system is very dynamic. Patients come in very fast, depending on the number of patients getting admitted in your hospital and the availability of the rooms. The contact time sometimes get compromised. <clears throat> then second thing is the dilution. How many of us really go and check that, ki, okay, the disinfectant dilutions is being done properly or not? If you have automatic dispenser system, well, very good. But if you don't have, then how are we looking at what is it? <clears throat> Sorry, the dilution which is being done. Then if there has been all reports of contamination of disinfectant solutions and organisms and bacteria like Acromobacter, Cerasia, Burkholderia have also been reported. Frequency of cleaning, how frequently you need to clean it. Where do you store these disinfectants? And then monitoring of the housekeepers, which itself needs manpower and time consuming. All these things led to the development of no touch disinfection technique in the hospitals and many hospitals are shifting to this technology. Initially, it was hydrogen peroxide vapors, mercury vapor lamps and pulse xenon lamps. The first one is the hydrogen peroxide, which uses the vapor or mist throughout the room. And this utilizes 35% hydrogen peroxide. The next two different methods use the UV light in the germicidal spectrum. So when you talk about mercury vapor lamps, it produces a germicidal effect in a narrow spectrum of about 253.7 nanometers, whereas the pulsed xenon produces a UV light that covers a vast spectrum from 200 to 280 nanometers. In addition, the other no touch techniques which have come into the market are high intensity narrow spectrum light, cold atmospheric pressure plasma, photocatalytic disinfection, and gaseous ozone based devices. So all of them work on different uh, concepts of how it acts on the microorganism, whether it's oxidative or it acts on its uh, DNA, and then it kills it. Uh, before moving further, would also like to talk a bit about uh, the role of electrolyzed water or what you call is, um, which produces hypochlorous acid. So there has recently been a lot of interest generated because basically the production is very easy. It's a disinfectant which is produced by passing current through a solution of water and salt. There has been reports that it reduces the MRSA, VRE, and C. difficile spores in the in vitro experiments, and also reduction in the number of bacteria when it was sprayed onto a medical equipment. A major advantage with electrolyzed water has that it does not leave any toxic residues because basically it's a salt water or a brine solution. However, there have been a lot of studies. This has not actually been very popular because there have been studies which have shown that the action is very easily affected by the pH of the surface, the type of the surface, the amount of organic matter which is present and all these things and also the stability. So I think there is still work going on about how to have a rapid production of this so that it's used faster and also how to make it more stable. However, uh, EPA in its end list has approved for its use on foot surface contact for cleaning. Now coming to the hydrogen peroxide, yes, it has been very popular. It is also used for a sterilization in our CSSD. For, for decontamination of the rooms, it can be used in two forms. That is vaporized hydrogen peroxide, which is in a dry or a wet aerosol, and the other is a mist form. So whether it is a vaporized hydrogen peroxide or in a mist form produced by a portable generator, it has a very good uh, sidal effect and it needs to be repeated several times. There is a short cycle and every few minutes, like about 20 to 30 minutes, the cycle gets repeated and the total process takes place about two to six hours. 
and in fact there is a uh, recently lot of talk about dry fog also i think all of us uh, saw at the time of covid this generation of covid uh, that the disinfectant tunnels and all but thankfully the government came up with a regulation saying that it is not safe for the, to be used on uh, humans but there is lot of interest now generated in the dry fog maybe in coming years we might look at some of these dry fog too the other very interesting concept is of the use of uv light as a disinfectant now uv light you have a b and c a b should not be used it is the uv c which is used for the germicidal action the range is you between 220 to 280 but it has been to be very effective between 250 to 260 the whole process takes place about uh, 30 to 45 minutes and it has been seen in one of the study which was published in lancet uh, by the use of this uvc machine is that it has reduced the all these mdr pathogens they chose four mdr pathogens and it there has been a reduction by a cumulative of 30% at last year even we bought this uv light it's called uv robo it can be like you have a smart tablet and if you click on it these robots move ahead and they move in a smaller area where they go and decontaminate so as a trial basis uh, we actually put it in our neuro ot and uh, there was a slight reluctance in accepting it because they were worried the ot technicians were worried that it produces uh, radiation it's not safe for them so we did have to go through a round of training and we found this to be quite effective of course this was again as i said after a physical cleaning of the environment another very interesting concept is the use of high intensity narrow spectrum light which is actually a visible violet blue light which is in the range of 405 nanometer and it has been used as a disinfectant air and surface for the hospital room so basically it uses a blue violet range of light and is emitted to the leds it initiates a photoreaction in the microbes and it reels a reactive oxygen and there are studies still going on it has been used for a small surface contamination or small equipments use and there has been uh, some study going on about it uh, as a very effective uh, method for even use in a covid scenario so maybe this also might be coming out in the market soon another uh, new technology which is uh, rapidly gaining acceptance is the use of cold atmospheric pressure plasma as a potential method for the hospital surface decontamination it can be used in the form of a whether it can be generated either through a dielectric uh, tube or it can be through a jet and uh, it has been seen to be very effective actually initially it was used in the kitchen products like it was used for food products now slowly it has also been tested in uh, on the mattresses like and it has been seen that after 45 seconds of the use of this multi jet close pla cold plasma there has been a 3 to 6 log reductions or uh, 3 to 4 log reductions on the mattress and 3 to 6 log reductions on the stainless steel so i think this is another uh, very novel uh, method also quite cheap because it uses mostly air and the concept is that it produces ions positive and negative ions which further go inside the bacteria and then affect the cell wall and kill the bacteria as well as virus and affect the cell wall and kill them so another one is the use of light activated photosensitizer what i was mentioning in my list of uh, newer technology is that is the photocatalytic method and it uses a nano composite of titanium oxide as a catalytic medium with a uv light as an energy source now this is actually what we have also been uh, now we have uh, used it and uh, the process of testing is going on and what it uh, what the manufacturers have also claimed that because it doesn't release uh, uv light direct exposure to the patients it can be used as a continuous method the one of an important thing what we are looking at when we are talking of decontamination of the rooms not only terminal but also decontamination of the rooms it's continuous use so this has been claimed by the manufacturers that it can be used but we have presently not kept it in a patient occupying room but we have doing a study on it and using it in some of the areas where the patients have led left so uh, till now the studies look quite promising 
another uh, thing which has again recently come into the market of course ozone has always been known to be a very good um, microbicidal activities and this has come out where the ozone is used as a room disinfectant it has also been uh, told by the manufacturers acclaimed by the manufacturer that it can be put into the hvac system because ozone subsequently spreads into water and oxygen so the residual product is quite uh, safe and there is uh, no harm to the use in a room it is highly efficacious and its shock disinfection is a concept what it is used it can be used for the large surface areas and in this also there are stationary model and the robotic model or the mobile model which can be moved from one uh, place to the other kept for some time and it causes it uh, does a 360 degree sanitation that is all around the area even if there are any furniture or any cot or any other uh, equipments kept in that room so this is another very uh, interesting and uh, new technology which has come out i think in the past one and a half year after especially the onset of this pandemic we are definitely looking at some uh, alternatives to the chemical disinfection also and it is high time we look at all these uh, technologies i came across a very interesting um, article where uh, it was suggested the use of uh, therapeutic bacteriophages for uh, nosocomial infection management and its use for environmental uh, disinfection so in fact there are two commercial products available already that is against listeria monocytogenes uh, which is called list shield and phage guard called listex so uh, the suggestion by the authors was that since we have a lot of phages available uh, what we can do is suppose you know that in a room we know that okay in this room a patient who has had an mdr or maybe with a klebsiella has uh, just gone uh, discharged then i can take the bacteriophage against that particular pathogen and then use it for cleaning so looks a very interesting concept there are some more uh, commercial products available one is against e coli o157 h7 and against salmonella which have recently been approved by the fda another interesting concept and i'm very sure it has already come into the market is the use of self disinfecting metals like silver and copper which can be by itself have a anti microbicidal effect and can be used for the surface decontamination and as well as a general disinfection of the rooms now in this study it was found this was published in applied environmental microbiology where it was seen that copper beds have been used and it is been seen that the bacteria cycle after it is very very minimal compared to the normal metal beds and uh, they could actually uh, see that many of these beds they have replaced it now with the copper beds for self uh, disinfecting surfaces like coating of medical equipment with copper and silver which have a persistent antimicrobial activities is what is very interesting because it comes under this continuous disinfection process which we are looking at another very interesting compound is uh, or an or an which is basically a silicon based compound which is a surface disinfectant but also has an antimicrobial activity along with a uh, it has a quaternary ammonium compound moiety in it and this has shown very promising effect as it has been seen that it stays on the surfaces for weeks or months but as a microbiologist i still feel it depends on the dynamics of the hospital and the movement of the patients there because it depends on how much of a bacterial load or a fungal load or viral load is coming in that room or on that surfaces but yes we do have to look at these some of these promising uh, and novel uh, disinfectant and decontamination technology so these are the different um, impregnated self impregnated metals or equipments which you are use copper like a, in a chocolate pattern or a pen my previous speaker has already touched upon the role of uh, checking the efficiency of an environmental cleaning as mentioned in the cdc there are two methods direct methods and indirect methods in the direct method is a direct uh, visual inspection when you go for around take up a tissue paper and wipe and see if it's been cleaned or not very uh, um, basic method but does help use of a uv light when you apply uh, when you put gels on cert certain areas you want to check and then you check after putting a uv light you will know whether that area has been cleaned or not 
And I think uh, that audits are very important and a checklist needs to be maintained and an audit has to be done by the housekeeping supervisor and further supervised by the infection control practitioner. Uh, there is a role definitely of, uh, like my previous speaker was telling, the disinfected impregnated wipes, but we have to be very careful that it is used on like on one particular bed and then it's discarded. It should not be carried from one bed to other because there have been studies where it has been seen that there is a transfer of the uh, pathogens from a wipe which has been used on a bed or on a surface to the other uh, bed. Then coming to the indirect methods of uh, use of ATP and environmental cultures, many hospitals are using the ATP for the detection of the organic matter. It's a very, very rapid method. And especially when we are under a lot of stress to release the beds, release the room, it de definitely helps, but should never be compromised on the uh, cleaning protocols. Then environmental cultures, again, only when required and there are very specific indications how and what to be done. It is uh, elaborately given in the CDC as again mentioned by the previous speaker. So we can refer to that to look at how to do an environmental cleaning, how to do disinfection, decontamination, and also how to check for its efficiency. Now future method may use a colorized disinfectant where Depend because you want to know how much contact time has been given for that particular surface. So maybe the color fading time method to disinfect will help in compliance enforcement, provide a real time feedback when disinfection is complete. And of course, train the staff on importance of contact time as and when they use the product. Remember, when introducing a new technology, there has to be acceptance from user department. Like I said, when we went and put it in the OT, we had a first discussion with the OT in charge, the anesthetist, telling them that this is what we are planning to use. And the housekeeping staff should be ready to use or the technician should be ready to use. As initially, there was a lot of reluctance to use. They were refusing to using. We will be exposed to all these radiations. Then we had to go and train them, tell them it is not. And since it was a robotic method, we could just switch on the light and come out. So that was another aspect of the safety. So occupational safety needs to be there and a training for understanding the concepts and how to use it. So all these new technologies are very good, should be applied wherever there is a chance, feasibility and validation reports available as it helps in a greater and better decontamination of the hospital rooms. So to sum up the technologies which are available for the environmental decontamination, the new surface disinfectants like hydrogen peroxide and electrochemically activated saline solution, no touch terminal disinfection with the use of UV lights or pulse on hydrogen peroxide, use of portable devices like UV and steam, ozone-based technology, photocatalytic technology, and self-disinfecting surface like impregnating them with silver and copper, germicide-infected surfaces, uh, impregnated surfaces like triclosan, and light-activated antimicrobial coating. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am, for that uh, talk and acquainting us with various new techniques for decontamination. I would like to now invite our next speaker, Dr. Namita Jaggi. Ma'am is a chairperson, lab services and infection control, and chief of education and research at Artemis Hospitals, Gurgaon, Delhi. She is executive member for Asia Pacific Society for Infection Control and Hospital Infection Society of India. She is the country secretary for International Nosocomial Infection Control Consortium and the chair for the Ethics Committee for Jamia Hamdard. Mem has served as surveyor for JCI, NABL, NABH, and Green OT. She is one of the editors of Journal of Patient Safety and Infection Control. Mem has received various prestigious awards like Asia Pacific Head Hygiene Excellence Award, Epic Hero, and she was a Shia International Ambassador for 2015 and has received the Adi Abadi Women Achiever Award in 2018. Mem has delivered over 100 lectures as invited faculty at many national and international forums have several publications in peer-reviewed journals and national dailies. She spearheads translation research at the research lab at Artemis, which is DSIR certified and runs several projects, including funded by DST. I now invite ma'am to take a talk on unresolved issues and controversies in decontamination. Please, ma'am. I'll just share my screen, just one minute. 
So, uh, thank you Dr. Hiba for that uh, very kind introduction. Good morning to all of you. I think it's uh, another wonderful day at the conference. So, congratulations to the uh, to Dr. Fatima and her team and the National EC team for putting together this really wonderful thing. My topic is unresolved issues and controversies in decontamination. And um, I don't know why this is not moving. Uh, so, just give me a minute. I will probably just stop share and then start share again because we saw that it was moving. Can the organizers help in this? Just click on yeah, on yeah, it yeah, and yeah, yeah. Like, now it's now it's good. So, um, so let me just start with this uh, this slide very quickly. That controversies and unresolved issues, and I see it all across the program they are actually very good because they represent two sides of a coin, they indicate a work in progress, they uh, enable more robust clinical trials, they encourage debates and we have seen in the last two elegant, very elegant lectures by Dr. Ratna and Dr. Manisha about how they have brought out so many of these newer technologies and they lead the path to innovation which they have been doing. So, talking about controversies is always good. Now, let us start with the first, let us go back to the drawing board and let us start with the first controversy. I have been hearing decontamination, disinfection, cleaning, sterilization, antisepsis everywhere. Now, CDC basically mentions disinfection and sterilization where it calls decontamination just the removal of pathogenic organisms from the objects so that they are safe to handle. But right now, more and more, the decontamination is covering the sterilization, disinfection and antisepsis in all forms. So, therefore, decontamination is an umbrella term which is being used. Of course, disinfection or decontamination can be done manually and as you realized in the last few lectures by a no-touch technique. I will be mostly focusing on decontamination of surfaces and the equipment. So, we will talk about certain controversies and guidelines, surface disinfection and then equipment disinfections of scopes that is the high level disinfection. Now, these are the various guidelines, you know, the good thing uh, for this generation on this, of the students who is there is that there are numerous guidelines which are available at the click of a button. Only thing is we are inundated these days with information from everywhere. We are like overloaded with information. So, when you go back from a conference, everybody is very excited and say, oh, we want to do this, we are going to do that. But once your routine work starts, one is not able to do it. So, my recommendation to the younger people especially is keep reading the guidelines. Spend at least some part of your day reading actually, not the WhatsApp groups and the other things, but actual guidelines because they keep getting updated and they have a wealth of information. Now, when we talk about the CDC guideline, there is a spalding scheme where uh, I would like to tell you that, you know, it does not, it really, there are some issues in it. It does not consider problems associated with reprocessing of complicated medical equipment that is heat sensitive or of the prions. Uh, incidentally, our parallel lecture is going on on prions just now, but it does not really talk about that. Also, when it talks about a semi-critical category like an endoscope, but what happens when that endoscope is used with a critical category like for example, a sterile biopsy forceps, then what do you do? How do you sterilize it? An additional problem is that the optimal contact time for high level disinfection has not been defined among various professional organizations and at different temperatures. So, there is some sort of confusion in that. Let us come to our first, first um, sort of controversy and that is the fogging. Now, you know very well that in 2003 and 2008 guidelines, they said that let us not perform. So, they were very categorical, said do not perform. WHO came in and also said it is not recommended. NAB had said fumigation is done only in high risk areas and they actually use the word fumigation, which we do not want to use these days, is done only in high risk areas like ICU, PICU, NICU, labor room, OT or if required. So, that also left a big gap to understanding. We know that the chemicals which are used, hydrogen peroxide vapors or mist, gaseous ozone or sometimes even alcohol or quaternary ammonium compounds. So, this is an unresolved issue and many hospitals are doing it. But then the beauty is, where is CDC now? CDC did not stop at 2008. They had various updations to their guidelines. And in the 2011 guidelines for prevention and control of norovirus gastroenteritis, they said more research is required to clarify 
the effectiveness and reliability of fogging, UV irradiation and ozone mist to reduce norovirus environmental contamination. So as of now, it is no, it is not recommended or there is no recommendation. It's not that it is not recommended, there is no recommendation and it remains an unresolved issue. But they also go on to say that these recommendations do not apply to newer technologies. So therefore, I think there is again, uh, you know, you have to confer and you have to set your own program. But what do the other papers say? So hydrogen peroxide vapor for decontaminating air conditioning ducts in rooms of an emergency complex in North India. And they said, this is from uh, PGI Chandigarh, and they found that the fogging was highly effective for disinfection of room, air temperature, the air, the furniture, etc. There was another uh, article on no touch technologies for environmental decontamination focused on ultraviolet devices and they also said that it reduces the key nosocomial pathogens on inoculated test surfaces. Next we come on to the, the UV light. How effective and reliable is it? Now just like my previous speakers have very nicely explained to you, the UVC is the one which is used. But there are some caveats and you know there are lots of companies globally which are doing it. You have to place the device in vacant rooms. The surfaces must be in the line of sight. So when we get very excited about these new technologies, we must understand and remember that there is a particular protocol and we must follow that protocol. Also, cleaning is never to be compromised. So cleaning is one thing we just cannot compromise. Everything should be done after cleaning. Room is vacated. The walls must be empty because light may bound off the walls. The room has to be clean because the virus or bacterium will not be inactivated if it is covered by dust or soil or embedded in a porous surface or it is at the underside of a surface. So we must take care about all that. And we also must understand the various factors which may uh, affect the efficacy of the UV irradiation. For example, distance, what is the dose, what is the exposure time, where is the lamp placed, how old is the lamp. What is the duration of use, whether there is a direct or indirect line of sight, what is the room size and shape, intensity and reflection. For example, I will tell you an example, you know in our hospital also we got very excited and we said let us use these robots of UV radiation. But then we do not want any people, so we, we cannot put them in areas where there is patient care. So it is not a continuous thing which you can use. And then there are some risks also associated with it, for example they generate ozone which can be irritating. UVC can degrade certain materials like plastic polymers and dyed textiles, etc. So, FDA says there is limited published data about the wavelength, dose and duration of the UVC radiation required to inactivate even the COVID virus. Again, there are many studies which have been used and each of these studies, you know, it talks about it does not replace routine cleaning. It should be used as an adjunct and not as a standalone thing unable to make a firm conclusion about it. The implementation of the standard cleaning and disinfection procedure is the integration of the UVC treatment with which will have very effective results. Now we come to certain things which my previous speakers have already spoken about. So I am not going to take too long. But again, it's antimicrobial coating. So you have right, right from the metallic compounds like silver, copper, zinc, triclosan, trichocarbon, you have antimicrobial polymers like chitosan, the PEG, quaternary ammonium compounds and so on and so forth. But again, the painted surface must be cleaned and disinfected. And just like um, Dr. Ratna talked about the cruel plasma technology, which is also coming in now. And of course, we are concerned about microbial resistance, reliability and there are right now no recommendations in healthcare settings. It is all conjectural. A very other big thing is about nanomaterials which are being used to promote surface oxidation. These are some of the examples how the copper bed which, which my previous speaker also talked about, the automated disinfectant guns, the robots and the um, antimicrobial coatings. Now again we will come to one very interesting topic and that is about the equipment. And we know the endoscopes. Now this area of high level disinfection is always under fire. We have the various scopes which are listed out. They have narrow lumens, they have multiple internal channels, cleaning is a problem and therefore these are the devices which maximally get infected and infect the patients also. There are a lot of causes of the cross contamination which are inadequate cleaning or the use of contaminated AERs or in fact the use of contaminated, you know, the cases which are used to keep the endoscopes, flaws in sometimes instrument design, use of damaged endoscopes. So therefore it is strongly recommended. Uh, that we use the automated endoscope reprocessors but document all the steps and use a correct one. Now let's go through the steps and then I will talk about the unresolved. 
manual cleaning again it should be cleaned very very well but the automated after that when you do an automated endoscope reprocessor we must inspect it for damage we must inspect it for damage and a leak test should be performed of course in high level disinfection you have the variety of agents the preferred agents these days are orthophthaldehyde but you have glutaraldehyde and peracetic acid also and then the another thing is about the test strips you know uh, as a gci surveyor i often go to these um, to the gastroenterology endoscopy suites and when we ask them are you using the test strips for testing the efficacy because if your um, solution is not efficacious there's no point and you they say of course we are doing they show you a very beautiful log also but when you look at there so where is the bottle lying so they go and say the bottle is lying either in the fridge if you look at the bottle sometimes it's expired there is no date of opening um you know there there is then they, you ask them to do the process and they take out the strip and they keep on wagging it around like this which is again not a recommended uh when are you doing it so you 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 have to use it daily if you're testing daily this is cdc if you're using it weekly you use it weekly if you are using it 30 times a day you use it every 10th use so use your common sense you know use your if you put a lot of bio burden into it you know check it so this is a very important thing as well now this is just a comparison of all the thing and like i said orthophthaldehyde though it causes a little staining it does not damage endoscopes and it's got a high biocidal activity so it's a preferred one now the rinsing drying and storage extremely important and controversial issue so the first controversy unresolved issue which exists is cdc has not talked about the you know the how do you test for the last rinse of water which you are doing it with also there is no value of the routine endoscopic culture again no method has been established as a standard for assessing the outcome of endoscope reprocessing all are unresolved and you know i think these studies can be taken up by the younger people then thorough drying of the endoscope sometimes you know the inadequately processed endoscopes are contaminated remain wet and they form a biofilm so that is also not a problem there is a little information regarding how long endoscopes should be placed in storage and when they can be used because you know there is no recommendation that whether the endoscope is being placed for long and should you reprocess it immediately before use so drying is very important and you should put it in the upright hanging position use a clean case to transport outside of the hospital do not transport in a case inside the hospital some scopes have a flushing pressure which cannot be achieved by the automatic endoprocessor these are a couple of last few slides urological endoscopes now there are very few studies done on urological endoscopes so therefore there is a confusion between the spalding's classification where the japanese one classifies it as critical but not the american one there are fewer types of flexible scopes which are compatible with the automatic processing systems opa is sometimes contraindicated use of tap water may not be suitable alcohol flush is debatable and since it requires huge amounts of water two individuals should take part and urology specialists should have a consensus on this so we need some more studies for urological endoscopes fda is in in any case investigating reports of infections this is april 1st 2021 and it's received 450 medical device reports which is describing the post procedure patient infections there are some other controversies for example laparoscopes arthroscopes and other scopes which are normally enter normally sterile tissue should be sterilized before each use if this is not feasible they should receive at least high level disinfection but the debate between high level disinfection and sterilization continues There is no recommendation to use sterile or filtered water rather than tap water for semi critical equipment for example which enter the rectum or the vagina and endoscopes and other semi critical devices should be managed the same way that means high level disinfection even if you know the patient is infected with hpv hcv or mycobacterium tuberculosis which brings me to the end of my presentation thank you so much for a patient listening thank you so much ma'am for that wonderful talk and the controversies were not to looking any controversial when you were so nicely explaining them thank you ma'am moving you. on to our next speaker Speak. dr geeta netraj ma'am is a professor and head in the lab and laboratory in charge the department of microbiology state gs medical college and kemh group of tb hospitals ma'am has 87 publications and 12 chapters and newsletters So I invite ma'am to please take the talk. So ma'am will be talking about what's new in sterilization techniques. Please ma'am. 
Uh, I hope I'm audible and a good morning to all of you. Yes, yes ma'am, you're audible. At the outset, I would like to thank the organizers, Dr. Raman Sardana and all others who have given me this opportunity to speak at this ISICON 2021. I am unable to share the screen probably because the previous, huh, no, I can do that now. Yeah. So the talk assigned is newer methods and sterilization techniques. And this particular talk is going to be restricted to only those kinds of techniques which are used for sterilization of equipment or devices or instruments. Sterilization by definition is the elimination or destruction of all forms of microorganisms and uh, especially including bacterial spores and a large number of bacterial spores at that. An important feature of sterilization is that it can kill 1 trillion spores and that provides a huge advantage of using techniques of sterilization if you are talking about preventing the risk of transmission of infectious agents. The methods that are used in healthcare facilities can be broadly categorized into those that are physical, like we're using steam or the physical chemical, like we're using the hydrogen peroxide glass, gas plasma, or the chemical ones like we have been using the ethylene oxide sterilization. Sterilization is nothing new. It has been in existence since 1879, since the time that Charles Chamberlain invented the steam autoclave. And when we talk about sterilization of equipment, we cannot but uh, provide emphasis to what we had learned based on Spalding's classification that equipment need to be classified as critical, semi-critical and non-critical so that we can identify the method of microbial control. And by methods of microbial control, I mean whether sterilization or disinfection and the different levels of disinfection that can be used for a particular item that needs to be reused on another patient. So what brought about the need for newer methods? We know that if we look at something like what we have been using all along, the steam sterilization or autoclave, it has all the right characteristics for an ideal technique or disinfectant, but suffers from the fact that it cannot be used on equipment that are considered as heat sensitive because they will be spoiled. The second thing is the chemical agents that we have been used to before, which was ethylene oxide they had their own disadvantages in terms of their toxicity, carcinogenicity, long aeration time, poor eco-friendliness, uh, incompatibility with all types of materials, and also the risk of flammability and explosion with reference to ETO when it, it had to be tacked on to CFC. And therefore, there, there was a need that was felt that we need to have some better methods. And in terms of the autoclave, in terms of if we look at what is new in autoclaving, what is new in autoclaving is that we used to have autoclave which could run on ordinary tap water. Now we know that the steam that is generated to be used for sterilizing whatever equipment is within the chamber of the autoclave needs to be at least filtered, if not sterilized. And standards for that have been described. The other reason why we are talking about newer methods of sterilization is just like Dr. Namita just pointed out the fallacies and the controversies that are related to what are called as semi-critical items or scopes. Now, we've always been uh, of the opinion or we've always had this dogma that what is critical needs to be sterile. However, what is semi-critical can go through the process of high-level disinfection. And what was the observation? The observation was that the contamination rates did occur. The contamination rates would vary depending upon the type of item going for high level disinfection. And it could be as high as 20 to 40% in a GI endoscope. Also the disinfectant in question, if you're talking about a high level disinfectant, we have the, uh, to give you just an example of what is listed there in the slide is orthophthalaldehyde, has no effect on human papilloma virus. And at least as per literature, as of 2018, more than 130 endoscope-related outbreaks have already been reported. And these are the ones that are reported. And there are, I'm sure there are many more which go unreported. So the crux of the matter lies in the fact that whenever we use an equipment on mucosal surfaces, they are going to have a high microbial load. These equipment tend to be more complex because in order to improve the functionality of the equipment, the complexity of the equipment also gets affected. And thereby, they become very difficult to clean. And what cannot be cleaned can neither be disinfected nor be sterilized. They afford only a narrow margin of safety as opposed to sterilization by autoclave, which has a huge margin of safety. And that's the reason why there is a shift from using a technique of high level disinfection to that of sterilization for all such semi critical items, especially scopes, probes, etc. So the need has been uh, felt that we need to have certain newer methods of sterilization. And this uh, 
I, I am afraid it's not a comprehensive list of the newer methods, but just the ones like touching the tips of the icebergs. There are many more that have been described in literature, but uh, those are not yet approved. So these are the only ones that we are probably using or that have been described in literature or that have been approved. So there is this flash sterilization that was very popular sometime in between about 10 or 15 years back. There are alternatives to gaseous sterilization using ETO. Then there is a, there has been a shift from using alkylating chemicals such as ETO and RDH to oxidative peroxy compounds and you have a whole list of these. And amongst these, we have hydrogen peroxide gas plasma, which is also heavily approved and therefore more popular in use. And it's a low temperature sterilization and therefore can be used for the various items which cannot be sterilized by using the autoclave. There is also reference of a vaporized hydrogen peroxide, but is that, that has very limited clinical use. Then there are uh, references of ozone, hydrogen peroxide, chlorine dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, per acetic acid. All these are not yet FDA clear. Interestingly, there is something, there is a concept called as PUA, which is solar lens and UVA use of UV light A spectrum, which is used for purging blood plasma and platelets of pathogenic organisms. This is uh, an experimental uh, venture that is going on and it was interesting. So I thought of sharing this with you. Then for dental instruments, they've been trying to use microwave with a bactericidal agent, usually a quaternary ammonium compound like benzalkonium chloride. And of course, we know that sterilization is a process, it's not just the technique, and we have to have some kinds of validation standards and we use biological indicators. And it is time to move over to what are called as rapid read or biological indicators, which give us a result within 30 to 45 minutes. So I'll just touch upon two or three methods that have come up and whether we should be continuing to use it or just rethink about what we are doing. The first and foremost is flash sterilization. Flash sterilization, the current terminology is immediate use sterilization. What are its disadvantages? You're using an unwrapped object. You're trying to increase the temperature, reduce the exposure time to three minutes and at, a tempera and at 27 to 28 pounds per pressure. So that's why it's called as flash because you get it in three minutes flash. Now, these are items, because they are unwrapped, they need to be used immediately. And these are items which also need to undergo the same critical reprocessing steps. So it's not that flash sterilization means I just take what has been used, take it inside the flash sterilizer, flash sterilizer, put it in the flash sterilizer, take it out and reuse it. No, that's not how it works. And the sterilization process monitoring is as essential as it is to sterilization by autoclave. And it is, it is not uh, Gita Nataraj who is saying this, but it is well, well, well uh, said in the literature that, that it is time to phase out these flash sterilizers or immediate use sterilization technology. The one that is popularly in use all over the country, probably, is hydrogen peroxide gas plasma. It has its advantages in terms of safety, non-toxic residues, a very slow cycle time of about 28 minutes. That is the newer version of the equipment. There is nothing like an aeration that we need. It can be used on heat sensitive equipment and it is compatible with most medical devices. However, it is not without its disadvantages. The disadvantages include that something like linen is not, which can be put into a hydrogen peroxide glass by gas plasma chamber for sterilization. There are restrictions based on the lumen diameters, it requires a special kind of packaging, which over a long run turns out to be pretty expensive. Hydrogen peroxide can be toxic if the measured quantity is not properly titrated. And vaporized hydrogen peroxide, probably not a constituent of the hydrogen peroxide gas plasma. Its penetration per se is lesser than that of ethylene, ethylene oxide. And the sterilization validation, especially what, uh, why we didn't choose to go for this is it is easy to get an equipment as a one-time purchase, but difficult to maintain the continuous supply of consumables. And the sterilization validation processes in case of hydrogen peroxide gas plasma can prove out to be pretty expensive. We have to do it for every cycle. The second one that is looking up and trying to come out of the, what should I say, comfort zone is ozone. It is, ozone is a good bactericidal and sporicidal agent. However, it is unstable. And there is one company called a Cyclops, which is, uh, which is marketing an ozone-based uh, technology for sterilization of endoscope. The advantage is it has no toxic residues. But the disadvantage is it has got plenty of material incompatibility and pretty long cycle times and therefore something that is not very popular to be used. So in essence, uh, what is gathered from the available literature is 
wherever possible sterilization should always be preferred over disinfection except maybe for those items where it is not required to be done at all there is no uh, need for doing it such as in case of non critical items the method that we select should be according to the material compatibility can it withstand uh, this particular uh, chemical can it withstand this particular uh, temperature of the heat etc the cost effectiveness the ease of operation obviously absence of any potential hazard very very important both to the patient as well as to the person doing the sterilization process and the environment and it should, it should have an acceptable cycle time i think the best cycle time would be something that is less than an hour and as of date steam sterilization is the most effective and has the largest margin of safety the important prerequisites to sterilization there is nothing that is better than cleaning cleaning because it's a mechanical process that removes bio burden and when it removes bio burden it also reduces the load of organisms to the level of 10 to the power of 4 colony forming units whatever the method whether we are using sterilization by using hydrogen peroxide gas plasma or we are going to be using an autoclave or a hot air oven cleaning is extremely important it may also the other advantage of cleaning is that there is probably something that we don't give a lot of weightage to and that is biofilms that can collect over the instruments over a period of time and cleaning actually takes care of the removal of these biofilms also like it has been pointed out by dr namita and also by dr uh, the previous speaker there is a need for verifying whether the cleaning has been effective and multiple methods have already been described and every sterilization cycle has to undergo uh, go through its validation or verification whether we do a physical uh, uh, indicators chemical indicators biological indicators that should only biological indicators can tell us whether it has achieved a sterilization assurance level of being able to take care of more than or equal to 10 to the power of 6 pores and the pores that we use will depend upon whether we are using moist heat sterilization dry heat sterilization or hydrogen peroxide gas plasma sterilization therefore is a multifactorial process it's not a stand alone thing there is something that is happening before the product goes for sterilization there is something that happens after the product has been sterilized and all these things need to be controlled and all these things need to be taken care of especially important is the packaging material that we use for sterilizing an object where we need to use a packaging material the packaging material must be permeable to the sterilizer that is being used and it should also tolerate the sterilization process no point in using a newspaper uh, though it is permeable to steam it gets so wet that it comes out in pieces and therefore you need to have that particular grade of paper to be used inside an autoclave now the, the the thing that i want to stress on is a lot of things come up in the market and many of these manufacturers or vendors come to us saying that please take this instrument it is very good this and that and these and those please see that this particular equipment that we are going to use for the purpose of sterilization has an approval of a standard organization and usually the standard organization that we are looking at is us fda or in india there is something called as cisco cdsco so cdsco also has these device classifications and most of these devices might might come under class 1 class 2 or class 3 and they do have parameters for approving these equipment there must be a mechanism for validating the process of sterilization because if you cannot validate you cannot measure you don't know whether it works simple so there must be a mechanism for validating the process and we already know that we cannot have just one system at hand like for example if km hospital has only autoclave that alone may not be sufficient for heat sensitive equipment so we have the 100% eto also to go with it so there is no single sterilization method that is suitable for all devices thank you very much for your patient hearing i was told that i have 10 minutes so i have tried to cover it in 10 minutes and just the excellent result Thank you so much, ma'am, for that informative session. I would like to invite now Dr. Parvez Anwar Khan, sir, is the assistant professor in the Department of Microbiology, Jawaharlal Nehru Medical College, Aligarh. He has been a microbiologist since 13 years. His thrust area include HIV, mycology, immunology, and STI. Not only this, sir, is an expert in all fields of microbiology. So we often run to him in case of any doubts. He has many publication in national and international journals. So I now invite sir to please clear doubt and resolve controversies in sterilization and decontamination. Please, sir. Thank you, Dr. Eba. So, firstly, a very good morning, Namaskar, Sasya Kal, and Adab to everyone. 
So firstly, I would like to thank all the speakers for the wonderful talk they have given. So just to start with <clears throat> the central importance of hand hygiene and environment disinfection in the control of infection. Ignace Simon, we Florence Knight Kendall and Robert. We cannot hear you very well. Is this a local phenomena or is scientific are you being heard? Work are still applicable as we are. No, Navita, we can't hear him well. Yes. So, uh, so uh, uh, Dr. Pervez, uh, if you if your bandwidth is low, so just, please uh, yeah close. Uh, you know, switch off your video so that we can at least hear your audio well. Or if you want, Pervez, you can come to my chamber and you can. Wonderful talks just delivered. We keep Pervez, losing you. Can here for your session if so you want. coming on to the uh, doubt if my voice is audible to I the mean, some of the questions i have directly got i mean and some of them have already been answered by the essay left and some other doubts which are commonly what are their basic doubts so i'll just be this question uh, i mean which i will please somebody confirm yeah. audio on i mean problem <laughs> audio on hai. Now it's off. Am I audible? Yes, doctor, you are. Please go on, Dr. Pervez. You are am audible. I, am I audible? Yes, doctor, am you I are. Audible? Yes, yes, sir. Please. I am getting an alert that uh, video cannot be started because host has stopped it. Sir, due to your bandwidth problem, we are uh, uh, forcefully stopped it. Okay, okay. So I'll just unmute myself and I'll just carry on. Okay. So you can, I can stop my video. I'll just unmute myself. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Okay, okay. So yes, I'll sir. just continue. Sir, please stop your video for better clarity. You have a bandwidth okay, okay. problem. I have stopped. I have stopped. Okay, fine. Uh, so, uh, first of all, a very good morning to everyone. And then I would like to thank all the speakers for their wonderful talks. May to start with the central importance of hand hygiene and environmental disinfection in the control of infectious diseases has been recognized in the times of Ignaz Simelvis, Florence Nightingale, and Robert Koch. And the insights gained from their scientific and practical work are still applicable today. So here, uh, what is the main purpose of uh, doing this session is, I have got some of the questions in the chat box. And most of them, I mean, uh, have already been answered by the uh, expert panelists. There are some questions that remain. And there are some other questions that which I have personally asked a few people that what are their doubts and uh, what uh, controversies they won't get cleared about these topics. And the, uh, some of the very interesting questions which I uh, got from my colleagues was that they wanted to ask that uh, today we live in the world of uh, uh, evidence-based medicine. But thankfully, that question has already been answered by Dr. Manisha Bismal in her talk when she talked about the evidence related to this, uh, these procedures and techniques that they should uh, be followed to control the infectious process. Now, one question that arises again here, uh, when we talk about the core components of environment, environmental cleaning and disinfection, I mean, how actually, I mean, if we talk in terms of uh, India, so, uh, which, uh, especially in the government setup, which have got a limited resources a limited manpower. I mean, how can they actually monitor the effectiveness and adherence to the cleaning and disinfection protocols? So this question uh, is for uh, Dr. Manisha Biswal because that was the thing that she talked. So if she wants or if some uh, other panelists want, they can answer this. I mean, in Indian setup, how can we actually uh, 
implement these things like monitoring the effectiveness adherence to the cleaning and disinfection protocols and audit and all those things may i answer that yeah 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 so basically as all of the panelists were saying to see for the effectiveness of the cleaning protocols i know atp is expensive many of the corporates and others do have but if you go to a normal uh, hospitals who do not have or a limited resource settings one very important thing is whenever uh, uh, awareness about this that yeah i have to clean it thoroughly see we when you are talking about cleaning it is the base level the housekeeping personnel who are cleaning it so there has to be an interaction with them so first it starts with the training that why are you cleaning it and what are the areas which needs to concentrate it on once you do that then the supervisor or someone should have a checklist like i was mentioning it that okay this area has been cleaned or not a separate mop has been used the disinfectant is as per the dilution or not so i think first is a checklist where you physically ensure that the cleaning has been done or not then coming to the the uh, all of us agree that yes there are swabbing and all all of us say only when there are outbreaks if there is a requirement otherwise not but to put some amount of fear i think once in a while surveillance cultures will help so go around and do the surveillance cultures once in a while and tell <coughs> them that you can even go and take from the surface uh, impression of the plate on an agar plate and show it to them because the sweet is believing it the third thing is the easy method as uh, the even cdc says we usually go around and just put a tissue paper i have a habit of carrying tissue paper with me and i'm sure dr namita will also agree jc i does many of those time and they just go and put their hand on some cupboard and they just check that so these are some of the things which i feel should help the physical uh, monitoring of those places and also the dilutions as i was again saying what is the dilution go and see whether they are really using a uh, what you call the measuring flask or a measuring cup or ye ek dabba iska ek bucket iska it should not be like that so that thing also so some amount of more rounds by an infection control personnel and creating awareness among the housekeeping personnel is one of the way which i feel the other panelists can of course give their opinion also yeah i think a very well very well said dr atna if i can just jump in here for a minute she has explained uh, it very well for our low resource uh, settings how to do it and uh, what i just like to add over here is you know uh, in a very general sense uh, every hospital uh, whether it is a low resource or a, maybe a corporate everybody everywhere cost is um, it matters so we must have a, a policy which is cost effective we, you know we can't jump on to say that let's get the atps and let's start uh, looking at the cleaning we cannot do that so before that i'm sure that you know uh, dr raman is really looking at this whole piece and he is trying to have these national guidelines but i really do think that no matter how good the cdc guidelines or the apsec guidelines or whatever are for india especially for the cleaning part of it because we have so much of a dust dirt lack of awareness and so many you know different things in our country where we really need to have some national basic standards for uh, cleaning disinfection and sterilization and they must be cost effective and just like uh, dr ratna very well said we must have we have to stand over there and see even 1% hypochlorite has to be freshly prepared we have to stand on the head and see how they are preparing that we have to see whether they are using the strips of the uh, opa or not uh, whether they are using it properly or not we have to see whether whatever we have written in our guidelines is implemented <clears throat> so the implementation thrust has to be there which uh, has to come from the infection prevention team in collaboration with the housekeeping team so i think this is how we have to uh, keep a supervision on the uh, cleaning aspect of it thank you yeah i totally agree with both uh, dr uh, namita and dr ratna they are from private uh, hospitals pj is a pj is a government hospital we have 2500 beds we have four infection control nurses they don't have to we don't have atp we don't have the um, expensive stuff but what they do do is utilize the visual method of uh, checking which is the most important and the basic method if there is dust there is bound to be bacteria that's one second kaikal tells us there are certain areas that you have to do surveillance for once in three months and that record has to be shown to them so that itself periodically is enough to show people or tell people that this is not clean and see what has grown like dr ratna said that in itself it doesn't have to be done every day it doesn't even have to be done every month once in a while in one unit if uh, this this data is shown back to them we know that it has to be cleaned I ready am... to 
processes should be uh, sampled once in a while because they have to be sterile the ones especially the ones that are going to be used in um, for uh, the critical care ones otherwise the rest of the surfaces we can do selectively using a uh, logic so even in government setups once we put across the message from infection control people that some things are not negotiable then everybody gets down to it and does it no matter what the um, circumstances are could i just you. add something here and uh, uh, that is that yes, we, can, we can use a simple uh, fluorescent marker kind of a thing in certain areas and leave it there and see how the cleaning takes place so that whether it can be so that can just be a surrogate marker of the cleaning process itself uh, only thing is it should be something that is washable like it should go away with the kind of wipes that you use so that you know that it is been removed and the other thing is we always have this habit of saying we will come every second week of the month so we should stop doing that because we are talking about checklists and surprise uh, surprise visits are better than having a planned visit if we really want to find out what's going on and third thing is it is not probably something that is well appreciated but this mother in law thing that we do i'm sorry of checking how much dust is there why these things are not kept properly where is the aesthetics all that also helps that's what we have seen in our setup okay thank you so much uh, i think we are short of time i just ask one more very interesting question as we are so much concerned about the judicious use of antibiotics i mean should be also be judicious for the use of disinfectants and antiseptics i mean yeah. are there any correlations between biocide use and the resistance yes, to yes. antibiotics absolutely i i'll just uh, quickly jump in and then the other panelists can also answer so this is the area of growing concern you know as it is environmental hygiene has really become very important in the past uh, decade or so environment hygiene is really important for the transmission of infections now we are using because when a person starts doing something it it just goes overboard so we are going overboard in use of disinfectants in use of these antimicrobial coated surfaces and in use of you know putting everywhere antimicrobials so biocides the disinfectants are as well as the antimicrobials which are being used for disinfection purposes they may cause antimicrobial resistance and we have to be very careful like you know one of the panelists also said we have to apply our common sense approach so for example if the floor is probably uh, you know one day it's not that clean the organisms are not going to jump up from the floor and go to the person but if in the icu your bed rails are not properly cleaned your uh, your table which is lying next to you is not properly clean yes we have to disinfect that according to your policy so biocide resistance and uh, disinfectant resistance is very much on the rise and we must be very careful in using them also i just like to add one last thing we don't uh, you know even if uh, cdsco is there in india we must have a simpler method of disinfectant testing which is going to be available in our country because right now we don't have any such forum of testing of disinfectants so this is what i wanted to say please other people okay so very rightly said dr namita any anybody else wanted to comment you know we went overboard okay, so, during uh, covid i think we yeah, started from 10% hypochlorite then 5% hypochlorite god yeah. knows how much of damage that has done uh, yeah. as far as the yeah, yeah. increasing resistance is concerned mm -hmm. so probably just as an antibiotics this is also a factor that the right concentration has to be used dr ratna has elaborated on that the right concentration is important so you kill all exactly. the microorganisms rather than having a suboptimal concentration and allowing some of these just like in antibiotic setting so yeah. few things we can take care um yeah, to prevent overuse and prevent uh, perpetuating this uh, problem uh, i just want to add to this what uh, doctor has just said uh, whenever the concentration is mentioned they say a 1% bleach solution or a 10% bleach solution bleach itself is just a 5 to 6% solution of sodium hypochlorite so when we say it's a 10% bleach solution it's a 0.5% solution of sodium hypochlorite that's something that we need to imbibe we always think that bleach is equivalent to sodium hypochlorite it's not bleach is a 5 uh, to 6% solution of sodium hypochlorite so therefore a 10% solution of bleach is 1/10th of that concentration only or that it has to be diluted that many times so that's something that we need to uh, understand and implement 
And ma'am, uh, you know, this is very rightly said, Dr. Geeta. We need to really uh, make it very, very simple and uh, very, very idiot proof, uh, this sort of a thing and put it on the walls for the housekeeping people because ultimately who's going to be making that 1% is our housekeeping staff. So whatever dabba you are getting in your hospital, just look at the concentration of that and then make the concentration as to how many parts and how many parts water, which because it will keep on differing whether it's a 5% solution or a 10% solution. Write that's it down I'm there and true. audit. Yeah, that's why Namita, I kind of appreciate in parts per million because all dabbas mentioned parts per million. Oh. And the concentration or the dilution that we want of the actual chlorine that is there available in that particular solution should be mentioned in parts per million. Yes, ma'am. Irrespective of the initial concentration of the stock solution, you know how much you need to dilute. Yes, absolutely. I, would just add I think the, the control law. dilution desk, something like that will also help. Like na, that will have a control one rather than each area, wherever it's possible. Yes. Dilution with dilutes and gives it to the different areas. That is another thing which helps. With the permission of all of you, uh, one, one thing which I want because uh, uh, people have told about environmental damages. People have told about environmental damages. So one thing I just want to, uh, you know, uh, try to go back to detergent and water as far as possible, wherever it is possible instead of... Yes. Exactly, exactly. Yes. We should not forget our basics. We should go back to, you know, cleaning first, cleaning well. Okay, so esteemed panelists, here is my personal question. I mean, it is the right moment to clear my doubts because I am also in a learning process. I mean, I have seen in the surveillance culture from our hospital and many other centers, some friends have told that they get the growth of pseudomonas, acetobacter, even from the solutions of betadine and ethanol. I mean, how is it? Is It is even possible. I mean, what could be the factor? Obviously, it is happening. There must be some reasons, but I cannot understand what is the reason. Is there any relationship between reduced susceptibility of microorganisms to biocides? So that is one of the reasons, Dr. Parvez, you are very right. That is one of the reasons. Also because, you know, we, we, we are not, pseudomonas is a very uh, happy, friendly uh, to all the disinfectants. So pseudomonas will grow in the disinfectants. It also means that we must be very careful of things like expiry date, the date of opening, you know, we are not used to writing down all these things. We are just not used to documenting. So if you have a disinfectant solution and it's lying over there, it may lie for, uh, I don't know, how many months or sometimes years. Then we go on topping it up, you know, we open it and then we put on the top. So all these things, you know, it causes a lot of microorganisms to grow. So we must have the basic, uh, basic measures in place, you know, maybe no touch. Uh, technique if possible, you know, you have these stands, very simple to use stands. Uh, please do not top up. Please look at the expiry date. Please uh, write down the date of opening. And of course, yes, there is a decreased resistance to biocides also, which is creeping in, exactly. which, uh, like I said, must be, uh, we must have simple labs to test that. Uh, that's one of the requirements of the day. I hope Dr. Raman is listening because, you know, he will probably spearhead it. So, see here, just one, one thing, and then we, I think we'll stand to wrap up for the few addresses. Uh, when you are looking at uh, disinfectants, you have to specifically look at dilution. Mm -hmm. Dilution means that alcohol evaporates. After some time, it won't be the same alcohol that yeah. you are using. It won't be yeah. 70%. Uh, you yeah. know, if it is kept the latest kept open or uh, not tightly closed, yeah. so that is something which we, we tend to miss. Uh, yeah. Because, and uh, cross-check, so put it in the audits to have a look at how the things have been stored. Second yeah. thing is uh, dilution but after cleaning of uh, certain things, uh, there, there was a major uh, problem with using cheetahs forceps. And that, that is where, uh, you know, and in certain centers in India, it is still rampant to use cheetahs forceps in sablon bottles or in normal saline bottles or in hydrogen peroxide bottles, whatever way it is. So actually you are, you are exposing, it's, it's all the time exposed to outside and uh, you are exposing the cheetahs forceps so you are contaminating every time you take it out, you know, from that bottle of, of disinfectants. So that habit has to go. So the, one has to be very careful in using disinfectants when you are using for uh, such things, such equipment. Also, uh, Raman, in the endoscope uh, reprocessing unit, sometimes, you know, they... they yeah. end up, uh, there is a... I'm so sorry. Uh, very interesting conversations which are going Yes, on. we will carry it later on. Okay. Yes, yes. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Dr. Namita and Dr. Raman, for clearing my doubts. I mean, some of them have been cleared. I would, I haven't thought in those terms which I just came. To.
to know so i think we are uh, our time is over so i'll hand it over to the uh, to dr heba for carrying it forward uh, thank, thank you dr thank you Paveer, thank sir. you Thank Thanks so a lot. Much. Thank you. And thank you everyone thank you. for that wonderful interactive session. Now upcoming we have very uh, interesting keynote sessions. So I'm now over to Dr. Sana for the keynote sessions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm audible. Yes, yes, sir. sir. You are. Yeah. Uh, I, on behalf of the organizing committee. Okay. Okay. I think someone has to introduce. मैं 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 स्टार्ट प्लीज डॉक्टर साना प्लीज स्टार्ट अ वेरी गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीवन माय सेल्फ डॉक्टर साना प्रीम एंड आई एम हियर टू स्टार्ट द कीनोट सेशन First of all, I welcome our honourable uh, chairperson, Dr. Raman Sardana, sir. He is uh, honorary secretary of Hospital Infection Society in India. Right. He has much right. 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 affiliations. He is member research uh, member of the research board. I R. You are muted. Sorry, you are muted. You are muted, please. Unmute, ma'am, 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 please. मानस इनको अनम्यूट करो मैम अनम्यूट फातमा इन डॉक्टर शारिक अहमद यू आर म्यूटेड यू आर म्यूटेड वी कैन नॉट हियर यू डॉक्टर शारिक यू आर म्यूटेड या यस या आई एम ऑडिबल नाउ या या यस यस मैम अब नेक्स्ट लेनी चाहिए डॉक्टर मोहित को कर दीजिए। Am I audible? Yes, yes. Now you are audible. Am I audible now? Yeah, you audible now. You audible. Carry on. So uh, shall I start now? Yes, sure. Uh, okay. So good morning, everyone. I would like to welcome you all in the keynote session. First of all, I would like to welcome our honorary uh, chairperson, Dr. Raman Sardana, sir. He is honorary secretary of Hospital Infection Society India. He has multiple affiliations. He is member of research board IRB Ethics and Research, and he is currently a senior consultant uh, microbiologist in Indus Apollo Hospital, New Delhi. Our uh, another chairperson is an esteemed professor, Department of Anesthesiology, Dr. Syed Mohi Ahmed Sir. He has been facilitated multiple times by the Vice Chancellor of uh, AMU. to bring uh, for bringing lawyers to aligarh muslim university and he has also been facilitated by vice president of india for uh, again uh, for he got award in 2015 and 17 and he uh, he also got dr bojraj award for best review article in 2016 he has worked, he has around 110 international and national publications so handing over to you chairpersons for starting the keynote session thank you Uh, Dr. Sharik uh, Shami for introducing us. So, myself, Dr. Sana Afreen, actually. Sana, myself. yeah, you are taking the platform of another person. Okay. Yes. Uh, I, uh, I, on behalf of the organizing committee, uh, welcome you in this keynote session, and it's my proud privilege and honor to uh, uh, to introduce uh, the first speaker, uh, Professor D B uh, D Bhatia. he is the professor and head of the department of anesthesiology and critical care and pain management in tata memorial memorial hospital mumbai uh, uh, he ha he is the president present president of the society of onco anesthesia and pedi operative care he has been the past editor in uh, chief indian journal of anesthesia past president of all india difficult aid association 
and past president of Indian uh, Society of Critical Care Medicine. Uh, he has publications uh, of more than 145, and he's been presenting. I mean, he's had, he's been, in fact, he's one of the legend in, uh, in anesthesiology and critical care. Uh, we have a lot more to say about him, but I think uh, he needs no introduction in, the in this August gathering. Please, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Moid, and thank you very much for inviting me to speak at uh, this uh, wonderful meeting and a very important one. Uh, so, uh, so I hope you can see my screen. You see my slides? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. So I will be asked to speak on the effectiveness of the bundle approach, right? Uh, for preventing infections, uh, healthcare related infections. And I will, of course, while we are speaking on healthcare infections, I will confine myself to the intensive care unit uh, because uh, that's where I do all my, most of my work. And the question is, you know, when we talk of bundles, we ask here, is this, is this a bundle concept or is it a bundle concept? And bundle as in B-U-N-D-L-E or the Hindi version of bundle? So, okay. So what is a bundle? So this was initially described by the Institute of Healthcare Improvement in the United States. And it's sort of a method of trying to improve uh, our outcomes. Right? And outcomes in settings where we do things to patients which are risky. For example, in ICUs, when we ventilate patients, when we put in lines, when we put in tubes and catheters, there is a risk of infection. So there is a risk, but of course there's a benefit. That's why we do them. But we need to do something to make sure that patients are not harmed or put at greater risk because of our interventions. And when they define the bundle or when they conceptualize the bundle, it was thought to be a small set, right? Not too many elements, but three to five elements which had high level of evidence, okay, which when performed collectively and reliably would improve the patient outcome. So essentially you have to do a number of things, three, five, six, whatever, but you have to do all of them because they were based on high level evidence. And if they were all done correctly, and all the time, then you would get uh, better outcomes. So essentially what you would have is you would have say five uh, interventions that you had to do. So it sort of resembles a list, but a bundle is not a list. It's not just a list, right? So these are the very important factors, uh, points about the bundle is that these changes are all necessary and all sufficient. In other words, all these steps must be completed. All the interventions must be performed at their uh, required time and you cannot have a partial compliance to the bundle. In other words, if there are five elements, you have to do all the five things, right? You can't say I did three out of five, or I did four out of five, and that's good. I did 80% or I did 70%. That's not allowed. You have to do 100%. Otherwise, you've not done, right? So, so all of them must be completed. And like I said, these changes are based on high-level evidence, randomized controlled trials, and each element is probably well understood and well accepted, but when you do all four or five things which are evidence-based, then you know that because they are well accepted, presumably people will uh, not have much resistance to doing those things. The only question is to do all of them and all of them at uh, whenever they need to be done. Okay. So unlike a checklist, you know, a checklist, you can have hundreds of uh, things on a checklist and you start ticking what is done and what is not done. So here it has to be done. All those things have to be done. And uh, so when a bundle element of mist, so if you don't do everything that is there in a bundle, then the patient has higher risk of complications. So in summary, a bundle is a group of interventions related to a disease process that when executed together, result in better outcomes than when in implemented individually. All must be completed. These changes are based on level one evidence and they involve all or nothing. So either you're compliant with the bundle, the entire bundle, or you're not compliant with the entire bundle and they have to be done all the time, no exceptions, no breaks, no cheating, no cheat days and so on and so forth. Okay, so everything has to be done every time. And in the ICU, we talk of bundles like the, a bundle to prevent cent, uh, central line related uh, bloodstream infection or catheter related bloodstream infection, the central line bundle to prevent ventilator associated pneumonia, that's a ventilator bundle. Uh, now sepsis bundle is very commonly used and very well known, uh, but that's not a prevention bundle, that's a treatment bundle. So we'll not be talking about the uh, sepsis bundle, but that's a series of interventions to reduce mortality from severe sepsis and septic shock. Right? So let's talk about some of these bundles and we'll start with the central line bundle, which I'll go through in a little more detail just to expand on the concept of bundles. Now, this is the 
central line bundle. There are five sort of elements. One is hand washing. Second is full barrier precautions during insertion of the central line. Cleaning the skin with chlorhexidine. Avoiding the femoral root and removing unnecessary catheters. These are five very simple uh, interventions. All five need to be done for every patient who has a central line in place or who needs a central line to be inserted. And if you see some things are there at the time of catheter insertion, for example, barrier precautions, cleaning the site and floor exit and avoiding the femoral site. And some are which there, which will be there all the time, right? So as long as the line is in place. Now, the, like I said, these are based on high level evidence. Now hand washing, I think uh, doesn't really need evidence. Uh, it's something which is ingrained into us and you know, we, it's part of the WHO campaign. It's been there for many years, uh, part of the global uh, safe, patient safety challenge. And the important thing is that hand washing has to be done at particular times. So there's a sort of, uh, you need to know when to do it. And I won't go into the five moments of hand hygiene. I think to this uh, infection control society audience, uh, the moment of hand hygiene are probably need not be sort of gone into in great detail. And there's a method of hand washing. So it's not just that you wash your hands, put your hand under a tap, but when do you do the hand washing and how do you do your hand washing? All of that has to be done properly. That's when you've done proper hand washing. Now, this is the data for maximal barrier precautions uh, to prevent uh, CRBSI. Now, you know, in many places you find patients put up maybe just a handkerchief level size of uh, grape uh, when they're putting the center, just cover the area and a little more than that of, around the site of insertion. But what they advocate is full barrier precautions, right? And that means that to cover the bed, especially the head end of the bed, the bed post, when you're putting the central line in, say from the neck or from the subclavian, you know, the guide wire hangs out. So all that must be covered with drapes. So essentially, you need a full body drape uh, to when you're putting in a central line, even though you're putting in a small area in the neck, you need to have extensive sort of draping. That's maximal barrier precautions. Of course, you need to be gloved and gowned and masked and cast and all those sorts of things. So you need maximal barrier precautions. And this was some data which showed that if you use maximal barrier precautions versus minimal, that is just maybe a small drape and a gown and gloves, the both the rate of catheter colonization as well as catheter rate sepsis was significantly lower. So that's very good randomized uh, evidence. Now, you know, uh, femoral catheters are discouraged because they have a very, the groin as such we know is not a very clean area. So the relative high colonization rates and the risk of venous thrombosis in the leg is probably higher when you keep a catheter in the femoral artery. And compared to the subclavian, the internal may be slightly inferior, but compared to both, the femoral was definitely worse, right? So, and this is a Again, a randomized controlled trial comparing the femoral root versus a subclavian root for venous axis, central venous axis. And as you can see, the rates of catheter colonization, catheter rate sepsis, as well as catheter rate thrombosis were much lower for the subclavian root than for the femoral root. And in fact, the rates for femoral uh, catheters are actually pretty high and almost unacceptable. Uh, so certainly the femoral root should be avoided. And uh, you could use either the subclavian or the internal jugular root. Uh, the internal jugular is simpler, safer, but subclavian root is probably a little better from the infection uh, point of view. But you could use, but certainly avoid the femoral root. Now, when I was training and many years ago, I think uh, povidone iodine was the standard sort of uh, cleaning solution for skin disinfection. And, you know, it's nice because you could see the nice brown area, so you knew you would clean the skin. So uh, it was uh, very popular and very easily available. But then there was a number of trials which actually showed that if you use chlorhexidine and alcohol, it was superior to COVID on IOD. And so for, for catheter colonization, as well as catheter bloodstream infection, when you were comparing either plain alcohol or COVID on IOD, so spirit, what we used to call, and uh, I think a common uh, sequence of cleaning when I was training many years ago was uh, spirit, betadine, spirit, you know, so that was the way we used to do it. So we used to use spirit and we used to use alcohol and we used to use COVID on iodine. But compared to either 70% alcohol or COVID on iodine, chlorhexidine, especially tincture chlorhexidine solutions were actually far superior uh, when you looked at either catheter colonization or bloodstream infection, catheter related bloodstream infection. And again, uh, you can see that colonization significantly less when you clean the skin with chlorhexidine. 
So this was another reason for having part of in this part of the bundle. And we all know the longer a line is in place, the more is the chance of infection. So a very important element of the bundle is, you know, that every day you should assess whether you need the line. At the first time that you do not need that central line, you need to remove it. Right? So these are the elements of the bundle. Now, does this work? This was a very interesting uh, study which was done in Michigan, in the United States, right? And uh, they used this bundle and they had randomized certain ICUs or certain hospitals to implement the bundle and follow the bundle and some continue the standard practice. And what they found is that in ICUs who used the bundle, the median rate of catheterated blood stream infection per thousand days decreased to 2.7, right? Uh, well, so, and it was initially it was 2.7 and it decreased to zero, right? So the mean was 7.7, .7, mean was 2.3, but the median was 2.7, it decreased to zero. So they almost completely, most of the ICUs, more than half the ICUs did not have any central line related bloodstream infection, which is actually quite fantastic, right? And this was sustained for 15 months in the follow up study. And when the other ICUs, the other hospitals, who were part of the study, who had not implemented the bundle. When they saw the results, they did not participate in the study any further, and they all wanted to implement the bundle. So this is a very dramatic real-world uh, evidence, or real-world data, to show that implementing the central line uh, bundle actually made a significant reduction in, uh, uh, in the uh, CRBSI. In, this, in Michigan, when actually the rates were actually quite low even to start with, and they were able to bring it down to almost zero, right? So this is real world data and very well uh, published uh, study, very well uh, referenced study. Okay. Now, you know, we know that the central line infection comes from many sources and the major source of course is the flora from the skin and the hands of the healthcare workers, right? So that's taken care of by a skin disinfection and by your uh, hand washing but we also know that it comes from the hubs from contaminated hubs it would also come from the fluid from the intravenous fluid that you're using and this central line bundle doesn't really address these two and now this central line bundle if you notice it has been the interventions and the trials have been done in the west and in high income countries and in high resource icus where the practices are actually quite different from what is done in many of the lower and middle income countries, including India, right? So for example, it is uh, not uncommon to have very different practice. And that's why this uh, consortium, the International Nosocomial Infection Control Consortium, uh, which was run by Victor Rosenthal out of Argentina, but they've got all the lower and middle income countries together and sort of, we all contribute data to this uh, consortium and they bring out data on of healthcare associated infections in these sort of uh, countries. And now there are many, many more countries, but not just 36. And they have addressed, they do address the real world reality, which is there in some of our ICUs in ICUs in India. So for example, you know, overcrowding and you know, no, no single rooms, inadequate hand washing uh, facilities and taps, no towels and so on. But even as with respect to infusion practices, you can see that there are multiple bivalves and stopcocks. There is this uh, glass bottle, which is an open solution. And you can see here that they've kept the uh, air inlet open, right? Here you've got puncturing the plastic bottle with a needle so that you allow air to come in and empty out the fluid more easily. Again, opening the air inlets, towels, which are reused all and on. So these are very common practices. And you know they are an important source, probably an important source of infection. And therefore, in order to overcome some of these, in addition to the, the bundle that we described, the IHI bundle that was described, the INICC actually asked you to do other things like use needleless connectors and closed IV system where you've got collapsible bags so that the air doesn't get in and you don't contaminate by putting in needles and uh, putting in air inlets into the system. So this is what is in addition recommended in the INICC bundle. And again, in order to uh, help people to implement those bundles and make sure that you don't uh, you do things well. You know they also suggest that you should put a date of catheter insertion, dress it properly, use sterile dressing for peripheral lines. I, I, that is such a 
important thing you know peripheral lines are put with tape uh, standard practice will just take any tape from the micropore put it over here very nicely but it's all unsterile right so that's funny so you should they suggest that they recommend that you use sterile dressings for peripheral lines use needleless connectors avoid stop cocks because stop cocks are a source of uh, perpetual infection and opening and you know handling and on those sort of things then close catheter access systems so this, that's the bundle now you know you will realize that there are not everything that you, is not covered in the bundle these are few things which are covered that does not mean other things are not important for example should we use uh, antimicrobial coated catheters and you know there are there is a role for anti antimicrobial catheters but probably only in those people who got in uh, who either who got a high risk of infection crbsi or where the collapse rate is higher than the institutional goal despite sort of uh, whatever you do so in so there is a role for antimicrobial coated catheters there is now a role for uh, chlorhexidine coated dressings the uh, biopatch is one of them right and the cdc actually now recommends that you should put it in adults at least uh, for in patients who got central lines so these are additional things which are required and the standard practices the standard good sensible practices must continue so we can't say i'll do only five elements of the bundle and nothing else you must do everything properly and in addition make sure you do each and every of the five elements of the bundle religiously in all patients right so again do not routinely change catheters remove them if there's pass avoid guide wire techniques replace iv sets at regular intervals you know remove your tubings for blood every 24 hours and these are sim simple sensible things that you need to continue to do and don't say i will only do five things and nothing else right so you do everything and make sure those five things in that bundle are done properly religiously every time okay so doing the bundle is not a reason or an excuse not to do other stuff make sure you do everything well and make sure you practice all the bundle elements perfectly okay so we'll now come to the ventilator bundle because that's the other big intervention in the intensive care unit so again uh, five elements elevation of the head end of the bed daily sedation vacation and assessment of readiness to extubate and then there are three controversial recommendations now prevent stress ulcer prophylaxis deep vein thrombosis prophylaxis and oral care with chlorhexidine now these two you know stress ulcer prophylaxis and dvt prophylaxis have probably got very little to do with ventilator assisted pneumonia so i really even after all these years i have not really understood although people have tried to explain why these two things come in they just probably contribute to good overall care of the patient but i am not sure how specific they are as far as uh, prevention of uh, vap is concerned but yes in the care of a patient who is ventilated these two are extremely important right but as far as pneumonia prevention is concerned and maybe they are not really all that important and we'll talk about chlorhexidine a little later so these are the five things which are there uh, so head and elevation is important because if you consider the pathogenesis of uh, vap it's because of as uh, regurgitation of uh, gastric uh, contents and uh, and if you elevate the head of the bed then the amount of regurgitation is reduced and therefore microaspiration across the endotracheal tube puff is reduced and that will therefore reduce the incidence risk of nosocomial pneumonia it seems to be simple but again unlike in the catheter bundle the central line bundle this intervention is not very strong evidence on that sort of thing but there are a couple of small trials which suggested that this was this would work and that's why it's commonly used and it's very common practice today to ventilate all patients in a, a semi reclining position or a 30 degrees head up position that's pretty standard nowadays okay sedation is very important because if you inappropriately sedate patients if you sedate patients too much they stay on the ventilator longer and it's more difficult to extubate them on time and therefore the longer the patient is on a ventilator the longer the patient has an endotracheal tube in place then the longer is the uh, the more higher is the risk of infection so if you have strategies to reduce the amount of sedatives that you give for example one strategy was daily interruption of sedation if you're giving infusions of sedation every day you stop the infusion for a few hours till the patient is a little awake and follows commands and then you restart the sedation of the patient later right so that was deep sedation with daily interruption of sedation we now practice light sedation for most patients so light sedation as so keep the patient as light as possible and uh, you know that may reduce the incidence of vap and you should try and get that tube out you know so uh, 
as fast as possible and get the patient off the ventilator as fast as possible. So every day, so like in a central line, every day you keep asking, do I need the central line? When the patient is ventilated every day, you ask, do I need this patient to be on the ventilator and should I extubate this patient? And the faster you can extubate the patient, you will reduce complications and reduce the duration of ventilation. So daily screening of respiratory function, daily spontaneous breathing trials whenever possible, when the patient's condition permits. And if you do this on a regular basis by protocol, rather than by, you know, when the doctor comes and says, ah, I don't think he's ready for a spontaneous breathing trial. But there was a very nice trial which looked at this, you know, one in one group, the the doctors came and decided whether or not this patient was ready for a spontaneous breathing or a weaning trial. In another group, the respiratory therapists and nurses by protocol gave them a spontaneous breathing trial. And lo and behold, the ones who had it by protocol got weaned faster. And the doctors, of course, wrong as usual. And, you know, so they got, those who by protocol got spontaneous breathing trials actually got uh, extubated faster. So you must assess readiness to wean by protocol every, once the patient is out of the critical phase of resilience. Chest ulcer prophylaxis, like I said, is a little controversial from the VAP point of view. Of course, it reduces risk of breath, uh, bleeding, but there is data to suggest uh, that it may, may increase the risk of VAP. We'll talk about that a little later. And thromboprophylaxis, again, good for general care, not, probably not much related to uh, VAP. Now, chlorhexidine was added much later in 2010. And that was based on a meta-analysis which was published and the, uh, the pathophysiology or the pathological rationale behind it was that the dental flour harbors bacteria, which along with the saliva can get aspirated and cause pneumonia. And if you mouth is cleaned with chlorhexidine, even in the patient of ventilator, you can always clean the mouth with uh, chlorhexidine. Uh, a patient who's conscious and awake and doesn't have a tube can even gargle with uh, chlorhexidine. But if you can do mouth care with chlorhexidine, then you can reduce the bacteria in the dental plaque and you might actually get reduced the ventilator associated with it. Now, there were many things which were not there in this one. And I think once non invasive ventilation came in, you know, once people, intensivists were started using non invasive ventilation, they realized the VAP rates were much lower with non invasive ventilators uh, than with uh, ventilation via endotracheal tube or tracheostomy. And so, in fact, many people now call this not necessarily a ventilator-associated pneumonia, but an intubation-associated pneumonia. So, you should try and avoid intubation if possible. So, if you can give non-invasive ventilation, nothing like it. If you can avoid intubation, nothing like it. Really, sir. And we also know that the pneumonia occurs because there is microaspiration of uh, either gastric material or oral contents across the cuff of the endotracheal tube. So, if you put a cuff and below the cuff, you have something to suck out those secretions which are trickling across the cuff, that subclaudic suction, then you may actually be able to reduce the incidence of ventilators or pneumonia. So the Scottish bundle added these two, right? So avoid intubation if possible and use endotracheal tube with subglottic suction. So those are two important additions. And the INICC had even more things knowing the kind of uh, limitations and, and the kind of uh, infrastructure we have in our ICU. So, no, they said that make sure your tubing is free of uh, water and secretions. So make sure there's no secretions which are there in the tubing, which can go back into the patient. Make sure there's no leak around the cuff. So there's no there's less chance of aspiration, subglottic suction, smooth enteral nutrition, aseptic aspiration technique, very important, right? Now in the West, it is taken for granted that everyone does suction, endotracheal suction in an aseptic way. But in many of our ICs, we need to specifically train nurses and technicians to do it correctly. We can't, we may or may not have two nurses every time to do suction for every patient. So each nurse must know how to do an aseptic aspiration technique on her own, right? Or on his own. So that's something which is very, they, INICC also suggested to use a heat and moisture exchanger bacterial filter, bacterial viral filter, which again may reduce the risk of aspiration, a closed aspiration system. Expensive, but again, where's, where nursing and uh, other uh, manpower is limited, this may help in reducing the incidence of uh, infection. And that we use all of these in our ICU and I, it has made a difference. I'll show you that data. So uh, these are important things which are added to the bundle. Of course, the number of elements has become quite long, but I think they are all important because they have a 
strong uh, pathological, uh, physiological rationale, a biological rationale. There is data. So randomized controlled trials to suggest that subglottic suction and closed aspiration reduces the incidence of VAP. So all those sort of things need to be there, in, especially for Indian ICU. And this is a very recent uh, uh, review on VAP. And you know, and say as far as prevention is concerned, VAP bundles, lower VAP, they're extensively studied. So again, there's no need to quote 100 studies to say that the VAP bundles work. They do work. Okay. Uh, so bundles are not bundle. Okay, they are very, very good. So there are new things which are coming up, like tapered endotracheal tubes. So far, I've not showed an impact. Automated endotracheal cuff monitoring system to maintain the cuff pressure constant, no leaks. They may lower rate, but uh, as of now, we don't have evidence, but there is a signal that they may seem to work. And that again, seems to make sense. Oral digest, oral decontamination and selective uh, digestive decontamination, very popular in Netherlands, but uh, probably in countries like ours, where we've got a very high antibiotic utilization, as well as a high antibiotic resistance rate, probably not going to be useful. Probiotics, we are not sure. Stress also prophylaxis, a little controversial, like I said, it may increase VAP rates especially when you use uh, H2 blockers and uh, uh, pantoprazole and so on. Uh, but randomized trials have not found an impact, but many studies suggest that VAP rates may be slightly higher. But you have to balance the risk of bleeding from the GI tract versus the rate of VAP, and probably the risk of bleeding is slightly higher than the rate of VAP, so we still persist with stress ulcer prophylaxis in some patients. Okay, now, oral chlorhexidine have, was recommended, but some studies recently have shown that there might be an adverse outcome, and that's because that as chlorhexidine may again be aspirated, may trickle down the cuff, and that can cause a sort of chemical pneumonitis, right? So, at the bottom of at the the bottom line seems to be that most of the benefit seems to come by avoiding intubation, minimizing the duration that the endotracheal tube is in place by using non-invasive ventilation or now high flow nasal oxygen. Use care bundles addressing the risk factors of aspiration, like make sure the cough is well inflated, subglottic suction. Keep the sedation light so you can like, wean patients faster. So light sedation, spontaneous breathing trials, and early mobilization, all of which contribute to helping them get the tube out fast. Right? So these are things which probably seem to make a big difference. Okay, there is a urine tract catheter bundle, so make sure that the catheter is secured and so on. And now, you know, we know, now let's say we know all these things. We've read the data, we know the data, we know the evidence, we've read all the papers, we read NEJM, JAMA, CDS, Clinical Infectious Diseases, Journal of Infection. We know all the stuff. The key is implementation. You know, we may know everything, but if you don't implement this properly, we are not going to fail, right? So how do we sort of implement this? Of course, we know the bundles. Now you need to educate. So everyone needs to be aware that what needs to be done. And then you need to have interventions to implement the bundles, and then we need to have surveillance. Surveillance and our process surveillance and the outcome surveillance and the infection rates and so on. So in our ICU, within our ICU chart, we've got this sort of uh, section where we look at all the bundles, uh, all the bundle elements. Now this is for the uh, VAP bundle. So we, they have nurses and the technicians keep picking what all is done and not done. And if it's not done, they need to do it. So they have all been sort of trained into this kind of thing, okay? And then there's a checklist which the nurses do. So again, that's sort of a checklist, but say all the bundle elements are there in that. And you need to monitor for your surveillance, for practices, the process surveillance, as well as the infections surveillance. So we are part of the INICC and the surveillance forms are very good. So they sort of tell you what it is. We feed this data into the INICC database and then they tell us what the infections are. So this is done by our infection control nurses and our data entry operators in the in the ICU, and they sort of do all these sort of things over here. So you, we do all the sur sur surveillance processes for hand hygiene, for catheter uh, catheter care, and ventilator care. And these are some of our data showing that the compliance with catheter care with the ventilator care bundle, the entire bundle. So even if one is missing, it's non-compliant. And you can see when we started off seven, eight years ago, we were not very good. Even now we are moderately good. The highest we've reached is 91%, but we are 88% of the times in 88% patients, there is compliance with the ventilator bundle. It's slightly more in 2019. And similar thing for catheter care. And it's a similar, for urinary catheter care, we are fantastic. 
right? So almost 100% compliance with all the elements of the unique capital content. How does this translate into prevention of infection, right? Now, when you calculate how you prevent infections, I mean, it's not enough to say that, oh, the incidence rate was 20% of patients in this year and 5% of patients in the next year. So we had a fantastic incident because we know that the incidence or the prevalence of infection depends on how long the uh, device has been in place. So you, know, you not, not only need to know how many patients have had the line, but how many days the lines have been in. And therefore the concept of catheter days or the device days has come in. So for a, someone we are looking for a clapsy, a central line associated bloodstream infection or a catheter or ventilator is looking at per infections per 1000 catheter days, right? We also need to know device utilization ratio. In other words, how many patients or how many devices per patient in the ICU? And for example, in our ICU, 80% of our patients are ventilated. There's 1.1. So some patients have more than one central line, so and so on and so forth. And also the severity of illness, because we know that the more severely ill the patient, the higher is the uh, infection rate. You need to consider all of these things when you look at your data. But your infection rates must not be just in terms of percent patients who have the infection, but in per 1,000 catheter days. And this is how we have proven. We had a shockingly high VAP rate when we started off. And once we implement the bundle, the very sharp drop, and we sort of maintained very well. And this is the INICC threshold in 2018. And this is the US threshold. Now we are considerably above the US threshold, but well below the INICC threshold. So we've seen that, you know, we can, so this feedback is also very important. That we can see what's happening and then we tell people, boss, your infections have gone up, do something, and you are back down again, right? So these are the way we use our infection data. Clapsy rates were extremely high to start with. And, you know, we were above the INICC threshold for benchmark for quite some time, but now we are well below the INIC threshold, but still well above the US uh, thresholds. And we are pretty good with our unit tract infection. Remember our compliance was 100% with all the elements of the bundle. India has had high catheter rate, high device rate infection rates. So this is India in orange, and you can, this is the US benchmark, and this is the INICC benchmark. So we are, a little below the INICC benchmark, but we are way above the US benchmarks overall. Now, I showed you data from our hospital. Does using a bundle, for example, the INICC bundle, does it really make a difference to outcomes in Indian ICUs across India? This was a very, very nice study which was done, uh, right? And uh, this was a study which was done in India. 21 ICUs from 14 hospitals in 10 cities up to 2011. And they use this entire bundle. And I say the bundle, I meant the entire process of the bundle, which includes education, outcome surveillance, process surveillance, feedback. So multi-dimensional approach is what they call it. So in the baseline, before the intervention was implemented, this was the rate of VAP, 17.4, very high, 1,000 mentally days. After intervention, down to almost 11. That is a 38% reduction. So certainly using the bundle approach works. It works in... The world, it works in our ICU at Tata Memorial and it works in many ICUs in India. So I don't think we should uh, hesitate to use the bundle, but not what we should do. And every hospital or every ICU has to have its own way on how to best to implement the bundle, how best to educate, how best to train, and how best to translate our knowledge into an effective implementation and follow it up with monitoring the process and monitoring, of course, your outcomes. And I've not presented any data about the microbial uh, patterns, resistance and tenuity patterns, but they also need to be checked and monitored. So I need just to conclude, the bundle approach is a plan, do, study, act approach. Right? It's not just knowing that there are five things. So identify those interventions, develop the will in the providers to deliver the interventions every time that they're indicated, measure compliance as all or none, redesign the delivery system to ensure that the interventions are delivered. And that is the key. I think where we falter is in the delivery and the implementation of our knowledge and measure the related outcomes to ascertain the effects of changes in the delivery system. So thank you very much for inviting me and thank you very much for listening. And I'd be happy to take questions if there are any. Uh, thank you so much, sir. And it was, it was really a mesmerizing talking. And it's a, it's, a, it's, you just can't uh, uh, say anything in that, in this talk, but uh, uh, just to summarize it, what we uh, would like to, I mean, what the bottom line is, as you said, that uh, bundles really work and everyone should 
follow the bundle to reduce the incidences. And bundles are not just bundles. The most important thing is uh, you have to, it's, it's all evidence-based steps or elements which needs to be co considered all in total. It's not a single element can be, you can take a single element and then you can, uh, you can work out with infection prevention. The most thing is, and that, that is where the checklist and, and the bundles are, people are confused with. So you've got to take all the three, all the elements of the bundle to work it, to have a very good reduction in your incidences. And uh, the, the other thing is the bundles are not only the thing which will prevent your infection. The other, the normal things which has standard protocols, standard elements of other prevention has to be considered vis a -vis with your bundle pro, uh, prevention. That is more, very important. And you've got to also consider what are the things which are new, coming into the, uh, into the market, new things which can be really add to your bundle uh, 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 prevention as well. So that can also further reduce your infection. So these are the things which really added and they were really, I mean, people should implement this. Most important, what you said is, that only following them without any surveillance and without any compliance when proper, you must, must have a very good surveillance that whether you're, you're, you're have complying to the bundles, that is very important. Otherwise you will not be able to uh, exactly assess that whether after implying, implementing a bundle, whether it really worked that you reduce it or you will not be able to identify where you're lacking or where, what, where you're faltering that you are not being able to uh, get the reduction in your infection. That is also very important. Surveillance and uh, compliance uh, is, uh, are the two things which will really, really let you know that, yes, whether your bundles are really working. Uh, uh, and thank you so much, sir. It was an excellent talk. I mean, uh, I, think, I think there should be no, 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 or no questions from the audience because you really dealt in detail. The most important thing is the bundles, which are very much prevalent in, in, an, in, an, in any ICU, and uh, what are we supposed to do? You've said it very vividly and people uh, uh, should uh, take it um, by heart that this, these are the things which needs to be followed. And we are really uh, thankful to you once again. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, thank you very much. I would hand over the mic to, uh, yeah, thank you so much. I would hand over the mic to uh, Dr. Sardana, uh, um, uh, sir, please. Thank you, Dr. Moel. And uh, a wonderful listening to uh, Dr. Devitya. So I, I had the honor of uh, requesting a very, very respected and uh, very dear person personally, um, whom I live with, Dr. Subhash Todi. Um, and sir is a medical advisor and director of critical care and um, at AMRI, um, uh, MRI group of hospitals and HOD of uh, Department of Academics and Research, uh, chairman of, um, also a chairman of ISCCM Research Committee. Uh, and um, I have um, a privilege of uh, working um, uh, with him for many years now, in fact, uh, both at ISCCM uh, workshops and also uh, in, at HISI. Uh, he's, a, he's a member of executive board of HISI and a very revered person, very knowledgeable. So uh, you can see the publications. I mean, uh, uh, people like Stormwater like him don't read uh, much uh, uh, introduction. Sir, uh, over to you uh, for your honor. Thank you. Thank you, Raman. It's always nice to follow Dr. Jiggy, a good friend of mine. Thank you, Dr. Sardana and his team for organizing and giving me a very difficult topic. So let me <laughs> how I can do justice. So <laughs> uh, let me share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, sir. Okay. You know, this is the topic given to me, uh, which is probably more suited to a clinical psychologist, a behavioral psychologist, or a social scientist. I'm a physician, a clinician, but I will share my observation because I do think it's a very, very important uh, topic to discuss. We heard about the nuts and bolts of uh, infection control, the VAP prevention bundle, 
but are they really working? Half of my patients are succumbing to VAP, even after all this exercise, all these measures that are being taken in the best of the hospitals in our country. So I think there is something else that we need to address. That's what would be my observation uh, in this talk. Let us start with COVID. Uh, nowadays, you can't start any talk without COVID. And as you could see, it has spread across the world. And it has highlighted three things. The first is, it is the human behavior which was responsible for this pandemic, apart from the contagiousness of the virus, but it is obviously the human behavior. So it shows that a human behavioral pattern can reflect into spread of infectious disease. And if that disease is contagious, it can lead to a pandemic and loss of millions of life. So that's the first lesson, the very obvious lesson that we learned. The second very obvious lesson we learned was that controlling human behavior was very, very difficult. One had to go to extraordinary measures in order to control it. So much so that one had to go for complete lockdown, get the people in their house, not to venture outside, to control their behavior. And that apart from vaccine, I think that was the second most important measure, which probably is causing a dent in the pandemic over the last few months. So that's the second lesson we learned that very difficult to control human behavior, uh, which will be discussed uh, later on, uh, so that how can we uh, what are the behavioral modifications we can do, but uh, we have learned it's very difficult. And the third thing that we have learned in this pandemic, that if we do infection control behavioral practices, the incidence of waterborne infections, the foodborne infections, the respiratory droplet infections, airborne transmissions of other diseases became very low. I had uh, my ICUs, non-COVID ICUs going empty during the COVID pandemic. It's not that the patients were not able to come, uh, but it was just not there. So that also shows that if infection control practices are being exercised, we can do a dent in the other infections. Uh, as well successfully. So I think three very, very important lessons we learned from this pandemic, which I think we should carry forward to our other infections. Now coming to the infections that we deal day in and day out, yes, it's, it's a slow pandemic, let me tell you. And since it is not reportable, probably it is underreported. It's not a reportable disease, so it's underreported. I'm sure if we start reporting all MDRs and XDRs, PDRs, this map will be full with black. And you know, our country is, is in the middle and is, it's very on the higher side of drug resistant infection. So it is very, very important those infection control behaviors uh, how can we exercise and the, and the knowledge that we got from the COVID pandemic, uh, can we utilize that in, in this scenario so that even the mortality with this attributable mortality of nosocomial infection might be even more than what the total COVID mortality was worldwide over a span of many years, of eight to 10 years. We, we, are, we lose a lot of patients with nosocomial infections. Even communities, we get patients with drug-resistant infections. Drug-resistant Klebsiella become a very, very important problem. So this is again a slow pandemic, a killer just like COVID. And the same infection control behavioral things need to be applied here as well. So let us see where are we going wrong? Why are we not able to contain this from a 
clinician's point and then just an observer over the years how what what could be our problems and what could be the solutions to these problems you know there are two pillars to this issue one is antibiotic stewardship and one is infection control i must confess that antibiotic stewardship has become a kind of a logo and a prototype and infection control has taken a back seat the funding even the big companies the pharmaceuticals i think it is because of the industry the because of the antibiotic industry the stewardship program has taken a lead and so that's why even uh, the public the ex executive the administrators even the government is taking lot of interest in antibiotic stewardship but i do not see the same kind of a zeal to be uh, done for infection control i think they are equally important equally important i would even i will say so in our country with the resource limitations and other probably infection control will be much much more important yes we have our share of drug resistant infections but infection control is the source of that and if you do a good infection control antibiotic stewardship will follow because we won't have so many of resistant infections so i think it is equally important but unfortunately it's not being highlighted so much and not much funding is being done it is not being marketed because there is not much of an industry support to it apart from few antiseptics nobody is promoting infection control so i think that is something uh, i think that is one of the uh, to start with could be one of the big problems that we need to address now coming to this root uh, theme of this talk changing mindset and behavior whose mindset are we talking about the focus the current focus of changing mindset has been on doctors and nurses consultants residents senior junior doctors we are the uh, front line workers and we are the ones who are supposed to implement the infection control policies protocols and we are the ones who are responsible if there is an infection but is that so uh, we'll discuss about it uh, i think apart from the doctors and nurses the other human resources used in the wards and the, in the icus in the hospital including housekeeping the maintenance department the plumbing it, to make sure that the water is sterile the water is hygienic the technicians the x ray technicians when they come to do the portable x rays the lab technicians when they take the blood the itu technicians when they are handling the patient and the secretarial staff you know like uh, computer keyboard has been found to be one of the common source of dissemination of uh, staph aureus infection in some of the icus so so i think these people are also should be taken into account and there are works there are lot of literature in fact the present focus and the present research whatever it is in infection control is focused on these uh, on these human resources as if uh, we are the ones who will make or break infection control issues but i would uh, i would have a different uh, uh, conception about this there are people who are not in focus at the present moment but i think are equally important equally responsible at the end of the day to for implementation of infection control and i think the mindset and the behavioral pattern needs to be addressed in these individuals as as well in a big hospital depend ours is a very heterogeneous healthcare delivery we had big corporate hospital with board of directors we have trust hospital we have government hospitals with department of health taking care of them so the people involved in these are the ultimate decision makers and it has got a bearing it has got a bearing on infection control implementation 
and they execute their decisions through CEOs, chief operating officers, and chief financial officers I, in one form or other, whatever alphabet we can give it to it. But almost all the healthcare organizations from the top down will have to go through some of these administrative personnel in order to execute the directions. And they have a bearing on infection control. The purchasing department, uh, especially in a big hospital, 300, 400 bedded hospitals, what kind of antiseptics are they purchasing? What kind of surgical gloves or sterile gloves are they purchasing? So purchasing department, is it, are they looking at a margin? Are they looking at the quality? We do not know. We are the frontline workers. We have no idea. But these are the ones which ultimately will have a bearing on infection control. And we don't have any control over these things. HR department, hiring an infection control nurse, hiring a data entry operator, these are such a vital things. It is easy to form an infection control committee with all the ingredients. But if the HR department doesn't support us with one or two infection control nurse, there can be one infection control nurse for 100, 150 beds, which is, and then we have what we are having now. And I think that is where these things needs to be addressed. And the other administrative heads, including the operational heads, the medical supers, the nursing supers, they also play a role in the sense they are the ones who kind of delegate the duties. If we they take away in a nursing super shifts and infection control nurse to some other duties, then the infection control department would suffer. So I think these are the key personnel which are equally responsible. I would say sometimes even more responsible uh, for ultimate infection control implementation. And what about the mindset, the behavioral pattern of these personnel has never been addressed, never been addressed. And I think this is something which we need to look at and it, in order for, and that is where I think we are missing in spite of all the educations and all we are doing with the doctors and nurses, our nosocomial sepsis rate still very high, very high as you saw in Dr. Jiggy's uh, presentation. Now these were uh, in focus, but a little later, but there are ingredients which are, I would say equally important, which are out of focus. Nobody are even thinking about that. Uh, you know, accreditation bodies, they are busy with so many other things in order to accreditate uh, organization, uh, NABH, uh, JCI. Uh, they are busy with a lot of things. And infection control is probably a small part, a uh, small part of their entire uh, component. And I think that is where they need to give more and more uh, focus to the infection control which becomes binding to the organizations. Insurance, how will the insurance is going to play in controlling infection control, uh, infections in, in, in the hospital? Legislative, what is the, uh, the legislatives who, have lo who make laws? Uh, can there be laws for infection control? I will discuss in which way are we heading. Judiciaries and different advocacies groups needs also to be taken into account while looking into infection control. And they are at the present moment, little out of focus. And ultimately, completely out of focus are our patients, patients' family, their surrogates, the public, the media. And that is where, you know, if these, if this out of focus uh, component, if they start playing a big role, which will reflect on to the legislative, the judiciaries and the accreditations, which will reflect on to our administrative personnel, then it will percolate. Uh, we are doing our jobs, I think, reasonably well, but until unless we are giving, given a good quality antiseptic product, until unless we are giving 
I will discuss what are the ingredients that we require in order for a good infection control. So let me first take just a few slides on uh, our the frontline workers, the doctors and nurses, what has been done for behavioral modification. But as I mentioned, they are they. I think we play a uh, not a very big role in in the entire sphere of things. If you look at, there are intrapersonal factors, individual characteristics, what is their knowledge, their skills, their perceptions, and there is interpersonal. What are they looking at? The leadership, the friends. So, what about the research in this behavioral modification? So, few research has been done in this intrapersonal things, and what they have found that uh, clinicians think that antimicrobial resistance was problem nationally in their, rather than in their own institution or practice, when they have done a focus group and surveys. And there have been an attitudes among nurses that yes, there is a risk involved uh, in infections and they should wash hands. And knowledge matters, a multifaceted program, you know, like uh, Dr. Jiggy mentioned, the VAP prevention behaviors and all did decrease the MIC, uh, they did decrease the rate of VAP, but to a minuscule amount. And is it sustainable? That's the thing that we need to look at. What about interpersonal? Looking at others and learning. See one, do one, teach one. So these are the interpersonal things. Set an example. So looking at the consultant, the director, the HODs, washing hands will set an example for the other healthcare personnel, champion a cause. So these were the things, the behavioral things which have been found to alter the behavior of the frontline workers in order to improve the infection control compliances, the hand hygiene and the other bundle compliances as has been mentioned. Dr. Namita, one of our faculty has done a uh, very nice study looking at, this is one of the very few studies I could look, I could find in behavioral, uh, addressing the behavioral changes in healthcare in, uh, infections. And what she did was, uh, the, the non-compliance to infection control practices were found to be psychological barriers, preconceived notion, cultural influences. And in our study, there was a psychologist who addressed these issues to around 25 nurses. And they did find that there was decrease in HAI. But you know, when you look at infection control and quality, most of the before and after studies had found a decrease in HAI. What we do not know is how much sustainable are they over time. But at least it shows that at even transient, it, it does work. I think the one of the important reason of non-compliance is probably what is called the slot machine phenomenon. You know, the behavior of a person depends if they are rewarded immediately for an action. For example, if one gets hypoxic, the nurses would immediately raise the FiO2 and the saturation would go up. And so the behavior of the nurse is almost 100% compliant on this. Somebody drops the blood pressure, you know, NORAD goes up, the blood pressure immediately goes up. So they are 100% compliant. But washing hands, there is no immediate effect. There is a very, very remote effect, which is very difficult to comprehend. And that could be one of the reasons that probably the non-compliant ones are the ones who looks at, there is no, they don't see the immediate benefit of these kind of practices. So that is one part of the human behavior uh, that needs to be addressed. Now, let me talk about this other uh, uh, out of focus and not in focus group. Now, as I was mentioning, the advocacy group, the United Nations and the World Health Organizations, they, are, they have given big, big slogans and there are a lot of things which are on their website on this, but they need to walk the talk in the sense that what is the funding given for infection control. They have devoted quite a few much funding for antibiotic stewardship, but I do not see so much of funding for infection control. 
So that is something this big advocacy group needs to look at. Now, what are the legislatives are doing? I will give you two examples. There was an outbreak of C. diff in United Kingdom. And what they did was they looked at the deaths due to nosocomial infections, the cost involved due to nosocomial infections, and they tackling healthcare associated infection was a top priority for the government. And they had an effective inspection regime that can make a difference. Hospitals, which fail to meet standards, will be issued with tough new improvement orders, and there could be sanctions. In fact, they directly held administrators responsible for a nosocomial infection outbreak. And that made immediately an overnight change of the behavioral attitudes of the administrators. The hospitals were flooded with infection control nurses and many, many other things because it was their job which was at stake. And I think that is where they went right and they were able to decrease the incidence of nosocomial infection so much so uh, it, it, became a, uh, it became an important thing in UK and it was an election campaign thing for UK uh, with the government launched a clean your hands campaign. Hospital acquired infection were a major election issue in the UK general election with all three major parties pledging to increase investment in hospital hygiene. So you could imagine this, I have never seen in, in a manifesto of our country with this kind of a thing. Next was Israel. If you go to a, the way Israel has tackled its uh, multi-drug resistant infection is phenomenal. And it's an example set to the world. But this is a small country, but at least they are they at least showed that it is doable. We also have done good work. Uh, our There are guidelines, but I do not see so much of uh, implementation. And, and I do not see these guidelines available to our RMOs and others uh, so that they are aware of what is what we have. Yes, uh, the executives have put this on the website, but it needs to be more marketed well and implemented. Now, what about the insurers? You see, I will take a couple of examples of US. Medicare non-payment of hospital acquired infection. They just stopped uh, paying for hospital acquired infection and they found that definitely the infection rate went down. There was some gaming of the system. They were not reporting the infection and in some other forms they are being reported. Because it, the insurance companies pay the price for hospital acquired infection. They calculated and they found that they lose so much of dollars per patient. So if you take the entire infection, it will be billions of dollars. So an insurance company at the end of the day, uh, the, uh, the patients have to pay the premium for the insurance. So, they, uh, so what they have devised a method uh, they have developed a non-for-profit advocacy group which will look into all this phenomenon and see how they can reduce the insurance burden for hospital-acquired infection. And they have introduced this pay-for-performance methods. Uh, so sometimes even financial incentives are given for better health outcomes. Now, what are the outcomes that we need to measure? It is very difficult to measure it is difficult to show that the process measures like your hand hygiene causes decreased mortality. So if I measure mortality, I would say there is no difference. So, but then I have to do the process measures. If I do my processes correctly, ultimately the outcome, good outcome will follow. And that has been our culture. Unfortunately, we have not imbibed it in our uh, quality control measures. We just need to do our processes correctly. Let's not run after the outcome. The outcome will follow. Good outcome will follow. So the leaf frog group had this, hospitals can't find the problem. Hospital can't figure out how to solve the problem, even if they find it. And nobody does what they are told anyway. So that was their 
uh, in their survey of the different hospitals they found. So the leaf frog group, they, they got together, they surveyed many, many, they surveyed thousands of hospitals and their quality control and how they are doing. And then they advised the insurance companies that look, these are the hospitals which are making good things. They have infection control policies, they have committees and they have funding for infection control. And they, they have a safety grades, A, B, C, D, E, F. And their safety grade is 100% transparent. It is even publicly available data openly available to the public and prevalence of inpatient infection becomes a safety issue uh, for leaf frog group. So they have access. Uh, the, the hospitals are now vying to give their data. If they are doing a good job, they give data to the leaf frog group. Uh, even the Newsweek have shown the, uh, the different products the leaf frog group goes through because as I mentioned, we don't know about the quality of antiseptics. So this group goes through all the commercial products. There is no in, uh, incentive involved in this. And they, uh, they advise that what would be a good quality product. And so empowering consumers. Uh, and so the hospitals take up their advice. So hospital, and now what about the regulatory bodies? The Joint Commission, it has got a very good infection prevent and it highlights, I think uh, Dr. Raman and other would uh, agree with me that they have a, infection control and prevention is a very important part of their agenda whenever they want to accredit any hospital. So this is how this thing uh, goes. So they have a list of uh, different issues which needs to be addressed. We also have our NABH uh, equivalent and it shows it has an infection control program, but I think we need to be uh, this, our accreditation agencies need to be much more strong and not only in paper, they need to make sure that it is being implemented. The hospital have budgetary provision for infection control. They have to highlight that. What about the legal liabilities? You see, this has not been come in highlight, at least in our country, but I think it is going to come as people get more and more aware of these situations. Now there are proving negligent hospital acquired infections, holding hospital responsible for hospital acquired infection, malpractice liability for infection acquired in hospital. So as you know, the liability suites are definitely going up in our country, but not to so much of an hospital acquired infection, but to other reasons. But I think that is something that we need to uh, make sure that this, this thing might come in future and we need to address this. Now, coming to this structure, process, and outcome quality measure. As I was mentioning, the structure is how, what should be the design of the ward, the ICU, the nurse to patient ratio, doctor patient ratio, what should be the space given to the infection control team? Are they being reimbursed properly? Data entry operators. So, there has been studies which had shown a positive correlation with each of these ingredients to a better outcome in infection control, be it be a ward design, be it be a nursing to patient ratio, be it to be a infection control nurse, and so on and so forth. But in order to show it, we need to measure it. If you cannot measure it, you cannot improve it. And for that, we need data. Without data, you are just another person with an opinion. And for data, we need a data entry operator. And that is where the role of administrators come in. Now, so all these structural measures are beyond our control, are beyond the control of doctors and nurses. So why proper structure is not being implemented? I'm sure it boils down to the revenue. So we need to talk to the administrators if we have because we are passionate about infection control. The society, hospital infection society was built up on this passion. We need to put up a business case. And that is where I think uh, we need to kind of teach our doctors and other people how to prove a business case to the administrators, how to change their mindset and behavior in order to get uh, our infection control nursing, our get a space, get a budgetary, provisions for this. 
and ultimately the people. As I mentioned, the antibiotic stewardship is definitely being highlighted in public media as well, but not so much of infection prevention and control. You know, Infectious Disease Society of America on their website has asking and advocacy to the public to write to their congressmen in for best practices and infection control practices. And if there is, they see a lack of infection control in the hospital in their area. There was a study uh, which was conducted many years back by Janice Zimmerman, very nice study, which looked into how do I identify a good ICU, a well-performing ICU? How do I separate a good ICU from a bad ICU? Is it the structure? How bad, big is the ICU? How many nurses, doctors, as we mentioned, structure is important. Or are we dealing with the processes? Are they doing their compliance, the web bundles, all the bundles correctly? And surprisingly, they didn't find either the structure or the processes ultimately has a bearing on the outcome. What they found rather, a patient-centered culture, the ICUs which, which were having a patient-centered culture, a good leadership, effective communication, these ICU performed much, much better. Even a small ICU with a small ward design, a very small wards will perform very well if these ingredients are there. So I think this basically brings us to the fact that it is the behavioral pattern, it is the mindset rather than your the space and, and the other things. Yes, they are important, but I think these things are even more, we can have best of personnel, we can have huge number of doctors and nurses, we can have big space, but if we do not have these things, the leadership, the communication, the good culture, we are not going to achieve a good infection control. So I think that is where I would end and I would hand it over to Raman for his comments. Sir, uh, <laughs> by saying comments, you are, uh, uh, sir, that, that talk doesn't, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful talk. In fact, uh, had, it, had I been uh, physically present, I would have given you a standing ovation on that. <laughs> it's a very difficult topic and you have dealt it in such a wonderful manner, touching every aspect of it from, uh, you know, Talk, you talked about lessons learned from pandemic and how uh, behavioral changes have been brought about. Uh, whatever percentage might be there, but there is a definite behavior shift in the human mind, um, uh, you know, human beings' uh, mindset. And that is where uh, this can be uh, uh, taken up in our daily routine uh, healthcare uh, facilities as well. Very well said. Uh, said uh, uh, IPC, you talked about IPC and IMS uh, and AMSP twin um, objectives. And uh, um, despite of, yes, uh, AMSP being brought about or AMR being brought about by the Prime Minister in 2016 in his Man Ki Baat, and then later on, uh, um, a big initiative by WHO uh, along with Government of India. I think we are on the right track for AMSP programs and one of the major strategies is to uh, promote uh, infection prevention and control in that. So uh, that is where I think Dr. Vinod Paul also yesterday was uh, highly rec recommending uh, the role for HISI. Um, uh, as one of the roles that he recommended was on these lines, uh, where we can do a lot of things with the government. Uh, and uh, you talked about uh, who's, actually whose mindset needs to be changed yeah. Uh, so right from top management to material uh, management managers to HR managers and administrative uh, heads, I mean, this is something which, which uh, uh, actually needs a drastic change. And uh, uh, that is what we brought about in the HIZIPAMS, uh, you know, the um, workshop that we had where you had led that workshop. Uh, for three days, we just uh, contained ourselves in that, uh, in that place. And brought about so a whole module was on this how to change the mindset on uh, and it has been updated from day to day this thing but I think more and more uh, uh, you know people need to be exposed more and more institutions need to be exposed so uh, and you rightly said that uh, uh, people need to be exposed at the residence level at, at the junior doctors level 
at a senior doctors level at nursing level so whosoever can make an impact on the management uh, should be and uh, uh, everyone who is working uh, has the right impact to know what sort of uh, personal protective equipment are being um uh, you know uh, the person is using and uh, that you brought out very very well sir very well sir including other equipment and uh, instruments in use so that is something which we uh, uh, need to you know promote more and more uh, you talked about accreditation insurance legislator and uh, judiciary and advocacy group role uh, very well brought each and every uh, aspect of them and how they can change the uh, mindset and behavior of uh, healthcare professionals uh, and also uh, uh, the support services um, in, in healthcare institutions and uh, facilities so uh, you also talked about fierce leadership uh, which is which is something which is lacking um, um, in majority of the places uh, a person uh, you know without taking one's own interest and the fighting for the right um, institution of right things in the uh, healthcare facility um, uh, and leading by examples uh, and also accommodating uh, where uh, knowing the difficulties and accommodating and finding solutions so that is where a fierce leader uh, would actually come in so more and more of us need to become fierce leaders in our own facilities uh, uh, and uh, uh, you know every uh, you talked about sustainable effects you talked about uh, reasons for non compliance and uh, how uh, such things can be uh, solved also you know so you you said uh, that advocacy for budgeting for ipc and amsp i think uh, that that was uh, one of the major things which would contribute in future that each and every hospital if they come out with a definitive budget and then they pro you know they put it on the web on their website that this is what um, Uh, um, uh, you know uh, the budget of, for infection prevention and control and on antimicrobial stewardship. This is a uh, figure that we have, and uh, obviously that needs to be without manipulation, so that you know it is just not on paper. It 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 is actually the spend which occurs, and it needs to be audited. That is what you had said uh, all throughout. Uh, you talked about NHS, and you gave examples of how. Uh, things uh, changed after uh, an election um, uh, manifesto talked about uh, uh, healthcare associated infection in a big way and uh, uh, yes we are moving um, as as per india is concerned you you right, very rightly pointed out that uh, implementation is a, is a major challenge for india uh, but uh, now i think with uh, in past few years we have moved uh, fast on these lines so uh, uh, you know things would be in place in the next two or three years and the pandemic has definitely shown us um, the way that it, uh, we have to be prepared as a nation so uh, you talked about pay for performance best infection um, uh, prevention hospitals uh, uh, you know and you also talked about empowering uh, consumers uh, and uh, through quality accreditation processes Uh, you talked about jci and abh accreditations uh, and uh, and these accreditations need to be strengthened uh, despite of constraints in india uh, uh, of uh, uh, implementation processes and to what extent so uh, you also talked about uh, legal liability uh, fixation um, which might come up in very near future and uh, you talked about infrastructure challenges so uh, that we have seen in in this pan pandemic also um uh, uh, you know uh, people who were not prepared uh, on infrastructure had a bad day uh, with their healthcare professionals so uh, you talked about a very you gave a very uh, important uh, line and message in that that you need to measure whatever you are doing uh, in order to improve and in order to manage it uh, so uh, if you one is not uh, measuring well we do not know our deficiencies we do not know our uh, the, what what needs to be improved and uh, uh, where we are doing well so that uh, we can disseminate that sort of uh, knowledge to other uh, institutions as well so very well said sir very well said on that and uh, 
you also made a very, uh, very, very robust appeal on, or I would say, uh, uh, an advocacy for uh, all of us, uh, the doctors, the nurses, um, who work with the patients uh, for, for, for uh, projecting a business case uh, to the management in a way that they should not be able to refuse it. So that is something which, uh, and uh, before the public actually unites uh, or um, and uh, rights to the governments and lawmakers. So uh, I think our judiciary takes a very, very active interest in, into this where uh, there would be a lot of uh, blood, uh, bad blood uh, might come up. So uh, very rightly said, and uh, uh, you ended up with the best performing ICUs. I think that is, that is the message which should go uh, very well with people that patient centered culture, strong uh, uh, medical and nursing leadership as a fierce leadership, effective communication, open collaborative approach. So that is where I think the, for India, that is where the way forward lies because everyone uh, would be clamoring for as much budget as possible. And it's very difficult to keep a check and audit. Hey, G6PD, put up comment, go yes or not? Envilaru G6PD? Yeah, please. So, uh, a uh, wonderful thing, and I think one of the best talks that I've heard ever in uh, behavioral, uh, changing the behavioral uh, mindset of uh, uh, healthcare professionals. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Raman. Just one thing I didn't touch upon was the data sharing. You know, we do generate our own data and we keep it in our own silos. And I think it's a data network and data sharing among big hospitals in our country and open transparent sharing will go a big way of uh, at least analyzing what is our problem, the interventions that we are doing and their impact. Thank you, sir. Thank you sir. very much, sir. And I think that is one thing which we took up with Dr. Virun uh, Paul yesterday yeah. uh, after his uh, talk. Uh, good good you. morning to you, sir. How are you, sir? Oh, I'm fine. How are you? <laughs> uh, I'm handing over to, no, I think, uh, who's, uh, who's the next online? Uh, doctor. Ah, Dr. Ajay Tainam, sir. So after an excellent talk by Dr. Uh, uh, S.K. Dodi, it, it's a proud privilege, in fact, to introduce uh, one of the persons who remains on the background, but is responsible for so much things for so many years. And uh, that is the director of Central Research Institute, Kasali, uh, uh, one of the beautiful places. Uh, uh, and uh, they do such good job on uh, vaccine production and uh, they are the vaccine powerhouse. Um, the type of uh, um, uh, you know, zeal and enthusiasm, uh, which I could see 30 years back in them, um, I think Dr. Ajay uh, uh, Tehran sir has, has um, got that back into uh, action at uh, CRI. And uh, he is a WHO, um, he was a WHO at every advisor from 2001 to 2006. And uh, again, um, it was a WHO consultant, uh, both at WHO Cero. And uh, uh, he, uh, he has about 33 publications to his credit. Um, uh, and he has been majorly working with WHO um, offices, uh, bringing about changes and uh, obviously, um, uh, um, you know, developing a uh, lot of guidelines uh, and on um, and as he has contributed to collaborative studies with WHO and other uh, organizations. So, and he is, he is also a teacher for PhD uh, students and also uh, an examiner um, for PhD and MSc students. So uh, I would uh, just hand over to Dr. Talan, please, for his, uh, for his address on vaccine preventable diseases, a much needed uh, thing which everyone should know about what, what India has been doing, how India has been supporting the world. So uh, over to you, Dr. Dharan, please, sir. Good morning, everyone. 
I am Dr. Ajay Tehlan. I am Director CRI Kusoli. CRI Kusoli is basically a mother institute for vaccine production and quality control. I have spent my life in CRI Kusoli, and today my topic is emerging and re-emerging vaccine preventable diseases. In last 50 years, many diseases they have appeared. Started, starting with rotavirus, that is a rotavirus disease that is infantile diarrhea. It, rotavirus was detected in 1973 till the last year, corona vaccine. So periodically many diseases they have uh, appeared. They have been diagnosed and what I'm trying to say is that the infectious disease due to various reasons on regular basis, they keep on appearing in the origin and causing sometime havoc, sometime small infection in a localized area. So it is a continuous process which we are facing. Among these from 1973 to till date important diseases, they are rotavirus, then hepatitis C, BSC agent, hepatitis E, HIV, coronavirus, that, that was SARS, then MERS, Ebola, hantavirus. So many such diseases, they have appeared during this period. And these diseases, they have caused, they have caused pandemic also. From say, Ento 9 plague in 165 to 180 AD till last year. Many pandemic they have appeared. In the pre-antibiotic era, it was mainly the plague. Most of the epidemic, they were because of plague. But after say, after invention of antibiotic, the human race was able to control plague because the antibiotic they are available. But during this period, viral diseases they came on horizon. And starting with Russian flu in 18, 1889 to 1890 till last year. So many viral diseases they have appeared. That is many types of flu like Russian flu, Spanish flu, Asian flu, Hong Kong flu, then SARS, Ebola, MERS, and COVID-19. So about flu, I want to say that there are many, many types of flu virus in birds. And when there is interaction among birds and human beings increases, then new strain of the, new strain of the flu virus that, that travel between bird to human being and causes maybe either pandemic or maybe epidemic depending upon the type and severity of the viruses. Corona we are facing for last one and a half years, this COVID-19 disease and it is unknown, origin is still not very sure, but possibly pangolin, pangolin to human, then human to human, this way it has spread. Then re-emergence of the diseases, many diseases, they seem to be under control, but suddenly they again reappear. Most important is the malaria, yellow fever, diphtheria, measles. So the various causes of this is like for cryptosporidiasis, which causes diarrheal disease. It is basically water supply. If there is a in contamination in water supply, then it can spread in a localized area. But for diphtheria, measles, and yellow fever, it is most of the time it is vaccination hesitancy or the stoppage of vaccine use because of this, because of this, these diseases re-emerge re again. Similarly, pertussis also. Refusal of the vaccine has been found to be a major cause of re-emergence of the pertussis. Then yellow fever is, has been reported because of vaccine hesitancy 
as well as the insecticide resistance because it is a mosquito borne disease if the mosquito of that particular area they become resistant to insecticide then mosquito population is difficult to control and then it, it the yellow fever spread to the community and causes the reemergence of the disease in our case we can give this example of japanese encephalitis in gorakhpur area although for last some time it is quite under control but it has played havoc in that area since last 4 or 5 decades so japanese encephalitis also a mosquito borne disease it is mosquito and the cycle is mosquito pig human being and mosquito you, you know they breed almost everywhere and they it is mosquito as a liking for the rice field so rice in rice field it is mosquito they breed they infect the pig pig act as a reservoir and then whenever mosquito bites a human being then the J japanese encephalitis happens to that person also so basically pig they act as a reservoir and human being is a more of a accidental host so various factor which affect the emerging and reemerging disease most important is the appearance of the new new microorganism as i i have discussed earlier that from animal kingdom or maybe birds they, these microorganisms they cross their species and infect the human being like in case of covid 19 we are suspecting the pangolin and for for influenza epidemic or influenza diseases we we know they spread from the birds family most probably the chicken family so in human beings various agents they are introduced from the animal for the bird kingdom in from time to time and when, whenever they cross the that species and human being barrier then it causes a either pandemic or a localized infection but when it it gets adapted adapted to human being then it plays havoc like in case of corona and if the route of infection is respiratory then it becomes very difficult to control the disease another factor in case of microorganism is mutation you might have heard this delta delta variant delta plus variant so in corona now everyone knows that various mutant they keep on rising from time to time and sometime our preventive or the vaccine etc they are effective against those mutant sometime they are not effective so it depends upon from case to case basis but virus viral infection they have a tendency to mutation and in influenza and in covid 19 this tendency is almost 100 to 1000 fold more than other viruses so so the mutation remains a constant threat for the emergence and reemergence of the diseases then development of the resistance to drug tuberculosis we know india is suffering from tuberculosis since ages and one of the major causes is the resistance to various antibiotic then as i have discussed in yellow fever same is true for malaria also because malaria is also a mosquito borne so this resistance to of vector to pesticide is another cause and bioterrorism is always a threat because with bioterrorism any micro microorganism which is heat which is stable in environment can be can be introduced in a new area in a form of a terrorism activity and then that organism will cause infection as well disease in that particular area and usually in bioterrorism those type of organism they are selected which causes immediate infection like anthrax because anthrax as such does not cause any or very rarely cause human infection but it is still found in some of the animal it is cause of death in some of the animal but if the 
if it's pore which are very resistant to physical physical agents physical and chemical agent that is that is spread into one area then it can cause a very serious infection in that localized area so bioterrorism remains a threat to all of us another is a factor that affect the emerging or re emerging disease is behavior of the host so human demographic change that is increase contact with animal and natural environment like rapid urbanization is the one of the cause because with rap rapid urbanization there is more interaction with the animal birds etc to the human beings and their infection infection of the, that animal species travel to the human being then human behavior is also important like drug abuse sexually transmitted disease drug using sharing needle etc that, that is another cause of it. persistence of the infection or reemergence of the infection then immunosuppression we have seen in case of hiv that if the patient is suffering from hiv then tuberculosis becomes very important in those patient similarly in corona also if person is immunocompromised then the lethality is likely to be more this resistance to nutritional factor we know if if the health of the person is not good then he is more susceptible to the infection poverty everyone knows is the cause of cause of the biggest problem for human race and in poverty malnutrition occurs this the socio economic environment of the poor poor people is also very bad so poor people they are always more susceptible, susceptible to the infection then environmental factors are the climate change and changing ecosystem and antarctica antarctica exploration some of the viruses which which are not known to human not known to cause infection they have been detected there so since ages they are lying in a cold environment because microorganism we usually store in a very cold environment and antarctica environment is perfect for storing of the microorganism so this because of climate change the organism which are lying do dormant in those area they will come into the civilized area and can cause infection another is this urbanization and deforestation i think i have discussed this area then technology and industry so food now we are getting processed food and processed food since it is not a not a fresh food and if the quality control checks at various points in food processing are not there then the processed food can can be the source of infection and in, infection of the non organism as well as new organism also similarly e coli has been incriminated in the contamination of the food and it has caused many food borne infection so this is the pictorial picture in which it is difficult to say that whether human they are destroying the environment or environment is causing infection in the human same way there are many vector borne disease so environment is also also affecting the various vector which transmit the infection to human beings like yellow fever je and and malaria then zoonotic disease like covid 19 disease rabies japanese encephalitis they are the constant problem area for the scientist because all animal like human beings they have their set of viruses or bacteria if those one species from there are so many species of the animal like influenza influenza virus it spread from the birds so there are if you say like 17 17 h antigen and 9 n antigen so so many combination they are theoretically feasible which can cross the bird bird 
species to human beings and cause infection so there are what i am trying to say is there is a the, there are lots of micro my, microorganism which are there in various animal species or birds when we come into contact with them then those microorganism they tend to adapt to the adapt adapt for infection into the human beings and they can cause mild infection serious infection depending upon the pathogenesis of that particular bacteria or viruses so animal vector as well as environment so whenever the interaction between these three that that increases chances of reemergence of new infection is always there but how to control this emerging and reemerging infection first is first and the foremost is surveillance surveillance is i will give you the example of covid 19 disease when we started maybe i think in february or january last year in 2020 we had only one lab in iv pune now we have more than 100 lab for surveillance of the covid 19 so what i am trying to say is that india has developed a very robust and very vast surveillance facility for corona 9 corona 19 disease and within a very short span of time so so many labs in private as well as government sector they are doing surveillance for the corona and if we are able to identify the my, microorganism then we can go for this applied research what i mean by applied research is we can pre prepare diagnostic reagent we can prepare diagnostic technology like elisa testing etc pcr testing we can identify the genome of the my, my microorganism if we are able to identify genome then we can trace the source of the infection also then we can go for the preparation of the therapeutic antibody preparation of prophylactic vaccine like what we have done in corona so applied research on regular basis is very important because in in corona covid 19 pandemic we have to do everything as a as a new case but if we have a regular system of surveillance then before that organism causing a causes a pandemic before that we can identify that because of our robust surveillance system and if we are able to identify then we can go for the manufacture of the diagnostic as well as the therapeutic agent so for this we need to develop infrastructure as it is as it is there there today for covid 19 so we have to have a regular system of surveillance of various microorganism in length as well as as well as the breadth of the country so that the many organism which could be there in a geographic specific area so if that geographic geographic specific area is properly surveillance is there then we can identify those, those organism and we can proceed further for diagnosis as well as treatment of that organism then for prevention and control like in covid 19 we have seen we tried many antiviral drug some now only few they are useful but we tried many things but if we are able to identify the microorganism and grow it in a laboratory then on a continuous basis we can test very anti various antiviral drug either on cell culture or in animal study so if if there is a this is a continuous process then in future we can come out with some very antiviral drugs because there are lot of lots of antibiotic antibiotic are there for bacteria but anti antiviral drugs they are very few and only few of them are they are effective and like we have seen in covid 19 very few are effective so but if we have a regular process for this then we are we could be it it is possible that we are able to develop some new antiviral drug then prophylactic intervention 
like in corona rapidly we were able to make vaccine so this this type of uh, this type of intervention is uh, always welcomed and is highly useful also now come to the main topic that is immunobiological for the infectious disease now because of covid 19 this plasma therapy has become very very popular plasma is the patient who has recovered from that particular disease the their plasma is taken and used used in a new patient but similar to other technology of similar similarly based other technology are also there like monoclonal antibody which we can prepare in in the lab another is equine based we can immunize a horse and from horse blood we can raise the immunoglobulin and that can be immediately used what i mean by passive immunization is we we raise the antibody in some other host maybe human being maybe in laboratory maybe in horses but for active immunization we give the vaccine to the recipient and recipient on its own makes antibody against that particular antigen so passive passive immunization is rapidly effective if it is effective and immediately it reduces the virus load or the it tends to control the infection on emergency basis and vaccine we always say it is for future insurance that means vaccine they ensure our safety for any future infection this is two three pictorial demonstration of the how we have come to this stage so this early chinese inoculation started in 1000 ad but that was more of a more of a knowledge only but it was not used on commercial basis so intranasal inoculation with powder from a pulverized smallpox scab so scab they were introduced in inside the nasal cavity so this way it was a very rudimentary procedure some recipient used to survive other used to get very severe infection because there this was not a calibrated approach another breakthrough came in 1796 by edward jenner what he observed was milk maid they are not getting any smallpox infection because milk maid they are exposed to cowpox virus and that cowpox virus was protecting the milk maid from the smallpox infection and he treated he immunized a one james james phipps for this from the metal from a cowpox sore and this way he was able to immunize but this was also not on a commercial scale the in properly laboratory laboratory stage vaccine production was done by louis pasteur against pasteurella infection and it started in, in 1879 this is a pictorial presentation of the how the cowpox and smallpox virus they are antigenically similar but one causing a very serious disease in human beings other causes very mild infection or asymptomatic infection so but their antigen they are similar one can be used against the protection against the other so cowpox was used for protection of the smallpox and because of this cowpox virus we were able to eradicate smallpox from the face of the earth now type of in fact types of vaccine are since this 18 1879 vaccine made by louis pasteur we have come a long way and now we have different technology for vaccine production basically basically vaccine they always act specifically and they are either a component or a attenuated live attenuated form or a killed form of the microorganism is there and they they induce antibody or cmi cell mediated immunity in the recipient so type of vaccine they are one most common is 
simple one inactivated vaccine you grow the mic my microorganism in laboratory kill it mostly by chemical method because if we heat kill them then antigen they are also destroyed so to preserve the antigen the microorganism they are killed by chemical mainly formalin formalin chemical then live attenuated most important exam example is oral polio vaccine there are man, many other vaccine also like mm mmr groups mmr group of vaccine rotavirus they are all all live attenuated live attenuated initially this procedure was very helpful very successful in this what happens is the pathogenicity of the microorganism is is removed but the growth potential of the my, my, microorganism is maintained and sometimes what happens is when we grow the virulent organism then this virulence factor they are more of a luxury for the organism so if if we keep on increasing the adverse condition for the growth of the virus or bacteria then then my, microorganism it tends to set off virulence factor gene of the virulence factor and if that setting is permanent then that organism becomes live attenuated but it is a very long procedure like for bcg it, it has taken a, almost 10 years in laboratory to attenuate a virulent to attenuate the bcg vaccine another is toxicide toxicide is basically they are used for those those diseases which are caused by toxin like tetanus and diphtheria because if we we are protecting against the organism then in that vaccine is not effective but if we are protecting against the toxin that vaccine is very useful so what happens is we we grow the this diphtheria and tetanus separate the toxin chemically make chemically make them toxicid toxicid is just like live attenuated in definition they are similar like they have the antigenicity but they don't do not have any virulence so toxin is highly toxic causes death and damage to various tissues but toxicid they maintains the antigenic characteristic of the toxin but chem chemical that formalin removes the virulence factor of the toxin so we call them toxicid another is subunit vaccine like some of the organism like hemophilus meningococcal vi pol this typhoid vaccine they it has come to the notice that their organism their main protective antigen is only polysaccharide outer covering of the poly, capsular polysaccharide so then why to give the whole organism to the recipient because if we give whole organism then it then it will not be very safe to give because all bacteria they have the this endotoxin etc some toxicity is always there in all the bacteria even in killed bacteria so we we are able to remove the polysaccharide capsule and use that capsule as a as a antigen so all capsular all polysaccharide vaccine they are in this category and the example is typhoid vaccine meningococcal vaccine hemophilus hemophilus influenzae bacteria then another is <coughs> another is conjugated vaccine the why conjugated vaccine they came into the picture was because the immune system of a child child of less than 2 years of age it does not recognize the foreign antigen and immune response is very very less which is not protective so it was realized that if the polysaccharide is combined with some protein then against protein child Im immune system become effective just just after its birth so between 0 to 2 years of age pure polysaccharide antigen is not not very effective 
so we have to conjugate that that polysaccharide to the protein antigen and this way conjug conjugated vaccine they came into the picture then hepatitis b vaccine this recombinant vaccine is basically only targeted antigen gene is taken expressed in some, some system like saccharomyces services or maybe some bacteria and then the that antigen is purified taken taken from the that medium product of the that product of that gene is taken from that growth system and purified and used as a vaccine then auto vaccine is some infection they are common in some individual if bacteria from that individual they are that is taken bacteria or virus and then that is used as a vaccine that is called as a auto vaccine nowadays it is not very popular because most of the bacteria antibiotic are already available then latest addition is nucleic acid vaccine dna and rna vaccine rna vaccine in covid 19 they are already licensed so this is pictorial demonstration of the whole inactivated virus live attenuated virus like particle what i mean by virus like particle is genome of the virus is removed only the outer covering of the virus is used as antigen then recombinant bacterial vector some bacterial vector they are modified by the targeted gene and used as a vaccine then dna vaccine is that stable dna is modified by introduction of a targeted gene and that dna directly used directly inoculated and that integrate with the with our cell and keep on producing antibody then recombinant viral vector the like in corona covid 19 disease the covid antigen covid gene of spike protein has been taken and introduced into adenovirus like covicld is in that category and that adeno modified adenovirus is used as a antigen then similarly some component of the protein can also be produced by this recombinant technology then synthetic peptide they are always always produced in laboratory and this genomic system is not used for production of synthetic peptide they are artificially synthesized in a laboratory now so many vaccine since 1900 has come and the latest one is covid in 2020 so main concentration of the vaccine is whenever a organism is identified we try to make vaccine earlier the traditional methodology of vaccine production was very effective you grow the vaccine grow the bacteria or virus kill it by chemical method and you used as a vaccine or convert into a live attenuated form in laboratory like polio vaccine then when some technology developed we were able to purify the bacterial product like in 50s we were able to separate tox toxin toxide from the bacteria and use toxide as antigen then polysaccharide cap capsular polysaccharide we were able to separate in say late 80s and first this meningo pneumo hiv etc they, they were introduced when recombinant technology came into existence in nine in early 1980s at that time we were able to make hepatitis b by recombinant technology now after that we realized that polysaccharide vaccine they are not very effective because they are to be given in very young children so conjugation procedure also developed now various vaccine like td vaccine td is only complete tetanus and very small portion of diphtheria corona vaccine i will be discussing in some detail this is this slide shows the, how we proceed for the vaccine development for a new product first we have to do exploratory study because the most important is identification of the candidate vaccine so that candidate vaccine may be a complete virus complete bacteria part of the virus part of some gene of the virus also 
so depending upon that we explore what is going to be effective and in pharmaceutical industry we, there is a saying that if you identify 100 molecule then only one comes into the market so similarly in vaccine also we could keep on trying keep on exploring which antigen is going to be effective if we are sure that uh, this vaccine this candidate vaccine is going to be effective then we proceed for pre clinical studies that means we, its growth characteristic its identification everything is developed in the lab and it is tested in animal as well as in lab so depending upon in on the basis of in vitro and in vivo test the the candidate antigen is characterized then we further proceed for clinical development then regulatory licensing then regular manufacturing and quality control this is the traditional form of licensing of the preparation of the new vaccine so as i have discussed identifying a candidate vaccine is very difficult and time consuming but if that is there then we can proceed further for pre clinical then clinical trial in three phases phase 1 phase 2 phase 3 then licensure and then large scale ma manufacturing but in case of emergency which we in case of outbreak or pandemic situation this clinical trial and manufacturing can go side by side because in case of pa pandemic there is regular interaction between between regulator manufacturer and government so so on day to day basis or weekly basis manufacturer keep on submitting the their production safety efficacy data to the regulator and if regulator is satisfied then he can give license and you can allow large scale manufacturing even before phase 3 clinical trial if if the regulator is satisfied because even before phase 3 trial there are many many documents which a manufacturer has to submit to the regulator like laboratory data pre clinical data data of phase 1 trial data of phase 2 trial so and it depends upon the cost benefit ratio because in pandemic the acceptance criteria efficacy criteria or safety criteria is slightly different than the in traditional form of licensing this is basically vaccine manufacturing we grow the bacteria or virus depending upon whether it is bacteria virus or which type of virus is. then we harvest them because the media component we have to discard so we purify and take out only required antigen then we purify it inactivate it if it is not live attenuated then and then we keep on producing like this whenever sufficient num number of pro production harvest are there then we accumulate them then do the formulation formulation is basically just before filling so in formulation we you, we add antigen preservative stabilizer normal saline etc and if vaccine is adjuvanted then adjuvant also then we do the filling and whether freeze drying whether it is a liquid vaccine or it is a freeze dried one depending upon that we go for freeze drying then packaging and batch release so these are various steps of the vaccine production in vaccine production what is important is seed load system is very important like whatever organism we isolate from a patient is a strain so all strain they are not equally good some they are highly immunogenic or able to produce protective antibody some they are not so it it all depends upon the expression of the antigen by the my, my microorganism and if some organism if the some strain they are approved by regulator then only those strain can be used for vaccine production so in from market we cannot pick up a strain and make a vaccine because this pre clinical pre clinical development also regulatory intervention is very important and regulator usually permit only those strain which are, are already established in for that disease but in case of pandemic since no no one strain is established various strain they are permitted 
for vaccine production in case of emergency but in routine only the the characterization of the seed is very difficult and very uh, lo long drawn process and it has to be tested pre clinically and clinically which is a which is a time consuming as well as cost cost involvement is also there in, in in that process so only the recognized strain of various vaccine they are used so we usually have one mother culture then master seed and then working seed so our master, mother culture is basically where we have established that this seed is, this strain is going to be used as a vaccine production and from mother culture we prepare a master seed then working seed working seed is directly used for vaccine production and mother seed master seed and working seed they should in characterizations they should be similar because we expect immune response from those strain this way they are characterized for various tests like history identity purity safety etc the cell substrate as well as seed strain these are various substrate for the vaccine production bacterial bacteria they can grow in inanimate synthetic media but viruses they grow either in live cell laboratory cell animal or fertilized egg otherwise virus they do not grow so nowadays earlier the animal were frequently used initially now mainly the cell line they are used and this two vaccine they are still being prepared in in this fertilized egg one is in influenza vaccine and another is yellow fever vaccine so if we prepare this vaccine in cell line then there is some antigenic variation occurs during growth so the cell line there is not very much preferred for influenza as well as, well as yellow fever only fertilized egg they are used so we have to procure fertilized egg from outside inoculate them virus grows in in that egg then from that egg harvesting is done which i have just described and the virus is purified depending upon whether we are making a killed vaccine or live attenuated further processing is undertaken these are the challenges in vaccine development most important is antigenic variability which i have discussed for this covid 19 like this delta delta plus etc then effective immune response is very difficult to judge because in case of we can take the example of covid 19 vaccine they are not able to prevent infection but they are able to prevent this hospitalization and serious illness so that means we we are accepting a flaw of the vaccine it is not completely completely effective but it is very useful for prevention of death or hospitalization so it is being licensed but it is not an ideal situation then some population all population do, they do not do, do not mount a similar immune response to all the vaccine so there is some variation is there sometimes there is uncertainty about correlates of protection so what are the factor which protect because of vaccination what are the factor develop in a recipient which protect against the infection so this correlates of protection is not always very clear so even in established vaccine we do not know how they are what is the mechanism how they are protecting us but we know that if we give this vaccine they are protective but various factor is very difficult to emulate then unknown immunogen they keep on appearing and we, we will have to be on guard for development of the vaccine so th there are very various challenges but as is evident from the covid 19 vaccine they can be developed very rapidly also in case of emergency although depending upon the requirement it is feasible that within six months to eight months this corona vaccine they have come into the market so vaccine development is this is another slide which shows that it is not an isolated process many stream they collaborate with each other 
then only the vaccine they are produced that is epidemiology clinical trial human immunology animal model etc then surveillance this vaccine discovery many many department they are involved and it is not a isolated isolated process so need of the vaccine i don't think i need to specify because with emergence of the corona everyone knows the importance of the vaccine now most important most effective strategy for any disease prevention is vaccine if it is very effective but still vaccine is one of the most most important component of infection control so in corona is the only disease where we have utilized all the platform available for vaccine production that is the inactivated vaccine in this you can keep the bharat biotech co vaccine here live attenuated is still not licensed in any of the country then viral vector based is the covishield covishield vaccine rna vaccine we have heard this moderna pfizer there are mrna messenger rna vaccine dna and recombinant protein recombinant protein i think cadila is making this vaccine only the spike protein they are by recombinant method they are expressed in some other host then antigen is taken taken out and used as a vaccine dna vaccine they are not licensed they are still in clinical development so whatever platform is known technology known for vaccine production has been utilized in corona vaccine now this is the latest from the who website there are 108 vaccine which are in various form of clinical development and 184 more vaccine they are in pre clinical development that means in laboratory as well as in animal species so in india also we have two three pl platform like this viral vector covishield kill vaccine covaxin then spike protein this protein component vaccine is cadila vaccine so they are there and all they are effective now and all they are effective against the serious disease infection thank you so thank you uh, dr tahan uh, we had a, a very exhaustive uh, lecture on uh, uh, an address on uh, on the vaccine on uh, vaccines and uh, vaccine studies and uh, also uh, how vaccines are being made uh, we looked at factors uh, which are affecting emerging and reemerging diseases evolutions of uh, and, uh, pathogens and infectious agents and also uh, uh, how uh, environment uh, and uh, other um, factors are affecting um uh, uh you know uh, the emergence and reemergence of uh, viruses uh, and also certain other uh, bacterial uh, diseases so uh, you talked about human environmental interface of uh, uh, and also how human and animal interaction with the environment is leading to a lot of exposure and adaptation of uh, pathogens which are present in the environment and in the animals into human beings uh, you also mentioned uh, strategies to combat infective uh, diseases you talked about surveillance applied research which included diagnostics microbial pathogenesis advances in molecular bi uh, biology and uh, drug uh, development the new approaches to vaccines um and you also uh, talked about how india has ramped up um, uh, laboratory infrastructure as also uh, vaccine uh, infrastructure uh, producing its own vaccines and also producing vaccine for the world you talked about immunological biological for infectious diseases the role of plasma monoclonal antibody very exhaustive in fact so active immunization you talked about and um, uh, starting from the history to the present circumstances and uh, you also mentioned uh, how vaccines are developed in fact you talked about exploratory phase the preclinical preclinical the clinical development 
and uh, regulatory review and approvals, manufacturing, quality control. You also touched upon how uh, you know people were looking at uh, what is emergency use um, utilization, and you talked about it. Um, you also talked about it as as in emergency cases or in outbreaks or in pandemics. Uh, one has to go, uh, certain things have to go side by side simultaneously. So you talked about uh, the traditional paradigm as well as the emergency use. And you talked about seed lot system, uh, challenges in vaccine development. You talked about the corona vaccines and you touched about all the platforms which are being used uh, for corona vaccine. I think very exhaustive lecture. Uh, thanks a lot for your uh, efforts and uh, your uh, you know, points that you made. Um, I, I think it's a very good lecture for the postgraduate students as well as for undergraduate students and students like me who are trying to understand how the vaccines are actually affecting uh, our lives and how emerging, re-emerging uh, pathogens can be tackled through vaccines. Thanks a lot, sir. I leave it to Dr. Uh, uh, Saeed Mohamed Ahmad uh, to introduce the next keynote. Not uh, it's my honor and privilege to introduce the next speaker, uh, though he needs no introduction. He's quite famous in his indigenous way of uh, teaching and training in the workshops and that we've already witnessed in the previous uh, uh, last two days back. Uh, but it's really customary to introduce him because people are from the audience might not exactly be aware of him. So uh, he's an additional professor and uh, in, in uh, uh, Jipmar. And he is an uh, infection control officer as well and antimicrobial stewardship lead. Uh, he has quite a number of books in his uh, credit, especially the number of books uh, uh, like uh, Essential of Hospital Infection Control, Essentials of uh, Medical Microbiology and Essentials of Medical Parasitology. Uh, he's also uh, uh, been uh, con contributing to the CDC and NC NCDC. Uh, uh, he has a number of publications in his account and uh, in both international and national. Uh, as I said, he is very well known for his uh, indigenous way of uh, teaching and training in the workshop. Uh, uh, before uh, taking much time, probably I'll just uh, uh, in welcome him for the next talk. Yeah. Uh, hello, sir. Uh, am I audible? Yeah, you're audible. You're audible. Yeah, so I thank the organizer, uh, especially Fatima, to invite me uh, for uh, uh, this wonderful uh, conference. So uh, the session what uh, we will have now is uh, resolving the unresolved challenges in infection control practices. So uh, a uh, uh, just before me, uh, Todi sir has nicely addressed uh, many of the areas which are actually the challenges, especially the manpower and uh, and the and the administrative challenges. What uh, 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 what plays a great role in uh, implementing a uh, IPC that uh, he has already covered. So I will be covering specific areas when you do audits uh, uh, when my infection control nurses do audit in uh, various places they find specific challenges so i would like to go those intricacies so that it will be uh, it will be very very useful for the infection control officers as well as in infection control nurses when they do ipc practices uh, when they uh, do the monitoring of ipc uh, practices so these are the areas which uh, i will be covering I will be basically uh, covering the gray areas in hand hygiene audit, uh, PPE audit, HAI surveillance, and care bundle audit. I have kept a few other uh, gray areas, but uh, because now we are running uh, short of time, so I will be uh, focusing on these areas. Okay. So the first is what are the challenges we get when we uh, do hand hygiene audit? Uh, so hand hygiene audit, uh, like uh, we all think that it is uh, one of the simplest uh, audit of uh, infection prevention and control because hand hygiene is very, very easy. Five steps uh, are documented by WHO and I mean uh, five, uh, uh, five indications uh, are documented by uh, WHO and those five indications uh, whenever it comes, you have to follow this. 
seven steps. So it is very uh, looks like it is very easy to uh, do the monitoring of hand hygiene. However, uh, when you uh, uh, when you go to the ICUs and the critical areas and start auditing by yourself, you will realize that it is not that easy. Uh, what it's uh, what it seems to be. Most of the interest officers they uh, uh, they manage the uh, hand hygiene audit through their ICNs. But if they go once to the ICUs and do audit by themselves, then then they will realize uh, what are the intricacies of doing hand hygiene audit. So uh, here I would like to mention that we are doing a hand hygiene uh, audit in COVID ICU, a multicentric uh, study uh, involving hundred plus uh, participants, uh, which is a which is a uh, WHO India is a technical uh, partner for this study. So in this particular study, we are doing app. App-based uh, data collection uh, of hand hygiene audit in various uh, COVID care uh, locations. So, uh, not only in my own uh, hospital experience, I will I, I will be telling you the feedback of various hospitals across the country. Uh, what are the bias? Uh, what are the gray areas? Uh, what they uh, what they come across uh, when they do hand hygiene audit? So, these are the uh, various gray areas of hand hand hygiene audit. Uh, the most the most important gray areas is bias bias is uh, it plays a very very important role uh, the first bias is inter auditor bias inter auditor uh, bias means uh, the uh, uh, because of inadequate training what happens is the hand has an audit if my two icns will do uh, in in the same uh, location for the same fixed uh, duration then both will get Two different hand hygiene audit rates. Uh, that is because uh, it it happens because when the training is inadequate. So when when you give a prior adequate training to the infectious control or nurses through the structured um, uh, uh, training session, you should you should give them exercises, hand hygiene audit exercises. Of course, uh, the uh, uh, the WHO hand hygiene audit tool exercises are are already available in in the website you can create your own case scenarios and give them prior training uh, uh, to conduct the audits so, so that you can utilize the bias by uh, standardizing the uh, level of training among the icns observational bias is another challenge what we all face like the healthcare workers will start practicing doing hand hygiene once they see that you are uh, you are monitoring them so it is also called as Hawthorne effect. We all know. So this can be managed by conducting hand hygiene audits simultaneously along with other routine work. So the interest control nurses who are uh, present in this uh, forum, I would like to say that you should do hand hygiene audit along with the other routine work, like uh, like say for, uh, for example HIA surveillance. HIA surveillance is a work uh, where you spend a lot of time in the ICU. So if you mix your hand hygiene audit along with your other interest control work, then the health, uh, then the staff working there may not uh, realize that you are actually conducting the audit. One way of uh, 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 one way of uh, nullifying the Hawthorne effect. Next uh, bias is confirmation bias. Like you will have a prefixed idea that one particular uh, uh, healthcare worker is. Uh, not doing hand hygiene audit or well doing hand hygiene audit. So, so such prefix ideas will uh, will make you undergo a bias and uh, by which you will not score properly for that uh, particular healthcare worker. So, this can be uh, nullified by the rotational posting of uh, the infest, uh, infection control uh, nurses among the locations, so that uh, you will not keep doing auditing in the same place so that you will not be exposed to uh, to confirmation bias confounding bias of work pressure influencing hand hygiene uh, compliance this also has been uh, noticed a, in our study and uh, that is why we have uh, uh, made a, um, a protocol of doing the uh, hand hygiene audit in random schedule in in various shifts so that it it will not be a bias no more so double counting opportunities another uh, bias in uh, healthcare i mean in in hand hygiene audit like uh, for example the double counting opportunity means the uh, when there is overlapping between after and before movement uh, like for example the overlapping uh, between after environment and before touching i will give you one simple uh, example you are checking the pulse of uh, the nurse, the ICN will check the pulse of 
patient A. After that, he goes and checks the uh, pulse of patient B. Can you tell me how many times the healthcare worker is supposed to do hand hygiene? Here, uh, uh, checking the pulse of uh, uh, patient A. So here, uh, once he has to do audit, uh, hand hygiene uh, before touching the patient. Second time, he uh, she has to do hand hygiene after touching the patient. Uh, similarly, when she goes to the uh, uh, patient B, again, before and after uh, uh, checking for the pulse. However, after checking the pulse of uh, patient A, and before checking the pulse of patient B, this is called as an overlapping movement or double counting opportunity. The reason is the nurse has directly gone from patient A to uh, uh, patient B. So there is no need to do uh, uh, there is no need to do two times hand hygiene in this uh, situation. Once doing hand hygiene is more than enough. So that hand hygiene when you are doing, you have to enter under after movement rather than the before movement yeah, because of the simple equation given by WHO uh, uh, guideline that after movement should be given more weight is than before movement. Another example is overlapping uh, between after touching and uh, before touching. So uh, after touching and uh, before touching just now I have given you example after environment and before touching. After environment uh, before touching means you write the pulse on the case it like you write the pulse or you uh, record the pulse on the case seat of first patient then you go to the uh, second patient for uh, checking the pulse here the overlapping is uh, between the after environment of first patient and before touching the second patient so again, this kind of overlapping is also a double counting opportunity where what you're supposed to do is you have to enter only once uh, because the healthcare worker is supposed to do hand hygiene once and that hand hygiene when he's doing or he's not doing, you have to enter under after touching uh, the patient uh, rather than before touching the uh, patient B. So you have to enter under after environment. So in this case, it is, uh, it is a overlapping between environment and touching. So you have to enter under environment. So after environment has to be given uh, priority uh, rather than before touching. So that's what you do uh, record once and under after uh, movement. Other overlapping movement examples include like for example, there, there may be a confusing situation that you will be entering under body fluid exposure or you will be entering under uh, touching the environment. So uh, this is again a, a confusing uh, situation, especially when you are handling Euro back. When we handle uh, uh, Euro back, like uh, before and after uh, collecting the urine sample, before and after emptying the bladder and after catheter uh, uh, removal, please remember whenever so you will be confused that it is an environment or it is a body fluid exposure. Again, the uh, guideline which says that our WHO uh, protocols are clear and transparent that body fluid exposure has to be given more priority than touching the environment. So all these kind of uh, situations when you are recording hand hygiene opportunity, you have to uh, record under body fluid exposure. So two and three are before uh, uh, body fluid exposure and after a uh, body fluid exposure. So this uh, this uh, opportunities you have to uh, uh, record like this same for the central and also before and after insertion and uh, removal of the catheter before and after accessing the central line and before preparing medication for the central line infusion. So all this also you have to uh, uh, you have to enter under the body fluid exposure uh, movement rather than environment movement. Environment uh, movement is uh, movement number five. Okay. Next is touching the patient and touching the environment. If you have a overlapping uh, situation where you are touching the patient as well as environment both together, like a very simple example is the patient is put on oxygen mask and you are removing or you are uh, putting the oxygen mask. So here the uh, guideline which clearly says that if the environment is attached to the patient, 
if the environment is a part of the patient you are uh, you are removing the dress of the patient you are uh, changing the bed of the patient so if if the environment is a part of the patient or or is attached to the patient like for example you are uh, you are giving the nebulization and all that in all this uh, situation you have to consider that as if you are touching the patient so you have to record under touching the patient uh, rather than uh, touching the environment so this is again a point to be uh, uh, noted down another gray area is glow views and hand hygiene uh, uh, most of the infectious disease nurses will not be able to know how they have to uh, record glow views is acceptable or unacceptable as far as covid is is concerned uh, this is the cdc link you can go you can see that in crisis uh, situation uh, cdc has uh, recommended to use hand hygiene over glowed hand they say that six time maximum uh, can be used over the glowed hand however glow should be uh, discarded if you have any visible soiling or contamination uh, with the specimen if the glow gets contaminated with the specimen or if you have a soiling or any sign of damage or four hours uh, this is again a point to be noted so four hour or more than equal to 6 uh, moment uh, this is a cut up where the globe need to be changed so more than 6 time you have to change the globe more than 4 hour of continuous use again you need to change the globe and uh, suppose if you have doffed the globe then the rule is you should not read down the doffed globe so this is a, a rule what you need to uh, uh, remember and after removing the globe again a mandated uh, requirement is hand hygiene now you'll be asking that is it a cdc recommendation or it's a who recommendation also uh, who doesn't have a specific uh, recommendation uh, uh, like this of course if you see the doffing uh, uh, protocol of uh, who then you can see that uh, in the doffing protocol there are various places where uh, who has also mentioned that hand hygiene over glowed hand is acceptable in as at least in in, in the situation where crisis like you have a shortage of globe then it is acceptable otherwise the rule is once the crisis period is over you have to you have to resume back to the old guideline the old old guideline says is hand hygiene should not be performed over the globe and you have to remove the globe and you have to uh, perform the hand hygiene certifying hand hygiene auditor is very very important you have to make sure that hand hygiene auditors need to be trained adequately they should do the hand hygiene exercise in front of you they should score the same hand hygiene uh, compliance what is actually scored uh, 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 by the protocol and then they should study the various bias and various uh, gray areas and they should know how to deal with the gray areas after that you can give the uh, uh, you you can certify them and they can be eligible for doing hand as in audit without prior training it is you you should not make anyone and everyone to start doing hand as in audit next area is pp audit so uh, what are the various gray areas in pp like you all know that our who has given a clear cut guideline that these are the four mandatory uh, essential pp which we need to wear uh, in the covid uh, pandemic so inside the red zone red zone means what a red zone is the patient care area patient care area is called as the red zone where you need two pp for contact precaution and you need two pp for droplet precaution so these are the two pp which need to be required for droplet precaution droplet precaution for your eye as well as your nose your eyes will get droplet precaution by eye protection and nose will get droplet protection by wearing a three ply mask except when you have a aerosol uh, risk in place of three ply mask you need to wear an n95 so this is a very clear cut uh, guideline other than that other areas yellow and green zone areas you can wear only three ply mask however uh, there are various uh, additional non essential pp which are recommended uh, like in various hospitals i can tell you that these are non essential these are called as superstitious pp we uh, we call them here as superstitious uh, pp because they will give you false belief that you are over protected okay now as i told you the most common com non compliance in pp is eye protection most of the healthcare worker they they think that 
uh, wearing a mask is more than enough they give more importance to gloves and gown uh, rather than eye i would rather say that among the four pp the most important pp of course is mask then the next important pp is eye protection then comes the contact precaution the reason is the covid receptors the covid virus uh, uh, receptor can can anyone say how how, how we contract covid we contract uh, covid by exposing the covid virus into the into the receptors and our receptors are present only in these three places okay as far as transmission is concerned covid receptors are present only in eyes nose and mouth therefore droplet precaution is very important and uh, goggles are or eye protection is an essentially essential component of uh, red zone area okay so now the question is many of us will be thinking is it required to do a pp audit and is it feasible to do pp audit the answer is yes yes and and yes we have started doing a pp audit for uh, for more than uh, uh, six months and we have realized that pp audit is not difficult at all uh, this is the donning audit uh, form what we use in jipma and this is the doffing audit form what we do uh, what we use in jipma we do pp audit in jipma in a uh, in icus in in covid care icu so uh, so this is our doffing audit area uh this is the doffing audit area and uh, this is the health uh, infection control team uh who is who is uh, doing the doffing audit and uh, don't get scared if you are infection control nurse then don't get scared to do doffing audit what you only require is you require a 3 feet distance and you require to wear eye protection and and a three ply mask that's all is required don't get scared don't think that uh, going to the doffing area is like a, a is like a graveyard no you you should you should be brave enough because my icns are doing audit for uh, for months together and we have not seen any icn uh, becoming covid positive okay so this is our covid area, uh, doffing area and we have realized that by doing doffing audit and donning especially our doffing audit the 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 uh, the on site correction we usually give them on site corrections the on site correction are like it is working uh, 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 like wonders for the healthcare workers because they will be under so much of stress after 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 working for 8 to 10 uh, hour of covid duty they are so exhausted that doing the doffing step by step is very difficult for them so if somebody is there who gives them instruction and uh, supervision so doffing under supervision is like of course it is not a mandated requirement of covid guideline but if it is there then it will really make it, uh, make a difference okay so these are the uh, donning of pp uh, principles uh, these are the sequence at which you do the donning of pp uh, uh, nothing new it is it is same uh, what is given in who guideline so i will tell you what are the common breaches uh, uh, we observe the common breach what we uh, what we observe is you can see here the recommendation is to wear hood after the goggles okay so if you if you are wearing a coverall uh, then uh, then the coverall will have a hood also that hood has to be placed only after the goggles and mask to be worn how and also the second uh, guideline is the goggles should always be worn after the mask otherwise a gap will be created in the mask so these are the two things what they have to do and they usually do not do that so i will show you what are the common uh, uh, sequences uh, the sequence related breach what uh, what we usually encountered in our uh, uh, covid healthcare workers so if they wear hood first and after that if they wear goggle then uh, then you will have a situation uh, like this and so what happens here if if the situation is there like this then what happens is when they remove the goggles see donning is fine eight hour of work also is fine after 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 working for eight hours when they go for doffing you can see that they are they are forced to remove the goggles first because goggle is placed after the hood but actually in the doffing the uh, the rule is first the coverall has, uh, has to be removed of eye protection has to be removed later so if you are goggles is outside the hood then you are forced to remove the goggles first which is a wrong uh, 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 thing in your 
in your doffing time a uh, second error is goggles wearing over the mask goggles wearing over the mask if you do like this a gap will be created in the mask area through which air can easily insert okay another common 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 error is three ply mask uh, inside and outside n95 mask here i will tell you guys that there is no requirement of a of a double masking double masking is is only for your mental satisfaction and in and if you are doing double masking then please never wear n95 outside because it's of no use you cannot do a um, fit check if you if you wear n95 outside and you can see that if n95 is outside so much of gap is there the next picture it is very very clear the the gap is so much that the air will go inside and the virus also will go inside so please uh, uh, do not allow them to do this and then if you are wearing two pair of gloves again two pair of glove is uh, not required it is again a superstitious uh, uh, requirement if you are wearing this then make sure that you you should have gown in between the your your gown sleeve should be in between the inner glove and the outer glove okay i repeat your inner and outer globe in between you should have the gown sleeve so that the removal will be appropriate if you have a situation like this uh, that is inner and outer globe are done one after the other then you will have lot of problem while you doff them because uh, uh, once you go to uh, uh, once you go to doff the outer globe along with that the inner globe will be accidentally it will come out okay so this also is wrong sequence uh, uh, next is criss crossing the uh, the strap they say that you you should you should always wear upper strap up lower strap uh, down criss crossing of strap is usually not recommended by cdc and not doing fit check is again a very very common breach what we get we all know that we have to do fit check appropriately fit check involves three step first step uh, fit check is uh, required for n95 mask and n95 respiratory it, it it involves three step first step is sealing after you wear you should seal your mask properly you should put your nose breeze apply your nose breeze properly seal it then you give a positive pressure and you give a negative pressure when you do a, uh, when you give a positive pressure inhale uh, uh, when you give a positive uh, pressure you have to gently exhale so that you you have to make sure that the air leakages are not there at the same time you give a uh, negative pressure by gently inhaling so fit checking is a mandated requirement every time you don a n95 uh, respirator of course then comes the uh, uh, doffing doffing steps are easy to remember that the contact precaution pp has to be worn first the contact uh, precaution pp to be doffed first followed by the droplet pp the uh, uh, the contact pp are uh, nothing but gloves and gown droplet pp are nothing but goggles and mask so first is goggles the last is mask so this is the uh, sequence what you do, uh, what you need to remove uh, what you need to remember and mask need to be uh, removed only outside the doffing area not inside the doffing area now uh, now what happens is you when we do audit uh, pp audit we we encountered lot of breaches plan uh, the common breaches i will tell you here the common the uh, the first pp to be removed is gloves uh, uh, remember gloves are the last pp to be done they are the last pp to be done and of course they are the first pp to be removed so when you remove the glove the common uh, mistake what we do is the second glove we remove by touching the outer surface of the first glove this is a wrong step what we what we have to do is we have to put the finger inside the uh, second globe and then we have to put the inside the sleeve of the second globe and then we have to uh, 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 then we need to uh, remove it out not by uh, touching the outer surface then common breach uh, during the uh, uh, during the gown doffing gown doffing the two important thing is you should not touch the outer uh, surface of the uh, uh, gown and you should remove the gown inside out you should you should uh, uh, remove the gown inside out without touching the outer surface of the gown and you roll into a bundle 
these are the steps of gown uh, topping common mistake what we encounter is not turning inside inside out this is, this is very very common and accidentally are touching the outer surface of the gown not rolling into a bundle just like that uh, uh, dumping it all these are common mistake during gown uh, removal okay next is goggle uh, removal again a point to be noted that while you remove goggles and mask your eyes need to be closed not closing eyes is very very dangerous because droplet may fall on your eyes so while uh, removing goggles and mask make sure your eyes are closed and not and you should bend forward don't bend so much they say that slight leaning is required don't lean so much that you have to you uh, you will touch your dress you have to bend but not so much slightly you have to uh, uh, you have to bend if you don't do that then what will happen is your own droplet will fall on your face so if you if, if you are very much straight then also the droplet will fall in your face if you bend so much then the droplet will fall on your dress so please remember you have to the rule here is slight leaning forward slight leaning uh, forward is the uh, recommended uh, method the mask doffing there are so many uh, 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 breaches we encountered uh, removing mask in the doffing area is the most common uh, uh, breach you have to remove the mask outside the doffing area because doffing area the droplets may be floating in the air also so you have to remove the mask outside the uh, doffing area again i told you that slight uh, uh, leaning forward is 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 required then removing upper elastic please remember always remove lower elastic first then you remove the upper elastic removing upper elastic first is again a breach do not touch the front portion of the mask this is very very dangerous you should never touch the uh, outer surface of the mask and and of of course do not uh, open your eyes you have to close your eyes and of course washing hand is again a mandate after the mask uh, removal and uh, this is something we uh, we all know the like hanging mask uh, syndrome i don't think anybody in this at who is available who has not done hanging mask uh, syndrome uh, during the covid uh, uh, pandemic in spite knowing the fact that when we lower down the mask the already exposed area will come in contact with the inner surface of the mask and when we reposition the mask we are directly inhaling the uh, exposed area organisms we are directly inhaling this fact we all know because this is a pic which is circulating in the whatsapp like anything still all of us are doing hanging mask syndrome this need to be avoided and this need to be strictly prohibited because uh, we, we may think that after doing all that also we are getting covid why the reason is we are not adhering to the uh, uh, guideline as expected okay so pp is certifying uh, the healthcare worker working in the covid area certifying them uh, with pp is a very very important thing do not allow the healthcare workers directly go and work in the uh, in the covid area without pp training uh, certifications then the next two areas gray areas in hai surveillance hai surveillance is the is the most important work i can say that it is the most important work of of infection control nurses and when they go for hai surveillance they find they they find lot of challenges the most important thing what uh, what my icn they find is lack of documentation so if the healthcare workers if the icu staff do not document properly especially the symptom criteria uh, documentation we do not get appropriately uh, sometimes the catheter criteria also we do not get uh, because the catheter insertion date will be absent in the uh, in the case sheet so case sheet uh, uh, documentation we have to train adequately the healthcare workers so that they will uh, uh, document uh, properly another important area we which i want to address here is fio2 and peep these values usually the uh, icu staff uh, they do not change uh, the, once the patient is on a ventilator they will raise the fio2 and peep to meet the oxygen uh, demand but once the patient is improving they usually uh, uh, don't change fio2 and peep as adequately as i, I mean few locations they do but most of the locations 
uh, most of the ICs they do not do. As a result, what happens is a common problem of infrastructure maintenance. When we analyze the data at the end of the month, we realize that many cases will meet IVAC and PVAC criteria, but the VAC, the baseline criteria, will not be met. Uh, will not be met. So this is again a very important gray area. So we have to educate the intensivists, the 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 ICU team. We have to uh, we have to educate. We have to inform them. Please adjust the PEEP in accordance to the oxygen uh, demand. Of course, a lack of national benchmark is another gray area. We are not able to compare our data with the national uh, benchmark. How this can be nullified by you by using your own three-year data. Now we are not dependent on the national uh, benchmark data for JIPMER. Uh, in JIPMER, we have at least six to uh, seven year of HAI data. So we take an average of last five year HAI data and that becomes the benchmark for us. So, so, uh, so, uh, so, uh, so, uh, so as long as we do not have national uh, benchmark data, you can use your own uh, last average uh, three year HAI rate and root cause analysis not performing is another important challenge which i want to address most of the interest control uh, nurses they are involved or they they make themselves involved for the data collection only but once they know that it is a web case it is a ssi case it is it is our it is our responsibility to go to the place and perform adequate rca to know what are the causes and take appropriate action so when coming to uh, uh, when we discuss the gray areas of HA surveillance, SSI surveillance gray areas, how we can forget. SSI uh, surveillance is very, very important, especially post discharge uh, surveillance is a problem in ICUs. We do not uh, uh, undergo uh, discharge. So, so the problem here is how to follow up the patient. So we have to follow the patient for up to uh, 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 30 days. For some diseases, we have to follow up to 90 days, like breast, cardiac, neurosurgery cases. We have to we have to follow for 90 days. So this is again a gray area. We are not able to do that. So we have to make a mechanism for telephonic calls and uh, follow up the patient. Risk factors adjusting is another uh, gray area so we, which need to be adjusted. We have when we uh, produce the SSI rate, we have to make sure that we do the appropriate statistical uh, calculations to to adjust the risk factors. Whether to uh, uh, assign the SSI to the operation theater, or we have to assign the SSI to the ward or the ICU where the patient is housed. Most of the places, uh, this is a uh, this is a confusion. Uh, here, the NHSN guideline has given a very clear cut uh, message that SSI or, or any HAI need to be attributed to always to bedded location. H HAI cannot be attributed to non bedded uh, location. Therefore, you cannot attribute the SSI. Okay, uh, operation theater may be a risk factor, but attributing the SSI should always to be a uh, to the ward or ICUs. Okay, so this is to be kept in mind and organ space SSI has a complex uh, definition. So, so to meet the definition is very, very difficult. And the ICD-10 category of surgery is again, again, a very complex to understand uh, classification. It is very difficult to map our surgeries to the correct NHS and operating uh, categories. Unfortunately, in India, there is no nationalized coding system of uh, surgeries. So we have to follow the ICD-10 uh, category mapping and this mapping is again a uh, challenge uh, because it is very complex and area what I'm going to discuss is gray areas. So care bundle audit, uh, we all know that this care bundle audit we perform to uh, see that the insertion and, and the maintenance of urinary catheter uh, central line and ventilator insertion and maintenance have been done adequately according to the set list of care bundle practices the challenge here is though when we do uh, when we talk about insertion uh, care bundle audit um, uh, many of the insertions occur in emergency uh, uh, situations so therefore who will do the audit if, or, so most of the ICs they ask 
whether care bundle audit has to be done by icu staff or it has to be done by infection control staff infection control uh, 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 nurses answer is very clear it has to be done by infection control nurses it cannot be done by icu staff you cannot ask the icu staff to monitor themselves it is not possible so it has to be a third party who who has to do the auditing and the challenge here is the presence of infection control nurses in emergency incident time is very very uh, challenging lack of uh, documentation is another gray areas they don't document the incident time they don't document that all these uh, points are been followed or not so it is very uh, difficult to go later and do auditing by icns maintenance care bundle audit again if a problem is where when exactly they are going to give the uh, central line care or the urinary catheter care 24 hours are there in that any any particular time they will uh, give the care how icn can go and and monitor at, at that particular time so these are the gray areas uh, now the question is uh, what are the solutions uh, the solution here is one of the uh, solution is uh, CCTV camera based uh, uh, monitoring. So this will solve most of the uh, issues. Second solution is prior uh, prior calling. Uh, second uh, uh, solution is calling prior to, uh, I mean the informing the I, uh, HICC team at least uh, a 30 minute prior. In Jipmer we have uh, we have made a uh, standard rule that any any central line insertion they have to call the infest control team at least uh, uh, at least uh, 30 minutes uh, before so that the central uh, the icns or the or the infest control uh, residents will be there on place and they can do audit i i understand it is difficult to implement because most of the time they they forget uh, sometimes uh, because of the emergency nature of the work they will give excuses so these are the few gray areas uh, these are the few challenges uh, which I thought I will present. The challenges are plenty. Uh, there are other areas of influence control also, but uh, because of uh, lack of time, so I thought I will confine my session to these four important area of IPC. I would like to close my session by saying a very, uh, uh, very, very famous quote, which, uh, uh, which, uh, which always our Pallav sir he says in his sessions. So uh, what happens is uh, this is Amitabh Bachchan quote: "Ham jahan khade ho jaate hain, line wahi se shuru ho jata hai." So we all are uh, uh, putting our own mindset to have our own opinion. What happens in infection control? Everyone today is a IC expert. Everyone uh, uh, today is an infection control expert. They have their own prefixed opinion. I should wear mask like this. I should I should remove mask like this. I can hang the mask by myself. So they have same. They have some fixed ideas. They read uh, by themselves. They uh, 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 they interpret by themselves. So each of the healthcare worker has become an infection control expert of their own and having their own prefixed opinions the problem is not that they are following their own prefixed ideas the uh, the problem is they tend to influence others also to follow the prefixed ideas so the take home uh, message is we should follow the guideline rather than following the mind line so guideline need to be followed do not follow the uh, mind line do not try to self interpret the the rules the rules are already given by wh and cdc with a set of uh, experiments, a set of uh, 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 trials they have done and they have derived the rules. Our job is to adhere to the rule. Okay, so I would like to acknowledge uh, my team at, at, at JITMAR for this session because they are the uh, senior residents who have worked with me for last six to seven years and it, uh, uh, whatever we have implemented in our hospital is because of my uh, my senior residents. If they are not there, then uh, Jipper interesting control team would have been nowhere. So uh, uh, with this, I rest my session over to the organizer. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Purvo. It was an excellent, well uh, described, well uh, explained, uh, detailed talk. Uh, you started with your right now outline, which is again, which are basically four outline we have that hand hygiene audit, uh, the challenges and the solutions, especially the PPE kit audit, the challenges and the solutions as well. 
the hospital acquired infection solutions and challenges and the care bundle audit and challenges. So naturally you've dealt with every aspect of uh, the infection control and uh, you've given the solutions as well. Uh, you mentioned very well the gray areas of hand hygiene audit, especially the intra um, uh, auditor bias, the uh, observational bias, the uh, conformational bias, and uh, the uh, most importantly, the overlapping bias opportunity, I mean, the problems which you can have uh, due to, you know, uh, double counting the opportunity. So that is again, uh, very important, which probably we miss it at times because we don't consider this aspect, especially in normal ICUs. Again, we have some, uh, we don't usually go with this, uh, you know, what you have said. Uh, then we have, you have also mentioned uh, the, uh, you know, uh, the hand hygiene versus the glove, which is again, as per the CTC guideline, what we are supposed to do. Most importantly, which you said, probably I'm not aware that most of the ICUs they are following it or not, the certification of hand hygiene training. Now that is again, something which we should always go on. And that is something uh, we should, uh, I mean, train our staff nurses, train our trainees uh, that how to, uh, how to go for a proper hand hygiene and get a certification as well. Probably, and we are. We have also started this. We are also doing it, but not. Uh, it's it's something which is sporadic, but it's not a not a, a permanent. Uh, you know, uh, training system which we are having here. Uh, PP kit audit again. You very nicely did the do's and don'ts. Now that is something which probably people, resident doctors, and the the other delegates also must be uh, uh, must be witnessing and experiencing that where they are faltering when they are doing a PP kit, especially. The, the do's and don'ts which you mentioned is exactly which way we are we are really faltering when you're goofing and burning. And uh, the other thing is uh, again there also you need a certification which is very important. Probably that will before before you're doing a uh, having a proper doning and doofing the certification should be there. And one very important thing which you mentioned is that this audit can be done even in doffing and doning, and it is on-site uh, um, uh, audit, which is very important. And probably, as you very rightly said, that people are very, uh, you know, uh, afraid of getting an on-site training, which where where it is not that difficult to do it. And I, I think I think that if we can do this, uh, uh, probably we will be able to do a lot for uh, you know preventing the infection as well. Uh, the other thing is, you said the hospital acquired surveillance, as I mentioned in my speech also, that surveillance is very important, whether the implementation is being proper or we are complying to the whatever we are thinking, whatever your protocol we are maintaining or doing, whether we are being surveying, because there is something which is training and retraining and focus and refocusing is very important because whether we are being able to do what we are thinking, that is very important and protocol is being man maintained properly. And uh, as you said very nicely, that uh, uh, lack of documentation is there where we are doing a surveillance. And uh, uh, and I also have experience regarding this PP, uh, uh, PEEP and the FIR2, which is very common in uh, in a normal IC, what to talk about the COVID IC as well. So, uh, uh, and, uh, and the national benchmark is not, the data for the national benchmark is not there. There which where we are really, uh, having a lacuna there, probably if you have a very good national data, probably you'll be able to have a very good benchmark. Uh, the uh, root cause analysis uh, is not, uh, I mean, it, we are not being able to do uh, perform it properly. And that could be one reason where, again, uh, we are uh, faltering. But these are the things which you violated very nicely. And I think we, we should keep in mind. Uh, post discharge, again, surveillance is again something which we are uh, we are really limited we have a lot of limitations on that uh, it, it is something which is a really gray area where we will not be able to uh, do in, in especially in all ICUs it's very difficult to follow that and that's really a challenge for us uh, the uh, the care bundle which we have been talking for the last so many days for the last two three days regarding that again uh, it, it's a, something which you said right, very lightly highlighted that the emergency in the emergency, it becomes very difficult to go uh, with whatever uh, so whatever protocol you maintain and whether we will be able to do it. Who's going to do that audit? That is very important. And documentation, again, is very important. Uh, and maintenance of that audit, uh, you know, that, again, is, uh, is something which we should keep in mind. Uh, the solutions, as you said, is very rightly CCETV, but then in the ICU probably will not be able to maintain a CCETV. That is not possible for us. Uh, uh, I mean, there's some sort of ethical issues. Probably you can do it in uh, outside uh, CCTV, uh, outside IC, you can go for a CCTV, but we are not being able to, we, we don't usually put a CCTV in an IC. Uh, 
but otherwise, of course, uh, somewhere other than in, in the wards, you can do it, uh, but uh, not in the ICU as well. But the bottom line, what you said is very important, that uh, guidelines to be always followed. It's not the mind line. And that is the bottom line of your talk. And I'm really, I really was very happy to listen to this because yesterday also I highlighted this same point in my speech that it has to be a guideline based management. You cannot go with a mind line based means you cannot do it as per your experience. And then you can think that this is what you are experiencing is the best. That probably will not be uh, helpful in all situations. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Apurvo. It was really a nice uh, uh, talk and nice uh, interacting with you. Thank you, sir. I would hand over the mic to uh, to the uh, event manager now. Thank you so much, everyone. It was a really interesting and informative session. So uh, I would like to thank uh, the chairpersons, the speakers for sharing their knowledge of excellence. And we are moving to the next session now. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Dr. Sari, can you please start? Dr. Sarik, can you please start, please? Please unmute yourself, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Very warm, warm welcome to all chairpersons, speakers, and delegates to the session Infection Control Program and Administ Administration Attributes. As we know that the infection prevention program has main purpose to stop transmission of infection in healthcare settings. And for successful implementation of any program, there is a strong administration will required. For this session, we have the chairperson, Dr. Nita Manshi, ma'am. Ma'am is currently working as a director of laboratory infection control and quality assurance at Ruby Hall Clinic, Pune. Ma'am has also worked with WHO on different topics, especially at the time of SARS outbreaks. And other eminent chairs, Professor Haris Manzoor Khan, sir, Chairperson, Department of Microbiology, and Medical Superintendent, Jawaharlal Nehru Medical College, Aligarh Muslim University. Sir is currently Principal Instigator of Viral Research and Diagnostic Laboratory, Jawaharlal Nehru Medical College. Sir has more than 100 research publications in reputed national and international journals and have authored many chapters in various books. Without any delay, handing it over to the chairperson. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this uh, session. We are looking forward to hearing some very interesting uh, talk on interesting topics. Uh, the first speaker I can see online is uh, Is 
uh, is our own uh, my colleague and uh, she has been with us for a long time but uh, now she is uh, abroad uh, i would like to welcome her she is my professor department of microbiology now uh, there is some error here it's not associate and uh, she is in college of medicine and health sciences sultan qaboos university she is a very energetic researcher very energetic uh, teacher and she has uh, several awards to her credit and she has uh, so many uh, publications and uh, without uh, delay we like, i'd like to invite the uh, mayor to uh, present her video stopped a very good afternoon everyone this absolutely splendid being part of his con 21 uh, uh, i have my own presentation if you don't mind then we can uh, do the online presentation Uh, I'd rather this was a recorded one. Yeah, I'd like to do the or uh, the live presentation. If yes, please, ma'am. Yes, please. Yeah, thank you. So my the video has stopped. Will you enable the video, please? In enable the man. Yeah, please. yeah, yeah. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, good afternoon, sir. It's such a pleasure seeing you there. And uh, whatever we have achieved in JNMC is largely due to you, the largely to you, and I'm so happy that you're chairing this session. Again, the video has stopped for some reason. Uh, I'll uh, just request the. No, your video is visible, ma'am. Oh, You're I'm getting. Oh, all right. So wonderful, hmm. wonderful uh, seeing you here, sir. Such a pleasure, and you being there is making me absolutely so thrilled. So I'll just share the slides, and then we'll proceed. But really, my pleasure is enhanced by the fact that Dr. Haris M Khan is uh, chairing this session along with Dr. Nita. Are you? Uh, I still can't see my presentation. Video has stopped because the host has stopped it. Uh, just a minute. I can't see my uh, presentation. I'm at R and it is visible. Just yeah, I know, but my end for some reason. Your screen is visible, ma'am. Just uh, open the PowerPoint or Keynote. Uh, what you have used, please uh, open that uh, PPT, please. Your screen is visible. You are also visible. All right. All right. Thank you. So can you see this? It's visible. I just like the photos to be. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes ma'am. It's visible. Do it. I just need to remove the photo. Right. So, a uh, very warm uh, thanks to Hisicon Twenty One for inviting me, and I'm so thrilled that it's being conducted in. Jawaharlal Nehru Medical College, and we have our own dear Dr. Harris and dear Dr. Fatma and the entire team there, who are who are the helm of this program. Uh, thrilled to be discussing implementation of healthcare associated infection program in public and private sector. There is really no difference in the implementation of this in either of the two sectors. There can be differences in the logistics, in the sustainability, in the leadership, in the funding. and in the culture of the of the two sectors but as far as implementation is concerned there's really hardly any difference uh, so while we discuss the implementation we'll we'll try to focus a little bit on the differences between the two programs so the fact that you're sitting here late in the day tells me that you're motivated and believe me motivation is the key you're keen in bringing about a change for the better you're passionate about patient safety and you're deeply concerned about the rising antimicrobial resistance in short you are ready to implement ipc in your setting or you are ready to improve ipc in your setting and believe me it's a challenging and an extremely exciting venture and this is not just a program it's really a movement it has a potential for culture change in the hospital and this can permeate to becoming a way of life and as facilitated by covid we can we have to absolutely build on the strengths which we already have unfortunately the reality of today is that the lmic's contribute to 5.7 to 19.1% of hcai and when we look at this data this may be actually conservative data and some settings may have uh, infection rates up to 50% what we need to understand is that this is not just data there are faces to it there are people to it there is pain there is suffering there is loss of life and there's loss of economy so when we discuss it with the other stakeholders we need to bring in the the person uh, component to it so we talk about the morbidity and mortality let's bring in the stories and the economic burden and unfortunately patients who leave the healthcare work uh, facility after this infection 
are often poorer than when they entered it. And if you're talking about people in the lower socioeconomic uh, uh, strata anyway, they unfortunately enter the below the poverty line once they exit the hospital. So this is something which is rather reprehensible and we need to communicate this information to the frontline workers effectively. The good news is that these are avoidable infections and reductions can be to the tune of 35% to 55% and we need to just keep working at it. Carrying on with the good news, there are a slew of excellent freely downloadable materials available whether it's WHO, whether it's CDC or, uh, or Australian or NICE guidelines, and even focusing on leadership programs. What is even better is that the national, the Indian government itself has shown commitment to patient safety and to quality health care. And to top it all up, we have the national guidelines, which shows us that the commitment of the government is there towards better patient care and safety. I like to, I just love this picture, which I'd like to just uh, walk you through. There is the government is committed towards providing an enabling environment, which talks about the ergonomics, the adequate and right type of materials and equipment, and appropriate workloading, adequate staffing, and the promise of one bed per patient. On this strong foundation, the five pillars can be built to, uh, to lead to uh, effective infection and prevention control program. Just to put things in perspective, the current health outlay is 1% of the GDP. And I hope that we can expect a much higher outlay subsequently so that we can actually implement or rather walk the talk which we are committed to. Uh, just to put things in perspective again, Cuba has a, a GDP of 8% for the healthcare at, at the cost of cutting down the defense. So the core components, we're all aware of it, and we're very fortunate we have 2020, we had our own national guidelines, we have excellent evidence-based guidelines, and then uh, the education training, I think, is extremely strong in many of our centers. We need to, of course, uh, permeate the undergraduate training, uh, uh, education, postgraduate ed education in all centers. Along with, when talking about the healthcare worker, what I would really, really stress is talk to the senior talk to people who can make a difference. So the senior consultant is washing his or her hands. Just you me. can absolutely accept that this will bring about a change in the lower excellence of the hierarchy. Surveillance is where we need to be, we need to strengthen our uh, position and we, unless we measure, how do we know where we're going wrong and where we need to further implement better practices. Now coming to the new uh, strategies where multimodal strategy is a very big uh, component which talks about the five R's. So you're building, teaching, checking, and selling. And this is again, you know, where we have ultimately come to the uh, conclusion that we need the right system. And the leadership commitment at both the national and the facility level is so very important so that we can actually deliver on what we are promising. What this picture is again, very important and uh, interesting is that IPC is linked to a whole lot of other programs, including the WASH, which is a very welcome program. We're talking about water, sanitation, and hygiene. It talks about really the reality of the low and middle income countries, and we want to strengthen this. And of course, AMR is right there. What I'd like to draw your attention to is the increasing attention to community engagement and media, which can further strengthen uh, you know, patient safety. Of course, WHO has a better picture where there's interlinking. I'm just showing you a radial, but actually interlinking of one program with the other. So who do we target? What you need to see is that 66% of our patients are going to the private sector and 34 is coming to public. Although when you go to a public hospital, you think the whole world is sitting over there. So we need to, first of all, make this equitable. We need 50% in both sectors. So we need more commitment. I don't want to talk to the large centers of excellence or tertiary care hospitals in either of the two sectors because they're on their way to implementing it as far as uh, one can. One needs to talk about, you know, outreach programs in both these centers. Are we talking to the smaller hospitals? Uh, do we understand it's a one health concept? Are we talking just about our hospital or are we talking about all hospitals and all health caregivers? And just take a glance at the informal medical practitioners. 11% of our population is still going to the quacks and we need to address these people as well. And of course, as mentioned so well by so many of our speakers earlier, the public and the media needs to uh, be as involved and as well as, you know, public and private uh, partnership. If not partnership, then at least, uh, you know, strengthening each other where one can has the where one has the wherewithal. The importance of increasing public engagement, increasing media engagement cannot be 
overstated. We need to make sure that they understand that this is their program and it is their right to patient safety. And I'm looking forward to a time when a, when a patient will come and tell the nurse or the doctor, kindly wash your hands before you examine me. And when this gains momentum, believe me, this is going to have greater commitment from the national state governments and from the heads of facilities so that it becomes a national conscience that patient safety is the right of the citizens and we go from there. Just walking on the same uh, stream of thought with COVID having held us so strongly, if we just communicate the need for hand hygiene through all our various sectors, including film and television, and believe me, religious heads, if cleanliness becomes a way of life, then we can actually reduce pneumonia and diarrhea and impetigo in the community to a level of 50%. That means that much less load on the hospital, that much less load on infection prevention uh, of people, and naturally that much less load on the antibiotics. So this is something which we need to communicate. And you know, where I feel is apart from just publishing in peer reviewed literature, we need to go to the media, we need to go to the public in vernacular. So Hindi mein, Tamil mein, Malayali mein bolna padega. So we get out of our walls and reach out and make a more effective case for infection prevention control and better patient safety. So if you're talking about implementing it in a healthcare facility, it's important to do background research. There's no sense in going about it unless we don't know what is the problem statement. And the microbiology laboratory is a great place to tell you where things are really wrong. You look at those low-lying fruit and you start going on rounds with your team. So it's important for the microbiologist to be seen in the hospital, to be seen with you know, antimicrobial stewardship and infection prevention control. And what is very interesting is that while you're uh, not only observing procedures, you're interacting with healthcare workers and the patients, you can easily become the face of the healthcare facility and you can promote, you can be a very good PRO, believe me. And we can be integrating different departments. We're actually going at, very tangent, at many different tangents. To do all this, there's certain excellent guidelines and there's IPCAF, which has a self-monitoring uh, checklist, which can be followed and can even be used uh, to compare different facilities and uh, improve without getting the stress of having an external person coming and telling you what's right and what's wrong. So that's a way to begin. Uh, PDCA or PDSA is a great uh, exercise, which we should be trying to look at. And whenever you're trying to implement a change, try to do this Ishimura fish bone uh, 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 study analysis, look at the different components which go into making the, the, the particular uh, so the program or the project and look at the problems at different angles. This can help in, in initiating and talking to different people and bringing about a, a reasonably a, a sensible plan of action, carry out the plan of action. And once you've done that, you know, to need to do a control checks and analyze what happened. If we do not analyze, we do not know what went wrong, what we need to adopt, what we need to adapt, and what we need to uh, abandon. So with patient safety in mind and armed with the data and the guidelines, one needs to adopt a top bottom and a bottom up approach. That means you need to secure in the secure a buy-in from both the leadership and the Safai Karam Chariwala and everybody in the middle. You need to, need to make a good business case. And for that, you need to have your surveillance data and why it is a cost-effective proposition so that you can ensure the funds and infrastructure and try to get some autonomy in the decision-making so that things can start happening faster. While engaging the senior leadership, it's very important to engage the stakeholders because without them, it's, it's a non-goer. Non you need to build teams and champions, identify champions and try to engage them and develop ownership. It's like you have this giving it to them to care for. And that is a great beginning to a, a great start to a good beginning. You can build a strong organizational climate, a positive organizational climate, which will undoubtedly de deliver quality health care. So uh, comparing leadership uh, in the public and the private, now the, the, the uh, guidelines, the papers I got are few, and most of them uh, focus more on the private sector. But you, what you can see here is that the vision and mission are shared, the same vision and mission. I could add three or four pluses here, and in tech, sorry, intention to implement is as strong, but the ability to implement maybe more in the private for reasons we know, uh, accreditation is something which the public sector is going in big steam. Gujarat is one state, of course, uh, doing a lot of accreditation in the government sector. And we need to really focus on it. But we need to understand that uh, where are the funds? So the National Quality Assurance Standard and the Kaya Kalp are excellent uh, platforms by which we can start beginning the process of uh, improving uh, a whole lot of programs. 
leadership involvement again there are certain papers talk about closer leadership uh, uh, in the private and approachability in the private but believe me i need to thank dr haris right now and dr tarik mansoor because uh, all all uh, we cannot measure all institutes by the same uh, measure and there are different types of leaderships and different approachabilities and we need to make this we need to make more stories where we find approachable and highly involved leadership autonomy again maybe wider in the private flexibility maybe more in the private but as i said different stories in different uh, institutions supplies undoubtedly will be limited but what you need to keep in perspective is the opd footfalls and the bed so the public sector has so much more with the limited funds and yet you look at this and what you see is that the government uh, uh, structure has a, a, a expenditure of 6000 vis-a-vis 35000 and if it's a low income strata person who's come in uh, what we really need the message here is we need to strengthen the public sector so that we do not uh push people down the below the poverty line and make them more economically straitened so guidelines are very important and i firmly believe that they should not be built in a closed room by a group of highly passionate people it should be made in consultation with the influencers and the thinkers they should be engaged because i believe that the team building should begin right from the inception of the plan of having an uh, good program and this promotes buy in it also uh, you know identify potential barriers and solutions and tools and resources building the team is a very very serious uh, part, uh, project it should be done very seriously with keeping the right people in the picture it should be a high profile event so that a person who's there of course he's worthy but he would love to put it in his cv that he's part of the ipc ipc team representation of course from all levels of strata with a great emphasis on interdependence and interconnectedness because the human resource is the most valuable resource and if nurtured properly then they will breathe the mission and the vision for you so there is no harm in starting simple in fact i'm a big proponent of starting simple improve on the no cost and the low cost practices and do a good audit and check out where the good stop check out where wasteful and unnecessary practices are happening and need to work on that and believe me you'll see a great fundamental difference in the quality of the organization as well as the quality of the patient care so starting simple no cost what i believe is the most important is apart from of course ensuring that whatever practices are there are done optimally we need to start educating and the education the team of educators should be very broad it should not i think i don't think we should really believe in having a particular ipc team of course that's very important a committee and team but the educators can be drawn from all departments and hopefully from all units because then they start working at least one person in each unit is working that talk and you are focusing them targeting them as brand ambassadors and they bring the stories which help in the implementation of the program and believe me we all have stories of people who do not listen who are really cynical make them teach tell them to become the chief guest give tell them to give a big pep talk and you know what happens and that's when the conversion begins what is important to also understand is that uh, while you ask them to talk of course you're giving them the the module a pre prepared module you're also helping them uh, work on their help working on the self esteem self actualization and believe me it's a fundamental human want to be socially useful and even when you are talking to your stakeholders to the to the frontline workers learning new stuff is what happiness is made of so always uh, try to never think that you overburdening them it's something which is needed for happiness and where when you talk to them it's important to tell them that the institution cares for them so three moments of hand hygiene are for them the vaccination is for them have they eaten food before they came so a little bit of caring goes a long way what i feel is we also need to instill pride in belonging to the institution which may be lacking we many of us are very self effacing so that's important and of course a higher purpose and aim for collective ownership appreciation it's a big mover and shaker and there is as little of course the right kind of appreciation with the selling of the program and also selling of the surveillance data you know i mean once you've done it you need to exhibit the surveillance data and 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 identify where is the problem so please don't be scared of the problem but that problem needs to be shared connectivity through whatsapp group is an amazing facilitator as well and so the validation connection remains and sometimes you get amazing ideas from the groups itself and you can validate them right there and such ideas should be encouraged adapted and adopted human resource as you know is the most important resource are we handling it correctly are we doing the right thing with the right uh, with our human resource 
Of course, there are issues with the staffing. Attrition may be a bigger problem in the private. We need to work on the motivation and behavioral issues and so on. What is very important is the empowering of the staff. We've trained them and they're there. And then they take off a person for not uh, hand hygiene, for not practicing hand hygiene. Do they get ticked off? So here it's uh, the study says that the nurses are more empowered in the private. We need to empower the microbiologists as well as all uh, IPC team so that what they say is actually heard. So our passion gets translated to actual action. So for actual translation into action, you know, it's, it's really a behavioral thing. We know it, we have it, are we really doing it? So one of the ways of doing it is by the study in Gujarat by Bharti Sharma, which talks about appreciative inquiry. And I think that really works in India because you know we're all part of the team. We'd like to be part of the uh, solution as well as the problem. So you one needs to uh, develop a team spirit. You discover the problem, identify some experts from outside. And what COVID has taught us is that we can reach out to experts. This leverages the program. And then you can uh, dream or identify the problems, enhance the teamwork, motivate the leadership, design uh, good implementation programs, and you achieve an excellent uh, outcome. And this can be used in so many other ways. I am a big believer in the fish bone, but then the same four Ds can be used in all kinds of uh, uh, motivational uh, programs. Unless we measure, we do not know where we are. And so this is absolutely important. And Dr. Purva will be doing that in detail. It, I don't need to really stress on it here at all. But where we do not have a strong surveillance, we can always proceed with a point prevalence survey. If we can't do uh, outcome surveillance, we can always do a process surveillance. So please don't get bogged down if you don't have a whole lot of stuff in place. There are many things which can still be done. I'd like to show this slide just because I want to show you the disparity which exists in India. What should be measured? In some centers, we'll be measuring the presence of water supply and toilets and electricity and manpower. At the other end, we'll be uh, monitoring AMR patterns and evaluations of device-associated infections and high-risk populations. And the fact that quality microbiology is a, is a luxury. It is not a, it is not a given. It's something, it, it's a reality. And we need to, again, advocate for all these with the leadership at the national level, at the state level, so that we start really getting things in place. So a lot of work was done by INIC, and it's really praiseworthy that we have many Indians in it. A lot of it is the private sector, but we have high-end public sectors as well. And while the education is done, and the outcome surveillance is done, and the process surveillance is done, and this is something which we're all doing, and we need to start documenting it. And if not uh, publish it, why we don't publish is something uh, we need to start thinking. But we need to publish. We need to also bring it uh, into the into the say hissy platform, we share our stories, you know, whether they're good stories or bad stories, we need to share them. And we have a platform like hissy for that, and then translate it into MD and PhD thesis. Again, the private sector for many reasons, which we know are more committed to, are more involved in multicentric studies. And I think we can do that with private sector and public sector together, as well as of course, uh, individuals. Feedback is an absolute must, whether it's good or bad. Appreciation should be loud and clear. It is important to understand, is the feedback two-way? Are we listening? Are we promoting participation? Are we thinking out of the box? Because it's very important to follow guidelines. But then, you know, we need to see our own, our own uh, facility and what do we have and how can we work with what we have. So if you can't follow the guidelines to a T, at least start the process. And many often we can come up with our own indigenous uh, solutions and we should be proud of that. Audit is where the process surveillance begins and we need to always go back to the PDSA and check out whether the process is uh, good, whether we need to work on the cost and can we do it in a better way? Is someone else doing it in a different way and can we adopt that? So a lot of us are into education. A lot of us are into selling it. Many of us uh, are definitely on the road for surveillance and audit. What we need to really start seeing is that I've done all this, you know, I've done it. And then my healthcare worker goes and says, you know, the hand sanitizer wasn't there or the water wasn't there or the soap wasn't there. So that means that although we are multimodal, we still are, there's a, there's a gap between, between the practice and the actual reality. So the systems need to be uh, advocated to, they need to be part of this entire enterprise so that whatever we are teaching, whatever we are so passionate about 
actually is available for practice. And then we can build a culture of uh, living the IPC program. So this is a study in France, which was very interesting because that was in France, more than in India. And they studied the socio-cognitive determinants of hand hygiene, and they studied seven different aspects. And you can see that the two very important behavioral things were the exemplary behavior of seniors and the social influence of peers. And the two others were the facilitating organization. Of course, training and reminders, I'm sure we're good at, but when it comes to the materials and the excessive workload, we have no control on that. And that's where the going gets tough. And that's where, again, as I'm going on and on about it, but then we need to have the systems in place. But even having said that, please don't think that if you don't have any of these, it cannot be done. It can definitely be done. And a huge beginning can be done with, uh, with uh, fewer of these resources. So when you talk about the culture, I would say that, I mean, Dr. Harris is here, very happy about that. Can we make a business model with a social face? Can we be target oriented? Can we compete with different public sectors so that we build a culture of you know, greater accountability and greater productivity? And we pull back the, the citizens back to our hospitals. But of course, we need the wherewithal, more beds and more infrastructure and more, power, more manpower. So to conclude, committed leadership and a greater GDP, our GP, uh, gross domestic product outlay is absolutely important. We need the leadership and I'm happy Dr. Harris is there. Technical knowledge, we know we need to engage into good management practices with empathy and empowerment of our patients, of the citizens at large, with team spirit and flattening of the hierarchy where, uh, for example, the CTVS surgeons are not above God, for example, or microbiology is not somewhere in the lower ends of the echelon and the nurses are empowered. So with greater public good and do no harm in mind, with both public and private sectors can implement effective IPC practices for quality healthcare and optimum patient safety. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Rizvi. I think uh, that was an excellent talk and uh, you hit it on the nail, the, on the head because it is important that uh, people go out into the hospital. What you said is absolutely right, that people do need to get out of their four walls and be seen within the hospital that you are doing active work on infection control, involve everybody at all levels. Like you said, champions in every department have to be involved, involve the senior management because they don't realize, they feel infection control is only expenditure. You know, one has to portray to them that it's not expenditure, it is saving on expenses. So when saving expenses is also a way of income for the hospital, and that needs to be highlighted because for them, it's just that, oh, in infection control is only expenditure. And I think what you highlighted was excellent. And yes, the private sector is more active, but I think public sector has started becoming active now. I see a lot of uh, government hospitals actively taking part in infection control programs. And uh, I think they have their limitations, but uh, still I would say they're doing a commendable job. So thank you very much. Excellent talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'd like to... Uh... Thank uh, Dr. Meher for the excellent uh, presentation. And uh, interesting finding was somebody uh, gave a presentation yesterday that because of COVID, the implementation of uh, is much more compliance now of infection control practices because of the fear of COVID. So that was an interesting finding yesterday. And thank you so much, uh, Meher, for the excellent talk. Uh, now uh, talking Dr. about the... Like to introduce. <laughs> Would you like to, shall I introduce her, sir? Yeah, yeah, please, please. Okay, okay. Now going on to the next topic, we have Dr. Sumi Nandwani. She's a professor in HOD microbiology and sub-dean at the Super Speciality Pediatric Hospital. Um, sorry, I just lost out. Yeah. Uh, and postgraduate teaching program at NOIDA in the UP government hospital. She is... Uh, very, very active and passionate about her infection control program. Um, she's, of course, um, I'm sorry, but I'm not being able to see the whole slide. Um, she has more than 20 years of experience of teaching uh, microbiology, 
but uh, she's also got a lot of awards, the recent one being COVID Leadership Award uh, to district, uh, ma through the district magistrate in uh, GB Nagar UP, which is really, really commendable. Um, she has, um, can I? She got the best paper award in International Conference on Hospital Waste Management in 2015. And uh, she has a lot of publications to her credit. So may I invite Dr. Sumi Nandwani to please start her presentation. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Dr. Neeta, for introducing me. And I'm uh, very glad Dr. Harris is here. So at the outset, uh, I would like to thank HISICON organizers, Dr. Fatima, Dr. Raman, and their team, AMU team, for having given me this opportunity to speak here with all of you. So before further delay, I think I'll, I'll just start with my presentation. So am I audible? And is yes, ma'am. Yes, yes, yes. So I will start. I've been told to speak on placement of healthcare associated infections in an educational healthcare institute. And in the symposium on infection prevention program and administration attributes. So I guess uh, I have been into education uh, throughout my career. I've been in an academic institute and that is why I have probably given this topic. So this is what I'll be covering upon. Is there any difference in uh, implementing healthcare associated infection control programs in an academic is institute versus the other healthcare institutes? I'll also be based on my experiences instead of a conventional presentation, I'll be talking about uh, the strengths and opportunities we get in an educational institute and uh, weaknesses and challenges we face in an educational institute, unlike any normal healthcare facility. Uh, as I told you, I, I'll not be presenting a conventional presentation. All my previous speakers, including my batchmate, Dr. Meher, has talked about various guidelines and uh, uh, publications. I'll be sharing some of my experiences, personal experiences, uh, in implementing healthcare infection control programs in an academic institute. Also the challenges and are uh, dealing with COVID-19 infection and control programs. Also for the benefit of students, there are a lot of students here. I'll be just uh, in brief uh, pinpointing some of the training programs which are available in India and internationally. So is there any difference? Upon thinking upon it and uh, based on my experiences, yes, I think there is uh, some difference in implementing infection control programs in an academic institute vis-a-vis -a, -vis a non academic institute. For example, mostly in most of the academic institutes, we do have two uh, uh, managements going on where we have a dean or a principal looking after the academic part. We have a medical superintendent or a chief medical superintendent uh, or the director looking after the non-academic or patient care part. Uh, besides patient care, which of course is uh, imperative in any healthcare facility, in an academic institute, we have a lot of teaching, training and research activities. Uh, like lectures, we have to conduct lectures, CMEs, conferences. We have to uh, do a lot of work for conducting examinations of the students. There is a lot of focus on publications, project work, thesis work, a lot of administrative work as in affiliation. I'm also chairperson of affiliation committee in my institute. We have to do a lot of academic uh, work in the sense getting NMC or board affiliations and approvals. Then manpower is also the manpower which is there available with us is a little different. We have a lot of students working with us. These can include medical and paramedical students depending on the courses going on would be MBBS, BDS, MD, MS, postgraduate, super specialty uh, students. We could have nursing, OTPT, dental students, etc. We may have ad hoc trainees or interns. We may have, if we have projects going on, we may have research officers, scientists, fellows, PhDs, and uh, unlike purely consultants, we do have faculty as in professors, associates, professors and assistant professors, as in uh, my current designation, working in this institutes. As for working days and hours, I think most of the academic institutes follow a roster. Unlike uh, any healthcare facility, 
wherein uh, most of the staff is posted in a unit a particular unit or a particular area we do have rotational postings for the students including vacations summer vacations winter vacations related to healthcare uh, infection control again academic and non academic heads have a shared responsibility uh, most of the committees uh, in a previous institute as in mine i'll be detailing we had both dean and the ms as co chairpersons and each with its own role and uh, division of duties again we have a lot of teaching programs which incorporate hospital infection control and surveillance activities we have research uh, projects which we give to these students or we conduct ourselves uh, and lot of these research projects are high priority areas like antimicrobial resistance stewardship mdr prevention and control so all these agencies who fund these projects they are mostly prioritizing on these areas and students of course we involve students in all the training and surveillance activities as well so as per my experience what were the strengths and opportunities we gained in an academic institute uh, we are uh, fortunate to have student population with us which will, who of course will be the future practicing doctors nurses or paramedical staff and these students are very open to learning are willing to adopt new practices unlike some of the old timers who are unwilling to change their uh, preconceived notions and thoughts real uh, regular teaching and training improves and updates the knowledge base sharing of information and data when the data is shared with us and it is presented to us in a viewable form or we are uh, told about the data especially the management it helps us to identify the lacunae and improve upon our uh, deficits as i initially told uh, these project areas are uh, high priority areas in most of the funding uh, agencies and so they become an attractive research areas this also is an uh, opportunity especially for the management if we can draw some funds through these projects the management is interested of course uh, we have a lot of dedicated journals i'll be detailing these journals also we have a lot of dedicated journals purely on infection control and your publications get a priority in these journals infection if someone has a specific training in infection control he is a has a certificate or he is attended a, a training program it is does improve their cv it does add strength to their cv and improve their career options trainees of course add to the workforce especially for surveillance activities as we heard our previous uh, speakers lot of uh, teams and lot of areas we here ke hamare paas to infection control nurses hi nahi hai hamare paas team hi nahi hai hum kaise kare surveillance programs kaise conduct kare so uh, student population and trainee population do add strength to the workforce we can get them involved we can make teams and uh, divide the work we have uh, as i told earlier we have lot of organizations promoting infection pre uh, prevention and control through publications through manuals through trainings offering research grants we have hisi this conference is a live example we have iimm who is doing a lot of work with uh, who we have a winsa program going on on uh, where and they are collecting uh, data on antimicrobial resistance all over india and specific states and we'll be utilizing this data for improving upon uh, the control programs we have icmr and we have ncdc who have taken out a uh, lot of guidelines and publications especially related to cd uh, to covid 19 pandemic and their control we have uh, a specific society indian society of hospital waste management it also holds conferences i have been a participant international organizations we all are aware who cdc nih uh, we have societies international society for infectious diseases itsa infection prevention society international federation of infection control we have uh, nigerian uh, societies we have canadian uh, societies and we have apic asian pacific infection control organizations we have specific journals who focus on publications on infection control and related articles 
uh, we have societies publishing these journals like this is publishing journal of patient safety and infection control uh, i keep getting articles for reviewing these we have american journal of infection control then shia is publishing infection control and hospital epidemiology we have uh, epidemiology and infection we have again nigerian journal of infection control canadian journal of infection control we have international journal of disease control and prevention a lot of lcwa publications infection prevention and practice we have bmc publications antimicrobial resistance and infection control i found a journal on case studies in infection control so all these become uh, lucrative for the students to work on these areas so that they get priority publications in these journals what are the challenges and threats or weaknesses in an academic institute we face when we are trying to implement a good infection control program so students and trainees are unfortunately a moving population these keep changing we have to have frequent trainings to train every new batch and most of the academic institutes are doing it but it requires a lot of motivation and effort additional activities like conducting exams university application board approvals divert may divert the focus of faculty and management for specific healthcare associated infection and control activities uh, there is a lot of focus on fulfilling the numbers just to fulfill the numbers for publication groundwork may not completely reflect the numbers students as i said earlier are on rotational postings as per roster so specific field training if we particularly want to uh, train someone in let's say icu icu infection control so it may become difficult or challenging because uh, by academic rosters they need to rotate also institute management uh, may think that they may not be able to retain these students or trainees whom they are putting so much effort to train and this may be a deterring factor for the management to focus on i'll just share some of my experiences where i have worked and tried to implement infection control programs uh scenario 1 is a post graduate institute healthcare institute government institute we had dean looking after the academic part we had medical superintendent looking after the non academic part both of them were chair persons of committees and hicc here i want to emphasize that the roles and responsibilities should be very very clear when we lay down in the manual these roles and responsibilities should be very clearly defined otherwise the bucks keep passing everyone will try to pass the buck and take the uh, take the uh, take the advantage of getting any uh, particular achievements nodal officers tend to bear the brunt they have all the responsibilities including surveillance inspection work carrying out non compliances rectifying non compliances making sops conducting teaching and training activities record maintenance and they have to have a very strong team to help them do that regular training programs are uh, good we need to regularly conduct training programs which are appreciated by the management students and all the other uh, ad hoc student trainees are a moving population so frequent trainings was becoming challenging here scenario 2 is again a purely post graduate healthcare institute there is a lot of focus on academics we keep holding cmes we kept uh, frequent training programs including for nursing staff paramedical staff hospital uh, hospital uh, housekeeping staff pg students were given work on thesis we have given specific hospital infection control uh, related topics antimicrobial resistance uh, related topics to the pg students they are presented in the conferences and cmes data sharing was very good clinicians were very interested to know and practice the latest which is there available however surveillance work became challenging because of limited time manpower we also were uh, we had to divide our time focusing on academic work as well as administrative work this was very challenging in this institute scenario 3 was a purely academic institute focus on academics we had graduate post graduate uh, batches it was private institute we had multiple courses mbbs bds md phd you name a course and we had that course 
nursing, DMLT, BMLT, OTPT. So there was a lot of focus on teaching. The knowledge base of the student population was very good. Publications uh, were emphasized on thesis and project works, a lot of thesis and project works. It was a private institute and they were focusing on uh, accreditation. They were interested in getting accreditations and HIC activities. So they did give us advantage of posting ICNs with us. COVID-19 or our experience has been very, very challenging in terms of HIC. It was difficult to have training and teaching activities, especially offline teaching and training activities, especially for uh, housekeeping staff who were not accessing online training programs or uh, let's say attendants, hospital attendants or lab attendants who were not accessing these uh, online uh, training programs. So it was very difficult with the social norms being there. Fear of infection, which we majorly dealt with. All the staff needed a lot of motivation and that fear that we'll get infected if we participated in uh, surveillance activities or infection control activities was there. All students, faculties, trainees were additionally posted in COVID care duties. They were all including our staff, our PG students, our faculty, microbiology faculty were posted in COVID care duties and also in the COVID lab. So we had limited manpower to carry out, actually carry out ground on ground hospital infection control training and prevention activities. At the same time, bulk waste generation, bulk uh, patient load, increase the demand for strengthening these infection control activities. Bulk waste generation, increase the burden on the system and the HIC team. Use of steroids in COVID patients with increased rate of MDRs and opportunistic infection like mucormycosis required stringent HIC measures, which again, we were um, facing a crunch with the manpower and implementation. For the benefit of students who are attending this, uh, there are a lot of infection control training programs available in India and abroad. Uh, we have a lot of societies. We have WHO, CDC, Windsor D program is going on. We have a diploma program by University of Hyderabad and Infection Control Academy of India. We have certificate courses by AIMS, Jodhpur, Jipner, Pauducherry. Private and public institutes both are conducting certificate programs or PDCC programs here. Nursing also, nursing schools are conducting infection control certificate programs for nurses. Abroad, we have WHO, it has advanced infection prevention control training program, online and offline as well. We have CDC, we have ITSA, having a health epidemiology, infection control and antimicrobial stewardship program. It has an online ID fellow course. We have uh, Hopkins, John Hopkins having an healthcare and infection prevention control program. We have IFIC, we have NHCA Singapore. So to summarize, I guess infection control and prevention is a three tier thing, wherein training becomes one of the major tiers. And once we strengthen training, we can, observe the other two tiers and get an effective control program. To end, I'll just summarize, education is the most powerful weapon which we can use to change the world by Nelson Mandela. I hope uh, and I thank you for patient hearing and listening to me. Thank, thank you so much, Dr. Sunni, for an excellent presentation. You have always been in the forefront of uh, infection control programs everywhere. And uh, you also highlighted the problems which you have to face in implementing the infection control programs. And uh, you have also given the good insight to future uh, uh, young generation on how to go about learning, how to uh, learn about the infection control program and the different, uh, uh, say, for example, teaching programs being provided by all over the world, especially in India. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Dr. Nita, you'd like to say something? Um, I just thought that it was uh, very informative for the students 
that so many infection prevention and control programs are available in our country. And what uh, I would like to emphasize is that people who are in the educational um, system should inculcate. I mean, you are fortunate, Dr. Nandwani, that you are in an educational institution. But I think it is important that it should be a part, infection prevention and control should be a very important part of the curriculum at the MBBS level, because these are the students who are, uh, you know, adaptable to learning new things. And if we don't inculcate it at the MBBS level, then over a period of time, they don't take it seriously. So I think that is my message to the people in the educational system that please inculcate as an important part of the curriculum for MBBS. I totally agree with you, ma'am. And I would actually suggest that he, she can, he, she can take this initiative and uh, suggest and maybe write to NMC to include it in the MBBS and MD curriculum. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Clinical subject, even for clinical subject. Absolutely. Unless it is a part of curriculum, uh, it would be uh, very difficult to effectively have a very good... Yes, yes. Program. When they become also, consultants, they don't... Wanting... Sorry. Sorry, yes, go on. Uh, I was uh, also wanting to suggest that HISI can actually take up and start fellowships on infection control wherein we can have fellows uh, doing infection control fellowships in our institutes with uh, HISI as the backup. Dr. Sumi, uh, with, with permission of the chair, sir, uh, and madam, uh, can, I, can I answer? Yeah, please. Please go ahead. Uh, see, Dr. Sumi, uh, uh, HISI is already into it with Dr. Anju Bhagal leading uh, uh, that forum. Uh, you know, where uh, we are, and along with uh, Captain Usha Banerjee. So not only with doctors, we are also planning to have a fellowship with, for nursing as well. So uh, we'll start with short terms first and then take on uh, long-term fellowships. So that is what the, and uh, they, are in, uh, they are in talks with the, the government uh, and quasi-government uh, agencies. So I, I hope that uh, whatever you are wishing comes out uh, true very uh, very soon enough. <laughs> so excellent, that is already excellent, in the anvil. That is very that nice. Is already Thank in the you. Anvil. And All the best. Uh, we'll the be best. very happy if we can yeah. have uh, students doing fellowship in infection control with HISI. Yeah, Absolutely. definitely. We have wonderful teachers like you. So uh, an excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sardana. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Nanmani. All the best. <laughs> Professor Harris, would you like to introduce her, please? Yeah. Thank you. I would, I would like to introduce her. I think she's the host. So everybody knows uh, Dr. Fatima Khan. Yeah. She is the associate professor in microbiology, Indian Medical College, uh, Liga. Very active, very energetic, and uh, uh, very busy trying to implement the infection control program in our uh, setting. And I would like to she has got a number of publications and uh, book chapters. I would like to invite her for getting up today. Thank you so much, sir. Actually, this session was to be Dr. Akram Hussain from Bangladesh, our sister country. But because of some unavoidable reasons, he is not available I'm, and I am taking over. Uh, so now I'll be talking about infection prevention and resource. And we always mm -hmm. have the similar problems as our neighboring country. For infection prevention in third country, we must understand what the problems we face. The developing sorry to, so, this is a I'm sorry to interrupt. Am I audible? Ma'am, sorry to ma'am, sorry to interrupt you. Please, uh, your network bandwidth is very low. Please uh, switch off your video so that the voice was clear. Okay, sure. Please start, ma'am. Is it better now? Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes, ma'am. Yeah. 
of every 100 hospitalized patients at any given time, seven in the developed and 10 in the developing countries will acquire at least one healthcare associated infection. Surgical site infection is the leading infection in settings with limited resources, affecting up to one third of the operated patients. And this is, as you can see, up to nine times higher than in the developed countries. The risk of ICU infections is two to three times higher, whereas that of the device-related infections is 13 times higher in the low-income countries. The infection rates in neonate, again, is three to 20 times more than in the high-income countries. So this is the scenario of the low-income and middle-income countries. But what are these low-income and middle-income countries? As we can see, the World Bank has categorized the uh, different countries into low, middle, and high-income nations. The low-income economies are those with gross national income per capita of $995 or less. Low-middle-income economies are those with a gross national income per capita between $996 and $3895. The low-middle-income economies include about 147 countries throughout the world, including Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeastern Europe, and major parts of Asia and Pacific. So the purpose of focusing on this slide is that we and our neighboring countries, we fall in the low-middle-income economies. And if we have a look at the healthcare sector budget of 2021, then despite of the fact that healthcare has been at the center of all policy decisions because of the pandemic that hit all over the world, India is still amongst the countries with lowest public healthcare budget. But still, we have to implement infection prevention and control. And uh, we can follow that we have to move ahead. And uh, I must say that necessity is the mother of creativity, and we Indians are the best at the utilization of resources. So for implementation of any program, the first thing we are supposed to do is to identify our strengths, our weaknesses, utilize our opportunities, and address the threats. We have to do a SWOT analysis. So first, the challenges, the weaknesses. When we talk about the challenges and implementation of IPC practices in uh, settings like ours, we can see there is lack of regulations, or if any regulations they are present, they are not followed properly. There is inadequate IPC practices in most of the uh, low-income countries. The policies they are lacking, guidelines are lacking. Uh, for example, there is lack of antibiotic policies, uh, self-medication, over-the-counter availability of cheap, substandard, counterfeit antimicrobials and unregulated usage all contribute to prevalence of resistance. Maximum number of counterfeit drugs are found in Asia and Africa. A surveillance system, we know that surveillance of healthcare associated infections is the cornerstone of an effective infection prevention program. However, in most of the low and middle, low and middle income economies, there is non-existent surveillance systems. Then overcrowding, there we are always overburdened. The public sector hospitals particularly, we are overburdened with patients. We are, uh, most of the times we are understaffed also. Is, if we see the doctor to patient ratio, we are way behind what is prescribed by WHO of one is to 1000 per individual. We are still behind this target. Then again, a very major hindrance in following any, uh, any program particularly the infection prevention program or any healthcare program is the beliefs and myths of the society. But where there is a will, there is a way. So with this, we move ahead. And if you talk about the uh, considering the infection prevention practices, the World Health Organization has already formulated very crisp and simple guidelines, which are easy to understand and interpret and implement and with which focus on basics of infection prevention. It is a multimodal approach with focus on best utilization of resources actually. And if we see it focuses on education and training, surveillance, monitoring, audit and feedback, and most importantly, an enabling environment for the staff to work. Well-developed uh, well developed national and facility level IPC program is a must uh, as discussed in these WHO guidelines. And there are three essential and fundamental concepts to the program. First is mission statement, which is the reflection of the needs to be addressed by the program. Vision, which describes the future goals of the IPC program for the organization. And core values that serve as the blueprint of the program. 
and indicate how the program functions on daily basis. Then resources. Uh, again, resources for infection prevention and control guidelines. A number of resources they are present nowadays. Authentic guidelines are present with the internet era, which are easily accessible. And recently, a number of online courses by CDC, WHO, IHI, Courseras are being conducted. However, we have to focus, we have to make our own guidelines, we have to customize these resources according to our needs. And in this COVID era, most of us have learned how to customize, how to make our own guidelines. Then another important thing that the WHO focuses about is infection prevention control, education, training, and retraining. Uh, it, most of the hospitals, they have an induction training at the time of, at the time of uh, uh, admission or at the time of when the new staff enters the hospital, but retraining, follow-up trainings are again very important. Then assessment of these trainings again becomes important. And this was one of our major strengths because we don't have to wait for a pandemic or an outbreak to conduct a training. When we were analyzing, doing the SWOT analysis of the, during the COVID times to analyze our strengths and weaknesses, the major strength that we found was that majority of the staff was already sensitized for infection prevention and that helped us in fighting the COVID during the COVID-19 times. Then a good laboratory setup, a microbiology laboratory particularly, is essential for any infection prevention program to be followed. And when we talk about the laboratory practices for infection prevention, then point of care laboratories, they again become very essential because they reduce the decision times and help in the uh, initiation of correct and timely treatment for the patients. And whenever we talk about the POCTs, that is point of care laboratories, the first thing that comes to our mind is sub, uh, a high setup lab with automated PCR machines or uh, rapid, uh, doing rapid uh, diagnostic tests. But I would like to focus that not only the high tech uh, automated laboratories, but we can have a small side labs with the ICUs, with the wards, et cetera, with the clinics, outpatient departments who can perform simple tests like peripheral blood smear, who can tell us the WBC count, the malarial parasite, whether it is present or not, so that the treatment can be start accordingly. Rapid, uh, rapid kits are available for hepatitis B, hepatitis C, HIV. HIV, we have to follow the guidelines, the NACO guidelines. Then, uh, so these uh, CSF direct examination can be done in the side labs. So this helps in initiation of early treatment diagnosis, and ultimately it leads to decrease in the antimicrobial resistance when we start the correct antimicrobials timely. Then monitoring and audit. Audit and feedback generally lead to small, but potentially important improvement in professional practices. And I would like to focus that a feedback and a feed forward cycle is a major tool for positive reinforcement and encourages healthy competition and active participation of the individuals within the healthcare organization so we can build team with incentives. Uh, the, then the WHO also focuses on workload, staffing, and bed occupancy. The WHO workload indicators and staffing needs provides a guide to healthcare managers in planning and distribution, distributing workload according to available manpower and resources. So again, have a look when we have a look at the steps of implementation of IPC program, whether in a resource poor or a resource rich setting, we can see uh, that it is not uh, the resources which are actually required. It is the willpower. It is the motivation to, it is the thought that yes, we have to implement a program. We have to follow a program and then the consistency to go on with it, to carry on with it. So engagement of leadership, the first thing when we implement any program is engagement of the leadership, and it does have a significant impact. When we were, uh, I would like to showcase one uh, research we did, a qualitative thematic analysis of knowledge and practices of surgical antimicrobial prophylaxis in a hospital. We compared the practices and compliance in different departments. And to just show the impact of leadership, the departments which had a strong leadership, the compliance, the knowledge, attitude, they were entirely different among the residents and the faculty of those departments as compared to those where the leadership was not as strong. So leadership does play an important role. And yes, someone was discussing, Dr. Sumi was discussing about uh, uh, the inculcation of uh, these programs uh, 
for the postgraduates. With involving the leadership, we involve the dean with us. The medical superintendent is already a part, the chief medical superintendent and medical superintendent, they're already a part of the uh, hospital infection control committee. But with the dean in our uh, loop, we started the mandatory induction program for the postgraduates so that they, it becomes uh, a culture. Each, each year, this program will be conducted. Then, because since this program was uh, in the early COVID times, it was an online program. We did a follow-up when the COVID, it, it was the cases were down. We did a follow-up hands-on training for all these postgraduates again, and it has become a part of the curriculum now. So we can include the HICC and medical education committees, all the uh, hospitals, all the academic institutions, they have a medical education committee and a HICC committee. We can combine the efforts of both these committees. Uh, then resource assessment and strengthening, uh, development of program and prioritization of just prioritization is very important when we are lack when we lack the resources. We have to identify the priority areas. We we need to identify those who are receptive of change because they can then become examples for others to follow. Then we have to identify the high risk areas also. They are more receptive actually most of the times, like ICUs, OTs. They are always most recept more receptive, and then we can follow. We started auditing in the ICUs for blood culture, for CORTI, and then we can follow in the other areas. Then resource assessment, human resource. This is a power. This is a weakness also that we have, uh, we are overpopulated, but this becomes a power when we talk about human resource. We have plenty of human resource and we can utilize them. Uh, again, uh, we started utilizing our human resources because as most of you know that the, uh, that the microbiology department is considered as the one who has to take the responsibility of infection prevention programs in any hospital. And uh, we are a small limited department with a few faculty members. So it becomes very difficult to conduct a number of trainings to auditing, surveillance, along with our academic work. So we started utilizing the human resource in the hospital, the staff nurses, we started peer tutoring them. And it was uh, during uh, this utilization of these uh, staff nurses and all, we uh, observed that the other staff members, they were more receptive when their peers themselves, they taught them. Because I think there must be some match of ideas or they may be able to communicate better with them in their own language. So uh, this can be uh, again utilized. Uh, then identifying of the outcome indicators. Yes, we have to do surveillance. We have to do audit because which is not documented, we cannot, we have to show them where we stand, then only we can, we have the chance to improve. So we do have opportunities to overcome the implementation of challenges, to overcome the challenges of infection prevention and control in the countries. All we require, the opportunities is that we require a strategic approach, clinical leadership and administrative will. And of course, common sense, sound knowledge of procedures and safe practices. WHO again has given us guidelines for uh, when we are limiting, we have limited resources. So it is all a teamwork. We have to think, we have to start, we have to build teams and then yes, we can do. We have to do more with less and we Indians, we are expert in doing them. And I'm sure we can always do that and we can uh, inspire others also, our neighboring countries. And this is a, a, a quote from uh, Roosevelt, who was the president, American president. And this quote was yesterday quoted by one of our orators, uh, Mr. Dr. Shashank Kale. And I was so impressed, I thought I would put this in my slides also. Do what you can with what you have and where you are. Just take the first step, the further steps will follow. Thank you so much. Uh, th thank you so much, uh, uh, Fatima, uh, for giving a nice uh, presentation with the limited time you had and with the heavy load you have got as an organizing secretary. And uh, you have been doing a good uh, work in infection control in our hospital and uh, very active in teaching and things. And you have given a very good presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. It was an excitement for me to present along with Dr. Meher Rizri and Dr. Sumir Anwani, ma'am, because they have been my teachers always, and you, sir, as the chairperson, Dr. Nita Munchi, ma'am, is there. Thank you so much. Very good, very good, Fatima. And despite the 
the burden that you have of organizing this entire <laughs> conference have it so much going on to prepare a talk as a last minute thing excellent very well <laughs> that done was and very well option. presented thank you so yeah. much thank you very good congratulations all the best Please, back to yes. Okay. Sure. Uh, very interesting topic, designing infection prevention in an era of automation. I think that's going to be a very interesting talk and uh, delivered by Dr. Purva Mathur. Um, she is the Microbiology and Hospital Infection Control Division of Laboratory, heading it at um, the All India Institute of Medical Sciences with a lot of publications to her honor. And uh, she's been honored with several awards and has more than 225 research publications. So um, she's working on several collaborative researches in HAI at AIMS and um, including multi-drug resistance uh, and infection control. And she's obviously a member of the National Task Force for Antimicrobial Stewardship and um, been an active uh, participant with CDC, ICMR, NCDC, so I think um, with such a illustrious career, we look forward to a very interesting talk from Dr. Purva Mathur. Welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. So today we'll be talking about how to design surveillance of healthcare associated infections in the era of automation. So public health surveillance is the ongoing systematic collection, analysis, and interpretation of health related data which is essential to planning, implementation, and evaluation of public health practices. So surveillance basically helps us in getting data which can be used to plan and evaluate the impact of any intervention to prevent uh, or improve a public health practice. So when we talk about healthcare-associated infections, how we can actually apply the surveillance to better our practices that supposing we perform surveillance to identify healthcare associated infections, we analyze the surveillance data to find the potential problems, use the epidemiological investigation techniques against epidemic and endemic HAIs, and implement interventions to protect those at risk. So we can implement preventive bundles to prevent HAIs, and we can see how these preventive bundles or preventive practices are uh, effective against a particular HAIs. When we talk about national health uh, systems, how can surveillance help? Because AMR and HAIs are becoming a public health problem in India, and we know all uh, we all know this. So, um, systematic collection of data on HAIs and its dissemination to st stakeholders can help um, the public health system to estimate the burden of HAIs in terms of cases, deaths, and costs. Also, to detect outbreaks and emerging diseases, evaluate the impact of prevention strategies, and monitor the quality of infection control practices. So, surveillance is basically a circular process. It's not just data collection for the sake of data collection, it is to be used to improve our practice. So, we implement surveillance by defining the goals and surveillance protocol. We start the data collection and then we give feedbacks. To the stakeholders after analyzing the data interpretation comparisons and discussion and based on that data we develop preventive protocols uh, to correct or to prevent the healthcare associated infections and using the same surveillance set tools evaluate the impact of those preventive uh, practices so taking an example of central line associated bsis which we are doing at a network of indian hospitals we have implemented the HAI surveillance protocol in a network hospitals. The data is reported and compiled across the network. The rates are generated and the data systems and they are reviewed by the IPC stakeholders. Supposing we find high CLAPSI rate, we have actually created uh, data oriented preventive practices by using the quality improvement methodology. And then we implement the preventive practices and see the impact of those preventive practices on the rates of CLAPSI. So it's always a circular process. It's not just linear that you keep collecting data uh, and uh, do not use that data for prevention. So how is a network approach uh, helpful for a country like ours? 
Building networks of health facilities that perform surveillance can be very powerful because they give a better estimation of HAI burden. Development of a network level benchmark, which helps to assess performance across hospitals. It enables capacity to evaluate interventions across facilities and establishes a cadre of committed and motivated facilities which act as change agents. But there are also challenges to establishing and maintaining networks because it is difficult to ensure constant surveillance practice as the network grows. There is a constant need for training and mentorship. So continuous workshops and trainings have to be conducted and there are resource limitations. So healthcare facilities have to ultimately try to make it self-sustaining. So we started um, HAI surveillance at the trauma center of Ames uh, almost 12 to 13 years back in a manual mode. So every patient in our hospital was under the ambit of our HAI surveillance. So for each patient, uh, a hospital infection nurse um, would go to the bedside and fill this 10 page performer in which the face sheet, the first page included the basic demographics and whether the patient had any central line or ventilator and what was the fever, uh, etc. Then um, we took the CDC's definition and we made these forms to conform with these definitions. So every patient was visited and it was a yes no kind of entry where the HICN would enter date wise whether the patient had all these parameters for defining a case as a VAP, a central line associated BSI, or a urinary tract infection. We also developed a formula for implementation of um, um, bundles for prevention of central lines and ventilator associated pneumonia and for each day uh, each patient was monitored whether the bundle was compliant or not then the antibiotics which were being given to the patients were recorded but we found that this was a very labor or manpower intensive exercise because uh, of course, data entry required, required visitation of each patient, but uh, the compilation of report or the generation of data into a meaningful database uh, where you can give feedbacks to the healthcare um, authorities and to the unit in charges was very, very cumbersome. So it was then that we put a proposal to ICMR for development of the first automated uh, HAI surveillance uh, system. Uh, in a public health uh, sector like AIMS. So we developed this uh, surveillance software for HAIs through funding from ICMR. And this was um, a landmark event because it really uh, changed our perspective on how to do HAI surveillance. So our software had an administrative interface and a user interface, which were linked because the administrative interface, uh, which this is the pay sheet of the software, which we developed at um, from a center of AIMS. So all the kind of samples which were received in the lab were already fed into the database, the various organisms um, which we see in microbiology, uh, the breakpoints for antimicrobials based on the updated CLSI guidelines, the common commands for microbiology that are given. And so at the end of the month, it was very easy to understand uh, and assess how many samples came from each clinical area. What was the distribution of organisms? How many were gram positive and gram negative? Which is um, otherwise very resource intensive. We do it manually. Then the distribution of samples, which come either monthly or quarterly, whatever selection you decide upon, and the antibiograms becomes very easy. The distribution of organism across a period, which you can select yourself whether you want a monthly report or a quarterly report. And we also had a system where for each ward and ICU, how many uh, antimicrobials were administered uh, so that we had an idea of the quantum of antimicrobials being given to the patient. So uh, everything that we were recording manually was put into automation. So this was the face sheet for the device associated infection entry module, whether the patient had any lines or ventilator, it was a yes, no kind of a thing entry. Then uh, for ventilator associated pneumonia, again, a drop down menu of yes or no, whether the patient had these findings and for fever and WBC, an absolute entry was recorded. Similarly, for central line associated BSIs and for catheter asso associated UTI, it was a simple drop down menu kind of entry. We also had, uh, automated the uh, compliance to preventive bundle, uh, which helped us in, you know, uh, assessing whether mm, the patient was compliant for 
implementation of a preventive mandal. So at the end of the month, it was very easy to collate how many episodes of VAP or CLAPSIS or COTID occurred in a particular ICU. And so it was easy to um, generate report and disseminate the report in terms of the number of VAP uh, or the incidence of VAP, BSI and UTI per thousand device days, the rates of surgical site infections and compliance to preventive bundles. So we found that um, during the initial three years, this uh, cycle of surveillance feedbacks in education had a tremendous impact in reducing the rates of device associated infection. So you can see that we started with a very high rate of uh, all the three device associated infections, the VAP and CLAP season 40s. But we found that this surveillance itself, along with feedback and dissemination, helped in reducing the rates of um, all these device associated infections. And it also increased the rates of hand hygiene and the preventive bundles. Uh, from 2015, we started on a national level uh, network for healthcare associated infection, which is being jointly coordinated by AIMS, ICMR, and CDC. And the NCDC has also, uh, a couple of hospitals from NCDC have also joined this network. And many sites uh, have joined this network through using their Swachta Action Plan funds and also through voluntary participation. So currently, this is the distribution of hospitals who are enrolled with us uh, in our surveillance uh, system, which, uh, which actually is um, present in almost all the states of India. As late as uh, the May of 2021, this has been a direction given to all uh, state health secretaries that uh, guidance may be taken for all states for uh, surveillance of healthcare associated infections from this network which is being run by AIMS and this is the website www.haisindia.com. So this is how our surveillance software looks in which all the SOPs and the forms are uploaded so anybody can access it um, and all the training powerpoints are also uploaded but the data entry is only accessible to those hospitals who have been trained and who are uh, participating in this network. So you can see in the download center, all the PowerPoints have been uploaded. So any center can actually uh, see how we are doing this training. This software helps us in you know um, analytics at our hospital level and also at a network level. And all data is uh, protected. So and no hospitals can see uh, the data of the other hospitals. Uh, we only collate network level data. So this is how we can see the distribution of BSIs and UTIs, the CLAPC rates for 1,000 center line days, uh, the number of organisms which are seen either from BSIs or UTIs, and how the rates, the trend analysis becomes very easy. This is how. Uh, the cases are actually entered and they are all coded. Uh, we have held almost 10 workshops till now under the AGs of CDC, ICMR and NCDC in which um, uh, more than 1000 people have been trained on how to do healthcare associated infection surveillance. And as I mentioned, uh, data quality is very important. So we need constant trainings and retraining. So we do these site visits understand the challenges and give deep pressure trainings when we do site visits uh, uh, for all the hospitals who are enrolled in our network. We have also actually started uh, surgical site infection surveillance, which is slightly different from other device associated infections because here the patient goes back home and the patient has to be followed till at least a month after discharge from the hospital. So we, have, we started this uh, under ICMR in three hospitals uh, including some major surgeries and we have developed a software uh, using the NHSN definition in which each patient is followed uh, till uh, uh, 90 days after discharge from the hospital. And all this data is entered uh, in the software and um, the data analysis is done. So, um, and uh, this is the trial module. So all the names which, which have been shown in the software uh, are not the original names but because of confidentiality we have made a dummy format and so these are all the dummy names that we have uh, shown here uh, we have also started uh, surveillance for surgical site infections uh, for cesarean sections under the 
AGs of uh, ICMR, AIMS, uh, and CDC, in which uh, cesarean section surgical site infections uh, are being uh, surveilled using a non microbiological definition, which is simple to implement. So, this is again a test uh, software in which um, the data is being entered, and again, it helps in analysis of the data. So, this is uh, how the software looks and um, it's easy to operate. So uh, for healthcare associated infections, um, through this presentation, um, I would say that any hospital who is interested in joining this network can actually communicate to us, write to us, and we can give training and help you in establishing uh, surveillance. Uh, and it will actually help you in your own data analysis and its dissemination to the stakeholders and it will help in prevention of healthcare associated infections in your hospitals. Um, thank you so much uh, for this. Thank you, Dr. Purva, for an excellent uh, presentation. And I'm so glad that you've offered it on the platform that any hospital can approach you and uh, can avail of this automated uh, surveillance program. I have just one question to ask that um, who at the, apart from the ICNs who take their rounds, is there any other people who are involved in collecting the data at ward levels? Because yours is a really a big hospital. So how do you implement it? Who are the people involved in, um, have you given iPads or notepads to all the staff to, um, in uh, you know include all the data and do the surveillance regularly how do you go about it if you can just tell us briefly dr purva dr purva can you hear i think she is not on oh okay Dr. Purba is not in the platform. Oh, okay. Okay. Fine. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Garima. She is an associate professor, uh, Department of Microbiology, Gandhi Medical College, Bhopal. She has collaborated with John Hopkins University uh, and is included in various projects, numerous publications in various international and national index journals. Uh, she has supervised many thesis, MD thesis and ISMR STS projects. I would like to invite uh, Dr. Barima to give us. Thank you, sir. I hope I'm audible. Yeah, you're thank, thank you, sir. So good afternoon, audience. I'll take this session further by clearing doubts and controversies along with our speakers on the administrative attributes of infection prevention program. As we all know, effective infection prevention program is central in high quality healthcare for patients and for provide a safe working environment to all the healthcare professionals working therein. Hence, infection prevention must be made a priority in any setting where healthcare is delivered. So those with primary administrative oversight must ensure sufficient fiscal and human resources are available to develop and maintain infection prevention and occupational health programs. Hence, the administrator should ensure availability of sufficient and appropriate equipment and supplies necessary for the consistent observation of standard precautions, including the hand hygiene products, safe injection equipment and personal protective equipment. The key attributes for an effective infection prevention and control program are as given by John Hopkins Medicine Institute are that the program must acquire and retain the following attributes. It should have designated staff member who is responsible and accountable for infection prevention control at the facility. Should have competent IPC leaders with appropriate training and education should have formal authority granted to the IPC program, a tangible support from the leadership, 
adequate resources for IPC activities and partnerships with the key stakeholders and the frontline healthcare workers. And also there should be effective communication about the infection prevention program. The administrative statements or orders should be issued to formally recognize the authority of IPC staff to enforce the IPC policies and procedures. Such administrative statements may include official endorsement of the facilities IPC program, IPC program organizational structure at the facility level should be as per the national guidelines and the roles and authority of the program staff to perform designated duties like to conduct surveillance and respond to outbreaks of epidemiological significance, to implement antimicrobial stewardship programs, to develop, implement and update facility IPC policies as per the national guidelines, to initiate surveillance of healthcare associated infections and prevention and control measures to reduce the risk of healthcare associated infections to notify the regulatory authorities for any potential outbreak of infectious disease of public health concern, to provide technical updates and competency-based trainings to healthcare workers on a regular basis, and also to ensure the availability of resources for IPC programs. As we all know, WHO has given some core components for IPC programs, which are evidence-based guidelines, education and training, surveillance, monitoring, audit and feedback, and in an enabling environment, along with multimodal strategies, workload staffing and bed occupancy, built environment, materials and equipment. These components should be supported by implementation facilities. The implementation resources should be there. A, there should be a practical manual to support the implementation of core components. There should be assessment tools to support baseline and follow-up assessment. There should be academic publications to convince senior managers and leaders. And there should be videos explaining the core components and leaderships in IPC. There should be advocacy videos on IPC, healthcare-associated infections, and antimicrobial resistance. The key roles defined by WHO for IPC focal person are development, implementation, coordination, and evaluation of the program, development and support of implementation of IPC at the facility level and at the district level, liaison with relevant hospital district departments to ensure integration of IPC activities, development, updating, and management of IPC strategies, guidelines, and all tools and resources, auditing and monitoring of the progress of the plans, and development of surveillance systems with epidemiologists and the team, interpretation and communication of data on infrastructure and the process and practice indicators for decision makers, sustainability through training, awareness raising among public and healthcare professionals, and advice about the IPC supplies, their technical specification and the procurement systems. So, CDC has hence laid down some recommendation to be followed by the administrators and the leaders of healthcare organization. The administrators should invest in an organizational culture that prioritizes safety and occupational infection prevention and control, and regularly review organizational information about the risks, exposures, and illnesses with occupational health services. The administrators should dedicate one or more persons with appropriate authority and training to lead occupational infection prevention and control services, and they should provide sufficient resources in the form of sufficient expertise, funding, staff, supplies, and information technology to implement the elements of occupational infection prevention and control. Also, they should oversee and include occupational health services leaders in performance measurement and continuous quality improvement activities for occupational health prevent, protection and control program. The occupational health service leaders and the staff should also follow the recommendations. They have to promote an organizational culture with consistent focus on safety and occupational infection prevention. They should develop a service program which is tailored to the needs of the healthcare personnel and the environment in which they are working. And then they should develop, review and update when, when necessary the written policies and procedures that adhere to the federal, state and the local requirements for elements of occupational infection prevention and control. 
they should also inform all the healthcare personnel and relevant healthcare organization departments about the occupational infection prevention policies and procedures which are involved they can collaborate with appropriate healthcare departments and individual to achieve compliance with regulations related to occupational infection prevention develop infectious disease emergency outbreak management plans monitor performance measures set and meet quality improvement goals and periodically assess the effectiveness of the services hence to summarize the key administrative recommendations put by cdc to develop and maintain infection prevention and occupational health program are to assure availability of sufficient and appropriate supplies necessary for adherence to standard precaution the hand hygiene products personal protective equipments safe injection equipments should be in sufficient supplies one must assure at least one individual with training in infection prevention is regularly available to manage the facilities infection prevention program and there should be developed written infection prevention policies and procedures appropriate for the services provided by the facility based upon evidence guidelines regulation or standard for example if there is a ambulatory surgical center which performs on site sterilization of reusable surgical devices that is expected to have a detailed policy regarding the devices reprocessing and sterilization okay so with this background i move over to the question answer session for our esteemed faculty members over to the speakers uh respected dr meher rizvi ma'am yes very much good afternoon afternoon ma'am uh ma'am a question for you is uh, why is the multimodal approach most effective for infection prevention program that's a good question garima and i'm very happy that who and cdc and everybody has brought me this perspective because you know the, the idea is to see the end product in mind i we are deeply committed we're all very passionate about infection control and we're going about developing a guideline and we have the teaching in place and we motivated the staff and they're all raring to go and then uh, what we find i'm talking about the small centers i'm not talking about the big tertiary care hospitals i'm talking about say the district hospital or a small uh, nursing home where they may not be at that moment a water supply or they may not be uh, electricity at that time or they may not be hand sanitizer so despite the campaigns you know i've sold it i've trained my staff i've got the leadership on my side they're saying yes you go ahead and i'm with you so with the education when i'm doing the training they're there with me they're there with us but then when we actually come to the act of actually performing that particular intervention and i find that things are not in place and that's where the multimodal component comes in when they say you start looking at the build it right as well so get the things in place while you're getting everything together that is the building and the selling and doing the initial surveillance we need to have the end point in mind that is are the things in place before i start at because otherwise it's just you know the beginning of the end of the program so the leadership commitment which i'm so happy has really come in and with a very empathetic point of view from who where they've understood our limitations and they've come up with a very sympathetic empathetic set of uh, guidelines for us so we have the backing of our of our leadership of our national government hopefully and then we really build on it and we deliver the goods so multimodal which says build it right is where you know it really comes into the process and now for example i've done the audit and i want my leadership to have a look at the surveillance and the audit but my leadership has no time and they can cannot see where are the problems so the leadership again comes in both with the interest in the process how are we delivering the goods are we where are the problems and are they with us at that point so this becomes a very effective way of implementing ipc guidelines and i'm very happy that this has really come up and we can say that we need a share of the budget otherwise you know it was like we we were quite uh, hesitant we had a very dependent group of people and we can come up and say that this is our right and it's been mandated and you give it so that we give good quality patient care it's not for us it's for the patients and they are our uh, stakeholders they are the people we working for so i feel as i'm happy to ask this question and i hope this goes down with the with the 
required set of people that we need the wherewithal, the environment, the infrastructure, the staffing. For example, I may have everything, you know, I have the hand, I have the water, I have the sanitation, I have everything in place for CLAPC, and yet I am overworked. I don't have the time to actually do a whole lot of things. So then how do I get things in place? So we need adequate work workload, adequate staffing, a sympathetic idea, not just a sympathetic, but a practical idea of how things work in the on the floor. Once we know that, so we need the leadership there on the floor. We need the politicians actually check out what's happening there. And then we'll get a very reasonable uh, healthcare uh, de delivery with the funds, et cetera. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ma'am, another question which I have for you is, can you ma'am suggest some cost saving or waste minimizing measures which we can implement in the infection control program? Yeah, Garima, again, this is something where, you know, our smaller hospitals will, uh, be, will do need to look into that because otherwise it becomes very uh, difficult to really implement an IPC. So the first thing is, uh, are we inappropriately doing intramuscular or, uh, or intravenous injections? Are we inappropriately giving antibiotics? What about the indwelling devices? Are they really needed over there? And then, you know, there's some people, especially on the clinical side, they love to ask, you know, are you checking the environment? Are you swabbing our environment to see how much MRSA there is or ESBL there is? There is absolutely no need for this. We need to practice universal precautions, standard precautions. Of course, we need to keep it clean, but do we really need disinfectants to do all that? Do we need fumigation so that they say, you know, you keep our environment clean and we will look after the patient? Well, that's not really where uh, we need to target. So what we would recommend is that what you have in place, if you have soap and water, please start using the soap and water. And of course, if you have a hand sanitizer, put it in your pocket. And what I always say is if the system cannot provide hand sanitizer to you, please buy one because those three steps are going to protect you and your family. So why not invest in yourself as well while you're working you know, in, in the healthcare facility? So many, many ways, education, some people say it's a low cost, I say it's a no cost effort and you're getting such a good organizational climate out of it. Uh, another interesting thing is, you know, a vaginal examination in a, in a lady in labor. Do we really need to do as many examinations are we doing? Is it really needed? Are we following the bundles? Are we really putting, if we have the bundles, are we following it? I mean, is, are we really instituting all that? Suppose in a person with mechanical ventilation, is he at 45 degrees centigrade or not? So if we can just institute what is possible in our center, I believe we can do a whole lot of changes in uh, reducing infection uh, rates in our hospitals. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for the answer. Thank you very much. Lovely interesting. Uh, uh, now, my next question is for Dr. Sumi Nandwani, ma'am. Ma'am, uh, what are your suggestions for better implementation of hospital infection control program in educational academic institutes? So, yeah, Garima, I guess uh, this is a very, very imperative uh, question. How to finally have the implementation of the program? You have everything in place. You have the guidelines in place. You have the manual in place. You probably have the team also in place but then you are not able to effectively implement everything what is being said and taught to you. So as again, I'll go by my personal experiences. Uh, I was a nodal officer for biomedical waste management uh, committee in my previous institute of work of place. And uh, however hard I taught to try to teach, I used to keep frequent training sessions personally and my team and my PG students, but we were not able to effectively implement things in place unless uh, unless and until we had inspections from central pollution control board and dpcc and then when a top down approach is what i sincerely sincerely recommend uh, in the sense that only when top leadership was involved and they were worried that they will get a show cause notice by the pollution control board or they need to remove the non compliances uh, otherwise their licenses will be uh, taken away that is what worked that is what helped us finally have things in place, a little bit in place, not exactly totally in place, especially in resource constraint areas where the nodal officer or the team is just, uh, or the microbiologist, most of the places we have microbiologists heading the uh, team. Uh, here in uh, another institute, I would like to again give an example. Uh, another institute, they had made 
me the chairperson of the hospital infection control committee and it took me a lot of effort i had to actually produce guidelines by who and ministry of health wherein they suggested no the instead of microbiologist the administrator of the top management should be the chairperson because to get things done from the civil department electrical department or let's say housekeeping staff or the nursing uh, staff you need that power and that power lies with the administrators so top down approach and some kind of uh, monitoring or inspections like for waste management we were fortunate that we had inspections by in infection control uh, boards or committees dpcc similarly uh, for infection control i really suggest i don't know where and what forum maybe he see can take it up with the political administrators if we have some kind of body regulating or inspecting whether the infection control uh, guidelines are in place or not whether it is being done in place or not whether the administrators or the hospital management is putting enough funds and providing us with personnel we don't have a full time hospital infection control nurse in our institute we don't have a single full time hospital infection control nurse in our institute for the simple reason that clinic they have multiple the limited staff which we have is having multiple roles and unless the management uh, gives the staff or puts in funds and puts uh, puts in effort and they will do so only when there is a committee or a board or uh, some uh, body looking after that whether they are being implemented or not so top down approach is certainly recommended for any institute whether it is an educational or a non educational institute thank you thank you madam thank you so much uh, my next question is for dr fatima khan dr fatima hi garima hello what measures do you suggest hi, to overcome what measures do you yeah. suggest to overcome the limited diagnostic facilities available at low middle income countries so that an effective infection control program can function okay thank you so much karima actually i think we were discussing that in the presentation also that we have to prioritize our resources we have to identify the priority areas like icus etc and uh, again in the phase manner we can then take up uh, those diagnostic facilities and secondly uh, communication is the key we need to communicate whatever tests we are doing we communicate it to the clinician so that the effective intervention is then taken for the patients after the tests are done because otherwise if we do the tests and we keep it to ourselves then it is of no use i think i may <laughs> yeah yes you answered it well. thank you okay. thank you so much thank you so thank much you. uh next question is for respected purva mathur ma'am ma'am are you there dr purva mathur uh she is not there live okay she is not there okay 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 thank you so much i think with this we can end up the session may i ask I'm... one question from <laughs> dr sameen anwani ah ha, definitely <laughs> because we are also a teaching hospital and we face a lot uh, difficulties like what do you suggest for uh, like you were talking about a hospital in which you worked they had a number of courses paramedical courses diploma ot etc there are a number of students who are supposed to go to the ot to learn but if you don't let them into the ot then uh, they don't learn and if we let them Uh, give the permission to be inside the OD, then it increases the number of people overcrowding. And we can't do that. I'm sorry. Whom have you addressed this question to? Ma'am, you. <laughs> okay. Okay. Sorry, I miss. Uh, I did not hear that. So I guess again, um, there has to be some norm. you can only allow a definite number of people inside the particular area but that should not deter you from uh, having or distributing the knowledge base uh, incentivizing in some way for example we had a role play a small role play in covid we it was very difficult to motivate our staff to uh, to carry on these infection control practices or the regular practices so we did a very very small local level departmental level Uh, activity 
wherein we did a role play we distributed them into two teams one team uh, both the teams were given a similar uh, similar uh, thing to do they had to pretend that they are getting a sample from a patient of covid and they were supposed to follow all uh, procedures uh, related to infection control and procedures related to processes um, they had to imitate whether uh, that they are processing as they are doing in the lab and then uh, the other team was told to identify the mistakes they made and whichever team won we gave all of them we gave both the teams some prizes but we gave a little better prize to the team who which won so this was a very small exercise you don't need to actually do that thing we just had a role play wherein they imitate uh, they uh, they mimicked whether they, they were processing a covid sample received uh, right from uh, re, uh, rece- uh, they, uh, from interacting with the patient there was a person who was taking the sample uh, communicating to the patient that yes we are taking a sample for you the way the sample was taken whether the doffing and donning was done or not whether all the infection control measures were taken or not so they were there was a team which was judging the participants and uh, the, the winning team got the prize so it was a very simple thing which we did at a local level hardly took us uh, i guess we spent around 2000 rupees that's it <laughs> at the departmental level so things can be done you need not actually go to a particular situation and hands on do the things No, just the thought which I had, which I thought I'd share, is that you know the guards can play a very big role in starting the day well. For example, when a doctor or a nurse comes in and and the guard says, you know, Jai Ho, uh, Swastha Sinani, or Jai Ho, Infection Control Warrior, rather than saying, you know, Good morning, Good afternoon, so that gives a very interesting way of beginning the day. And the guards can actually hand over the. I mean, I we in, when I was in JNMC, the guard in the ICU was a very proactive gentleman. and he would actually give the hand sanitizer to the people going and we can use a whole lot of such people who understand who who need a bigger purpose in life than just being a guard and if you see new amsterdam there's a very interesting serial going on and where they using a lot of people who are not fully employed and who are there and they have a genius and they have a creativity so what we done in jnmc was we were also using all our anatomy uh, staff physiology staff biochemistry because they're great communicators and they have time on their hands and when dr haris m khan cannot do all the supervision we are the adjuncts and we are there in the hospital and we are serv- doing a surveillance of sorts you know a process surveillance can be done so if we utilize our staff well with lot of imagination and empathy i think we can do a whole lot of stuff with without and without the required team which we of course always talking about and jnmc staff was amazing you know we had this absolute uh, passion with which everybody came out and did it and i'm telling you that it works excellently so don't be limited to the microbiology laboratory start thinking of all the other healthcare staff which you have on your hands who need to be active clinical members and they can be very active clinical members as far as infection prevention control is concerned starting with the guard i uh, totally agree in fact in my own complex we did that small practice we distributed uh, small hand sanitizers to the guards with the involvement of bomb and the guards uh, were telling every visitor to use that and uh, of course the uh, they were also incentivized in the sense that every month one guard in one uh, the whole complex was uh, named the best uh, personnel on staff duty because he was following all the procedures Yes. So just incentivizing small incentives can True. go along with and even the educators you know then you use them as assessors they can be involved in the surveillance because the checklists are so effective so good so that anybody who has a clinical background can become an excellent assessor and which of course the government uh, the state governments are doing and we in the in the big public uh, tertiary health healthcare centers or private centers can do it for others and we can i think if we start doing intra institution bonding inter institution bonding i think a whole lot of positive energy will come out of that as well we will uh, okay. conclude now because i think for the next session we are going behind time uh, thank you very much for the very interesting uh, presentation we were given by the different speakers thank you so much Thank you so much sir take care you, sir. it was a pleasure to be with you there. thank you
Thank you, Dr. Neeta. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. A very interesting session. Okay. Thank you to all the speakers. Lovely meeting you, ma'am and sir. Take Thank care, Fatima. Thank and you, and, and have a nice day, all of you. Bye-bye. Yeah. All the best. Good afternoon, esteemed chairpersons, speakers, and participants. It's an honor to welcome our chairpersons for this session. Dr. Pradija Goswami, Professor and Head of Microbiology, the Gujarat Cancer Research Institute, Civil Hospital, Ahmedabad. She is uh, interested in studying immunocompromised patients specialist life she has a lifetime achievement and oration award in microbiology at the state level conference she had award and facilitation on international women's day for working as front line worker 2021 establishing covid laboratory within 24 hours and also was awarded by z24 hours shakti maha Samman 2021 there was a live relay through Gujarat TV network on 8 March 2020 about the achievement. A very congratulations for them. And I also also went to welcome our very own our dynamic Professor Tamkeen Khan, our faculty of obstetric and gynecology, JNMC interview. She has 28 years of experience in teaching and has guided 30 MD, MS, and PhD degrees. She has more than 100 papers published in various chapters, and, and various chapters she has published in various books. Also, mentioning her achievements is like showing a lamp to the sun. So I will not mention all of them because of the restraint of time, and welcome our chairpersons to continue the session further with introducing our speakers. Over to you, ma'am. Shall I? Yes, Dr. Panza, please. Yeah, Dr. Tamkin. So, uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, uh, can I have the introduction of the speaker? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, in the uh, schedule, it is Dr. Gagandeep Kang. So, is it changed? Yes, ma'am. Yes, not Dr. Ravi. Okay, okay. <laughs> uh, sorry, I was not informed. So, I know Dr. Ravi very well. We had been meeting in most of the conferences. And uh, he is a nodal officer for genomic sequencing of SARS in Karnataka. And I think on the first day, we heard a lot about his, uh, you know, achievements, uh, not going uh, into the details of all, uh, just, uh, you know, highlighting that he's an S.P. Agarwal Award winner and H.I. Jala Award, uh, Award in IAMM. And he is a, a member of the Karnataka COVID-19 Task Force, and he's a technical advisor. So, Dr. Ravi, I invite you for uh, uh, speaking on the human prion disease. Uh, actually, all of us know that this is a neuro uh, degenerative disorder. And of course, he's working in the same field. So, he's the much, uh, uh, you know, uh, expert in this uh, talk, uh, talking on the preventing prion infections in healthcare facilities. Dr. Ravi. Thank you, Dr. Parijat. Uh, very nice to meet you after many years online. I know, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, what I will do in the next uh, uh, 15 minutes is to probably uh, share some basic facts about prion diseases and uh, then we can discuss the in detail the uh, ways that it is prevented. Uh, I am a stand-in for Dr. Gagandeep. Uh, morning uh, 
there was an SOS call from Dr. Raman Saldana asking me to cover this topic. So since I never say no to him, I stepped in and took this responsibility. What I will do in the uh, is give you a brief history and uh, definition of prions because they are not conventional agents. Talk on the structure, biology replication, epidemiology, clinical features, diagnosis, and then end with prevention and control. Uh, prions are, are uh, biologically, uh, I should say, revolutionary organisms because they border between life and living and the non-living. Uh, in fact, they got the area of prions got two Nobel Prizes. The first one went to Carlton Gadgesek in 1976 for proving that Kuru is a slow virus disease that is transmissible. And uh, Kuru is a disease of cannibalism seen in uh, tribals in Peru. I have a very close uh, uh, connection with Dr. Carlton Gadgesek because uh, he visited Nimhans in 1982 and he was the one who suggested to start a separate department of virology. So in many ways, he is the forefather of our <laughs> department. And the department was started uh, uh, in 1985, three years after his visit. And it was inaugurated in 86 by Baruch Blumberg, another Lombonorate who discovered hepatitis B. And it's a matter of coincidence that Carlton Gadusek and Baruch Blumberg shared the Nobel Prize the same year in 1976, one for hepatitis and the other for slow virus. The second person who did a lot of work, who took Carlton Gadusek's work forward and then uh, showed that uh, the organisms are proteinaceous infectious particles and did a lot of work on the replication and biology is Stanley Prusiner. Now, Stan Prusiner got the Nobel Prize in 1997. This is one of the very rare things in history that the same area has received two Nobel Prizes. Now, while Gadusek shared it with Blumberg, Prusiner got it all alone. Whenever Nobel Prize is not shared, it is given for a very profound, very profound fundamental biological discovery and I think Stanley Prusiner is the one who showed that prions are uh, self-replicating proteins because it challenged the existing dogma of biology. Dogma of biology is DNA and RNA is the essence of life. Now here is a molecule that can replicate but does not have nucleic acid in its constitution. So it's an acronym for proteinaceous infectious particles. The name is prion and I reiterate no nucleic acid and non degradable by normal sterilization. Uh, they were first identified in spongiform encephalopathies in the late, uh, uh, in the 50s. Uh, Kuru was one of the spongiform encephalopathies. Uh, spongiform encephalopathies get their name because all of them on autopsy, when you do the, the section of the brain and look at it under the microscope by hematoxin and eosin staining, the neurons are destroyed and only glia are there. So it gives an appearance of a sponge. I've shown you a picture of a CJD spongiform encephalopathy from Nimhans. All spongiform encephalopathies have uh, characteristic features of loss of motor control, dementia, paralysis, encephalitis, and widespread neuron loss. Now, spongiform encephalopathies can be either hereditary or they can be uh, inherited or uh, they can be genetic. Now, prions are infectious proteins. In fact, they are misfolded proteins. So if you look at their structure, uh, every human cell has a normal prion protein, which is shown on the left here. Uh, it's called normal PRPC. That's, it's a normal protein found on the surfaces of many cells, including neurons. 
It is 209 amino acid long. It is about 30 to 35 kilodaltons um, in uh, molecular weight. It is uh, it has low uh, pro resistance to protease. It has low resistance to heat, and uh, it does not aggregate. This is the normal prion protein. It has these alpha helix loops in its structure. There are four alpha helix loops. Now, again in biology, for the first time, just an alteration in the structure of the same protein makes this a disease protein. What happens is these alpha helices become beta chains and they become four different beta chains and that is called the prion scrapey protein. Scrapey was the first prion disease discovered in sheep. They scrape their body against a wall because they have itchy skin and that's how it's called scrapey. And the first protein identified was the scrapey protein. So PRPSC means scrapey protein. It is essentially the same molecular weight, same number of amino acids. But because the, the protein folding is altered, it is highly resistant to proteases. It's highly resistant to heat. Most importantly, it acquires the property of catalytically converting normal protein into disease protein. A very interesting mechanism of replication. Now, electron microscopic structure, this is the normal uh, prion protein. This is the scrapey prion protein. And scrapey prion, once it forms a scrapey prion protein in cells, it tends to aggregate into filaments. And these filaments are shown in the panel C here on the, on the right. So that is what actually kills neurons because these accumulate in. Now, this, uh, this prion protein, as you can see, the last column on the right, it has very different chemical properties compared to conventional infectious agents. They are uh, susceptible to certain uh, types of concentrated phenols, SDS, urea, alkali, uh, such as uh, sodium hydroxide. In fact, that's one of the methods that by which it's inactivated. They, they are not susceptible to nucleases and uh, the scrapey protein is susceptible to trypsin and proteinase. And coming to the, the uh, disinfection sterilization, they resist almost all forms of normal disinfection and sterilization. Uh, they are the methods that are effective are incineration. S sterilization is 130 degrees two degrees centigrade, not 121 degrees, the 20 minutes that we do normally to kill bacteria, fungi, viruses, and spores. You require autoclaving at 132 degrees centigrade for one to four hours. One molar sodium hydroxide for one hour. Sodium hypochlorite, 2%, very high concentration for one hour. Certain specific phenolics are used and formic acid. Such a, such a toxic agent uh, uh, is required at 96% for one hour for histological samples. So remember, prions are different compared to other infectious organisms. And since we are in hospital infection control, we should remember that whenever a known case of prion uh, CJD or something is admitted in the hospital, you really have to have a different protocol for disinfection and sterilization. How do they replicate? The once an extraneous infected prion protein enters a cell, it will combine with normal prion protein within the cell and convert it into the abnormal protein. Now this cycle goes on at a slow pace and this takes several years and once more prion scrapey protein is accumulated, it forms filaments like the, you see in the inset here, that you'll see that uh, uh, the, the filaments are the ultimate ones that actually block the uh, uh, cells and die. So going on to the epidemiology and clinical features, prions cause diseases in animals and humans. In animals, they call bovine spongiform encephalopathy. The first disease discovered was in scrapey in goats. Then it was described in minks. It produces a chronic disease, a fatal disease in mink. 
mink and transmissible mink and cephalopathy, and of course, chronic wasting di disease of the deer and elk. Then, of course, you also have the bovine spongiform encephalopathy, which is, occurs in cattle. In humans, you have various diseases described because of prions, Kuruk, Krufeld Jakob disease, fetal familial insomnia, and Gertzman Strassler syndrome. In fact, the human diseases are classified epidemiologically as infectious, sporadic, and familial. Infectious meaning this is a transmissible encephalopathy. It does not occur de novo. Kuru is an example. Bovine spongiform encephalopathy, uh, which many of us are familiar because it occurred during our lifetime. Kuru was uh, probably earlier to our lifetime because it was in the late 50s. And Kuru was a disease of cannibalism. And people who had the disease, Kuru means tremors literally in the, in the uh, Papua New Guinea language. And they used to have a ceremony of eating the dead body. And the women would do the dissections and the women and children would eat the brain because they are considered very uh, important in that community. And so they had a lot of Kuru. Bovine spongiform encephalopathy uh, is a disease where the cattle in the mid-80s were fed with the offal of sheep and uh, uh, the remains of sheep brain and spinal cord. Being a vegetarian, they were forced to eat non-vegetarian protein and they developed disease. Sporadic encep uh, the encephalopathies are CJD. This occurs due to mutations, and these mutations occur de novo in the, in the human genome, in this prion gene, and results in disease. Now, familial is gutsman strassler syndrome. If you look at the age distribution of uh, these diseases, you can see the variant CJD is the bovine spongiform encephalopathy, which was transmitted to humans, especially people who had ate large number of uh, large amount of contaminated beef in the early 19s. I lived through this epidemic in Scotland in 95-96. And the conventional sporadic CJD occurs usually in the sixth to seventh decade, whereas the, uh, the mad cow disease is more a younger disease. Uh, epidemiologically, one to two new cases per million uh, individuals per, uh, per year across the entire population. It accounts for one in 7,000 deaths per year in uh, United States. Now, Scrapey, I will not go into. The, the acquired prion diseases are Kuru. As I said, it's a cannibalistic disease. It is now not there because that was Gadusek's contribution in 50s. Once cannibalism was stopped, it was uh, this disease vanished from the earth. But we do have iatrogenic CDs. And being a hospital infection uh, conference, I would like to say that transplants and surface electrodes, when people do EEG intraoperative, they are, if they are kept on a CJD brain and then the normal disinfected and then put in another brain, it is known to transmit. Corneal grafts are known to transmit. So organ trans, blood transfusion, especially in the 80s, in the United Kingdom, people who, who had prion disease but no clinical manifestation donated blood and scapy protein was given to vegetarians and that's how we know these are some of the iatrogenic methods of CJD. Now, mad, mad, I told you that bovine spongiform encephalopathy devastated the British economy because the beef was their major source of revenue. And it is estimated more than a million cattle were uh, destroyed. Now, characteristically, this is seen in younger people between 20s and 30s. It has a longer duration. It has psychiatric and sensory symptoms. And it is usually a very characteristic picture on MRI. In fact, that brings us to the point that different uh, uh, prion diseases affect different parts of the brain. The mad cow disease has a predilection for the brainstem, whereas the familial fatal insomnia 
is has a uh, predilection for the thalamus and the cjd is more a global cortex disease now so uh, the kuru and the gusman stortner syndrome very characteristically these people have a waddling gait and that is because the cerebellum is involved how do you diagnose uh, prion diseases uh, clinically using an eeg you will detect periodic complexes mri shows typical lesions atrophy of the brain is very prominent and depending on the lesions in the various regions i mentioned you can uh, suspect prion diseases there are some four or five cs of base tests these are not uh, full proof one of them is a real time quaking induced conversion assay where uh, in the lab they take the proteins and they uh, detect the uh, the specifically the prion scrapie protein there are others based on western blot now these tests all have limitations the best among these is the rt qic uh, test in, on csf of course brain biopsy is the ultimate diagnosis for confirmation but it is not possible in every but it is used as the ultimate weapon so you have to open the skull and get the brain and then show the presence of uh, of the uh, the um, prion protein by immunohistochemistry nimhans runs a registry for cjd and this is an example of uh, the perivascular training and the plaques sustained in uh, now these are the csf biomarkers which are available commercially now they are uh, their sensitivities and specificities there's a very nice uh, uh, review article in journal of clinical microbiology a couple of years back and i would advise you to read for the prevention and it is one has to have only transmissible spongiform encephalopathies we cannot prevent the inherited or the genetic forms of uh, prion diseases because they occur de novo so what we have to do is have very tight regulations on importing beef screening beef nowadays there are very stringent assays required most of the assays which i told you in the previous slide they have to be done on beef prohibiting parts of the cow such as the nervous system components to be uh, used for uh, uh, for any uh, food preparation to be kept out of the food chain preventing those with a history of risk of exposure to prion disease for example in the uk and in america even today if they are a beef eater and they are adults they will ask do you live in uk at such and such a time did you eat beef because the incubation period is very long then robust sterilization methods when you have a case in the hospital i told you the sterilization procedures and disinfection procedures are entirely Uh, different for prions compared to conventional agents and disposing uh, disposable matters so prion diseases uh, in summary are caused by misfolded protein it's a fundamental biological mystery there are many causes of uh, prion diseases broadly classified as genetic acquired and sporadic and brain is the main issue for all them so i'll stop here i try to finish in time if there are any questions we can we can take them thank you so thank, thank you so much, much. Uh, thank you so much dr ravi um, i think this is a really really interesting topic off off shoot from the routine uh, topics which we have been discussing up till now and uh, uh, i think you have uh, very uh, sweetly mentioned each and every aspect of this in a very uh, short time and it was really communicating thank you very much for this uh dr takin would you like to uh, add to something no i just wanted to say that after more than 30 years of their discovery prions still fascinate us mystify us and terrify us and i think dr ravi has brought out uh, the right from the beginning the history of prions and to the current status in a very interesting manner and i think is a very fascinating storyteller uh thank you so much dr ravi so can so we have can the I... yeah so it's such a pleasure to introduce dr khan uh, uh, amir maruf uh,
He is uh, working as a professor in the Department of Community Medicine at the University College of Medical Sciences, GTB Hospital, Delhi. Uh, he is the editor, IAPASM's text textbook of community medicine, associate editor, textbook of community medicine, associate editor, RIME Research and Humanities in Medical Education, honorary secretary of the National Working Group of IAPSM, honorary secretary consortium against rabies, coordinator, medical education unit, UCMS and GTB Hospital Delhi, more than 50 plus papers in index national and international journals. And what I know him personally as a great medical uh, educationist and who's always ready to help and handle others. So such a pleasure to introduce him, Dr. Mari. Thank you, ma'am, for your kind words and uh, uh, for the, the organizers for organizing this and inviting uh, me and uh, uh, Dr. Najam uh, sir uh, had to uh, this uh, deliver this talk, but somehow he could not do this and it's a, a privilege, but it is stressful also for me to uh, uh, be in that uh, point where such legends uh, had to be here at this time. So please bear with me. I would try to, uh, from my side, to do all justice to this particular presentation. Uh, I would like to share my screen. Um, yeah, yeah, yes, sir, sir. Uh, just a second. So show all windows and here it is. And I hope my screen is visible to all. Yes, sir. Yeah. So this uh, topic lessons learned in COVID-19, it's a more of a generic topic. It uh, We all have learned lessons during COVID. Uh, this, uh, any adversity is the biggest teacher. Any crisis teaches us more than the good times. So uh, this may be different for different uh, people. Uh, and uh, here we have tried to uh, focus on certain things where we as uh, healthcare providers uh, need to focus on as we move ahead in the future, keeping these uh, points in mind. Uh, I would request all those who are watching this on YouTube to put in the comments what they have learned in the COVID times. And those all who are watching it on uh, Zoom platform, they can mention in the chat box uh, what they have learned because uh, these points will be very important. Whatever you share with us, it will further enrich our collective understanding of the lessons that we have learned. So with the permission of the chairpersons, I uh, move on to the presentation. Uh, in 2020, when this pandemic started, it was a shock for every one of us. And when we are in shock, uh, sometimes uh, some prose and sometimes some poetries come out. And this is how one of the poems I wrote in the initial days of the lockdown that was waking up to a pandemic. It was published in Research and Humanities in Medical Education. So I just at that time wrote that, do we really need a pandemic to realize that we are here on earth to support and not to exploit others, that the earth belongs to all species, not just to humans, that our whining of not having enough time for ourselves is a lie that our family needs us more than anyone else. Must we wait for the next pandemic before we learn that hand washing videos are more important than computer games, that health education is needed more than costly smartphones, that we are the destroyers of nature in the garb of development, that it is possible to stop or to indefinitely postpone wars and conflict. Because when lockdown happened and when pandemic struck, all the things were postponed and only the really things those matter to us, they were only being uh, carried forward. And lastly, I mentioned at that time, will this pandemic help us to understand that we can forgive past misgivings and move ahead with renewed trust, that we are here in this world for a very limited period, that we should actively contribute to peace and harmony, that it's high time to collectively say no to chaos and conflict. Do we really need a pandemic to realize who we are? Unfortunately, today I think, yes, we needed some, maybe we needed a pandemic to realize who we are. So one thing that comes out very starkly is that one health approach is the one lesson that we have learned. Uh, we need to work collaboratively 
with the um, veterinary, veterinary scientists, with, with the environment, the agriculture, and at the same time, the human health. So one health approach is the way forward because we need joint surveillance systems. This can help in early detection of pandemics. It can help to identify viruses in wildlife early on. So that is the one lesson. Each slide I have just focused on one lesson that we have learned from this pandemic. And I would be happy to listen to others' opinions about this also. Second lesson that we have learned is the way the diagnostic facilities were needed, the explosion that happened and uh, we were not ready and we still need to increase a lot. So laboratory networks are needed. And this is something is very important because this group, this team or the conference organizing primarily it is dominated by microbiologists. So I think uh, the laboratory networks, RT-PCR facility kind of things uh, were beca become, became a commonplace. And many of the, um, uh, just outside the urban conglomerates, we were not able to get these uh, facilities. Many people have never heard even of these facilities till now. So this is another lesson that we learned in this pandemic with regards to healthcare. Another lesson that we have learned is that non-COVID healthcare is also important. Uh, during the pandemic times, COVID, COVID and COVID everywhere, and it's not that people are not affected by the other issues. So that also should have a place in the healthcare system. And medical education system actually, because it produces future doctors. Uh, we see that during this pandemic, some uh, hospitals, educational hospitals, uh, they were converted fully to uh, COVID uh, dedicated hospitals. So there the uh, problem happened of uh, the residents gaining enough skills and competencies in their respective specialties and also the medical students suffering from because of that. So that needs to be kept in mind that we should leave the medical education separate because we need future doctors in time and they should be competent enough to tackle the problems that the people are facing. So this is another lesson that we think that I, I think we have learned. Then the next comes one of the important pillars that is science. It, uh, this pandemic, we learned that our commitment towards science should be there. We have to protect it. Science is threatened by lots of infodemic that happened, uh, misinformation campaigns and all, and evidence-based medicine was uh, questioned. And uh, it's good that there is a debate, there's a discussion. Science always respects that. Um, but we have a responsibility, help, we all healthcare providers, that we reaffirm our commitment to scientific principles and not to intuition or opinion-based medicine. We also realize that investment in public health is the need of the hour. We can't just manage things by even those, uh, we, we saw that those many people who um, it's, it was not only the money, but the availability, accessibility, affordability. All these things uh, made a lot of difference in whether the person could be saved or could not be saved. So we need to have a focus on the universal health coverage. The health insurance models need to be worked up. And the disparities in healthcare that we have seen in this pandemic, that is also which is, should be addressed, whether it is a problem of internal migrants or whether it is a gender issue whether it is related to disability sector, we need to address these disparities in healthcare. This is something that this pandemic taught to us. Our old age parents also who are suffering from some disability, uh, we, need, we, we, we struggled to find uh, optimum um, the healthcare facilities for them also. So we need to invest in public health in a manner that is, uh, that is equitable and universally available. Another thing that we have learned is the communication. Uh, there was a flood of webinars. Uh, there were social media discussions, regular updates about COVID. And from the personal communi communication to global mass communication was there. This is something that we need to strengthen upon and take it in a positive direction. Because uh, many uh, infodemics also spread because of this particular uh, mass media explosion. But at the same time, uh, the regular updates coming up from uh, the, uh, respectable, reputable institutions and government agencies like ICMR from uh, AIMS, 
even from international agencies like CDC, WHO. This all helped uh, us all in gaining a lot of uh, information and managing this uh, pandemic. So I think this should continue and we should try to take it in a positive way so that the correct information reaches the correct people, uh, all the people uh, in, the, in, the, in uh, the time that is there. Then the next, what we have learned is preparation is important. Uh, the, when the second wave came, we were to some extent prepared about the protocols, about the management, about PPE and these things, hospital infection uh, control and uh, some of the, whether it's airborne, so masks are important and these kind of things we were prepared. But there were other things that we might not have been that much prepared and we saw the effects of that. So we have to be prepared for these things in future, for pandemic waves that will be coming up for a new feature. Innovation and sharing of research, how the research that was hap happened between 2020 and 2021, just in one year, so much research happened and was shared that uh, we, it helped us to manage our patients by evidence-based medicine. Hybrid working is something that we look forward to. We will, I don't think, go back to the uh, way we were working earlier. We need to develop digital skills and hybrid working models. Uh, things have shifted. We also will have to be prepared for this new paradigm of work culture. Resilience is something we our at personal level also and at institutional level also that we have to bounce back from these disasters. When they come, they destroy us, destroy our lives, but then we have to come back. So for these, it is needed that institutional level mechanisms should be there where uh, resilience uh, uh, model, resilient models are worked up. Uh, we need to have elastic workforce. Uh, this elastic workforce, workforce models come from, we have many skills. We need to have many skills. We use some skills when it is required. We use other skills when it is required. And when we want to scale up, for example, if a healthcare provider, suppose if a healthcare provider, a nurse is there in a hospital, now they should have certain additional skills of maybe training or maybe teaching others how to use the, um, the oximeter or how to use the oxygen cylinder or how to use the uh, various uh, equipments that are there in ICUs, ventilator. So they need to have those skills beforehand. When needed, they can scale up. They can act as peer trainers and they can scale up those capacities. And when not required in non-pandemic times, they can uh, do their other works that they are doing. But elasticity, we need to develop some elasticity within ourselves uh, uh, so that we can manage, use those skills when required. And for this re resilience, we need to have scaling and reskilling mechanisms at our institutions, I think. We also learned mental health is important along with physical health. Somehow before pandemic, mental health was not that much on the top, uh, on the top. But now what we see, we are talking about mental health more. So we need to maybe slow down, cope, how to cope with stress. We have to develop our own strategies and we also need to learn how to meditate so that our mental health is not affected in such dire circumstances that we have seen if it happens again. And two, three more points. One is essential workers are our heroes. We realized in our this thing uh, pandemic that vegetable vendors, grocery store, our helps, drivers, how much our neighborhood stores, how all these people uh, uh, mattered so much. So we need to maintain that thing and we need to celebrate uh, these things, uh, take it forward, encourage them uh, so that whenever such kind of events happen, uh, we are there with them, they are there with us. And lastly, some basics, some may call it a spirituality, but uh, these are some of the basic uh, humane values that we uh, have um, faced uh, during this pandemic. Like what are we here for? What is the purpose in life? Many people started doing more charity, may, uh, helping other people. How should I invest in life? Uh, what is the value of freedom when lockdowns happen? Um, the value of cooperation and interdependence, uh, family members supporting each other, friends supporting each other, we cooperating each other, whether it is in the workplaces, whether it is in communities. So these basics also we have learned a lot. And I think these are very, uh, these are some of the points uh, which affects us as healthcare providers, as human beings, as doctors. Uh, but uh, I think everybody must have learned their own lessons. So. 
I don't say it's comprehensive, it's complete, but these are some of the things that I th thought that I would like to put forth in front of you all. Uh, I would like listening to from all of you in chat boxes or in the comment boxes. Thank you. Dr. Parichar. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Amir. It was a very lucid presentation. What you have practically grasped during the COVID, you have shared all those and expanded to the community and uh, other aspects. Uh, to share with you that uh, one more important aspect, you know, before COVID, we have been training the staff for infection control aspects, very, uh, you know, simple things like standard precautions and uh, uh, many other things. Uh, but COVID made, it had no boundary. It spread like anything. But in turn, what it did was it made all of us united. Whether it is the humanity level, whether it is the institutional level, whether it is family. So it, it taught us love and spread love. It taught us, you know, teach everybody. And to share with you, we enhanced training during, you know, 2020, when it was uh, new at that time. Of course, you know, when we studied um, uh, microbiology, we studied way back, you know, coronaviruses, its classification, all those things. It was nothing at that time. But now we started reading so much about coronaviruses and how it spread and all that. So we also educated ourselves. So we shared, you know, we learned so many things. So uh, we had uh, some uh, competition between institutions and then there was a, a caption that uh, you need to participate in this uh, uh, event. Uh, that was how did Corona affect your institutes? So we said that Corona Tujay Salam, you taught us so many things uh, in our life in one year. So that is there from my side uh, and really very good presentation, elaborative and very lucid. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am, for sharing. Welcome. Uh, shall we go to the next presentation? Yeah. Okay, thank you, Tamkin, ma'am. Thanks, thank you, the organizer. Yeah, thank you so thank much, you Dr. Avat, especially for bringing out that human aspect. I know yeah. you're so, you know, proactive as, as a, you know, in a medical education, especially the humanities part. So thank you very much for highlighting that part. Exactly, thank you so much. So we have uh, now uh, Dr. Parvinder Chavla, and she's going to throw light on uh, COVID third wave. And this is actually all of us are hearing every other place. Uh, it is, uh, you know, uh, is the third wave going to come? So that is, uh, and what is the preparedness from uh, every level, whether it is national, whether it is global, whether it is state level, whether it is institutional level. Of course, yes, we at our institute are getting prepared to tackle the third wave. So Dr. Parvinder ji, I invite you uh, for your uh, talk and just let me introduce her. She is a senior consultant in internal medicine. She is from Fortis Hospital Hospital and she has uh, reviewed many articles and had written book chapters. Welcome Dr. Parvinder ji. Good afternoon. Thank you, Team Physicon, for giving me this opportunity. I'll be sharing my thoughts and learnings about the COVID third wave, what to anticipate and what measures we can probably take to prevent it if possible and to mitigate it and to manage it well, manage it differently from the way we did the second wave. Uh, before we dive down into this, uh, let's go back and look at what the Spanish flu waveform like, looked like. It spanned over one and a half years. Uh, killing about 50 million people. It came in the form of three waves, and we see that the second wave was much, much more severe than the first and the third. COVID so far, uh, we see that in US and UK, it started almost similarly, but then subsequently the waveforms differed slightly. And uh, Brazil, uh, it seems, has not touched the baseline at all, and it it's going on and on and South Africa is going through a brutal third wave as of now. So we see that um, each country has its own pattern and waveform. Um, the interwave interval is not fixed. So 
predicting how it would be for a, for a particular country, for a particular place is difficult. Uh, this is where we are in India. Our uh, second wave was sort of a perfect storm, uh, probably fueled by complacency, the super spreader events, Delta variant, and then uh, insufficient vaccine coverage. Uh, three factors will probably determine uh, uh, the coming and the magnitude of the third wave. It's us, our behavior, human behavior, and the form, what we call the COVID appropriate behavior, and then vaccination, both availability, hesitancy, our ability to vaccinate um, people fast, and then variants, if at all, they come, which they may. So, oh, so far, so good. Theoretically, we know all this, but then translating all this knowledge into reality um, to ensure that people take up the vaccine when it is available, to ensure that people follow the COVID appropriate behavior. So, all these things are becoming the bottleneck. So, there's a big no do gap here, which is probably what we'll need to bridge to be able to achieve what we wish to. Uh, uh, while studying for this, while searching for this, I came across this new concept called the strolling period or strolling rate, strolling severity. And this, these studies have been done by physicists and uh, they've been adopted from the principles of high energy physics and what they call symmetry principles. Um, going back to our graph, these gray arrows, they point towards what we call the strolling period, the interwave period of uh, almost linear growth phase of the, of the pandemic. So we see that th this is the linear phase, and then we go into the exponential phase, the first wave, what we call, then again, the semi-linear or the quasi-linear phase, and then again, the exponential growth of the second phase. So now, as of now, we are again to the linear phase. So the number of new cases per million population detected per day during this period is uh, what is called as the strolling rate. And uh, studies have been done which show that the key to control the arrival of the next wave of the pandemic is the strolling period in between the waves. So when the number of infections is growing slowly, linearly, that is when if we can limit the diffusion of the virus, we can prevent or delay the arrival of the next wave. So this is where we need to focus on if we want to prevent or delay the coming of the third wave. Uh, more the strolling rate, higher the strolling rate, lesser the interpeak interval, as shown here. Uh, in this graph, on the x-axis, we know we see the number of daily cases per million, five per million to here, a thousand per million. And on the y-axis is the interpeak interval in terms of measured in terms of weeks. So higher the new daily cases per million, lower the interpeak interval. And uh, if we can keep this number to about five per million, we can delay the arrival of the next wave to almost a year. And this is the time that we end up earning to vaccinate the population well and to get our act right. And uh, it, they, they say that the cutoff to push the third wave beyond 40 weeks, uh, we need to have a maximum of 10 million new positive cases per day, maximum one lakh per day. So if we are around this number, maximum 10 per million per day of new active cases, we can push the second wave by almost 40 weeks, which is a good figure to again uh, uh, be able to vaccinate and get things sorted out and to also flatten the wave in a way. So uh, again, uh, where are we as of now? So as of today, we are probably at about 28 to 30 uh, new cases per million so a second wave is therefore imminent almost about 20 weeks so which is what most of the studies are also showing that we should be able we should be expecting or we should be working towards uh, uh, managing it well when it comes in august september october and uh, different studies say uh, also our effective reproduction rate has been approaching one lead uh, lately, as we see here. So there, there was a phase when it was low, but then last few days, it has been steadily climbing. So we are approaching the exponential phase once again. Uh, and our vaccine coverage is, is um, not what, what it could have been, we all know. Um, just about 66.3% are fully vaccinated and less than about 20 to maybe 25 as of today are uh, partially vaccinated. So this is one area where we, we can afford to do better. Uh, 
a lot has been said about the antibody test many people get these tests done and uh, they, they, they they feel that if the antibody levels are good they are adequately protected and they can lower their guard and if the antibody levels are low then that adds to uh, the feeling of fear but then utility of these antibody levels in actually preventing the infections is questionable uh, especially in the setting of fresh variants coming in and uh, headlines such as this one which says that so many uh, have antibodies they just only contribute towards flaring up complacency that's what i feel mean, um, in the community and um, it doesn't help much probably so we we do have a perfect recipe for another wake up wave at hand we have wood in the form of susceptible population fire in the form of the virus and the, the variants coming in as oil so what can we do what's the way forward we can keep them away um, by following what we call the covid appropriate behavior or make fire resistant wood um, vaccination Swami Vivekananda said that you are the creator of your own destiny and probably maybe we are the creator of the third wave, if I can say. And this is not only a philosophical statement. Uh, Dr. Gagadeep Kank in her uh, beautiful article, which came about a week back, said that don't invite the third wave. Higher zero positivity doesn't preclude the emergence of another dangerous COVID variant. And uh, the, the same sentiment was echoed by WHO Director General, who said that it's totally up to us when we want to enter the contagion. So there we are, uh, that um, third wave is probably going to come, but it, it'll be in our hand that how fast it comes, how bad would it be? So the actionables are in our hand. So what is it that we can do to do differently? We can prevent it from coming, obviously. Uh, we can see and show it coming and we can manage it well if, if it does land on our shore. So I'll be talking briefly about uh, th th these couple of uh, the COVID appropriate behavior, strolling severity again, and this, uh, th this new thought or concept of Delta OC. So let's go through them one by one. Mm, in this uh, earlier study done in China, almost uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, they, they showed that the and the effect of non-pharmaceutical interventions in containing COVID. And in this study, they found that without non-pharmaceutical interventions, the number of cases would have been almost 67 fold higher. And they are, they are talking about the, the basic interventions like social distances, the masking, the hygiene aspect, the travel restrictions. Uh, and they showed that the effectiveness of the different interventions varied. Early detection and isolation of cases prevented more infections than the travel restrictions and contact reduction. But a combination of these interventions achieves the strongest and the most rapid effect. So this, this is again where we need to probably, uh, we have been doing a lot, but we need to work more so that the, the concept is understood by the public. Uh, in this study done uh, using the Google and Apple mobility data they again came out of uh, with a very important concept that whatever change we make especially change related to social distancing doesn't have an immediate effect they uh, came up with this un universal time interval of two to four weeks be between the onset of mobility reduction and a visible decrease in the infection rate and uh, as shown here the a part is uh, the initial phase of the pandemic they uh, of the growth and then the social distancing starts here it takes a while before the slope changes so this b is the phase uh, when the you you see that your actions are not showing any fruit and it's only here that we see a change in the slope we see the rates uh, the numbers coming down uh, so this interval this B bar is the time lag of two to five weeks before which the social distancing has a visible impact we saw this when um, in our setting, especially when the lockdown is in, put in enforced, it takes a while for the numbers to start coming down. And this is a phase of test of human patience and commitment because uh, you, you don't see your action bearing immediate fruit. And that is what probably leads to people uh, questioning that action itself. 
uh, and, and this is another important concept that uh, was done it was shown by uh, in this study where they said that the ongoing vaccination campaign will not impact the current pandemic wave and therefore social distancing measures must still be enacted so this was done as we see uh, in end of last year and this was published in december 2020 this was the time when in us the vaccination campaign had just started and this study showed that the vaccination campaign would not be able to affect the cases at that time. So it, is, it affects only the future waves, the ongoing one. And this will be, is what we saw in our context also. When we uh, uh, when our vaccination rollout for elderly was launched on 1st of March, that is the time when we were entering into the second wave. And um, there were a lot of questions which were raised saying that is it vaccination that is contributing to the second wave but uh, as shown in the study that the vaccination at that time could not have helped much because we were already into the second phase we were already into the rising numbers and that is when uh, the vaccination campaign for elderly was started but now is a time when we can get our act right we can vaccinate the people our population well uh, uh, so that we can, it can have an impact on the third wave so again this is a vaccination versus a test of human proactivity patients commitment Coming uh, back to uh, the strolling severity that we spoke about, how to read between the lines. We see uh, such uh, newspaper reports. This is from our own local newspaper that came a few days back. City here that talks about Chandigarh reports six new COVID cases, Mohali three and Panchkula just one. So uh, what does this mean? If, if uh, on the face of it, it looks that this is a good picture and we, we need to be happy about it. But uh, if, if we dig deeper and if we compare it with the denominator keeping this in mind that we, we want to push the third wave beyond 40 weeks we can afford to have a maximum of 10 million new positive cases per day or maximum one per lakh so where are we so uh, look we have to look at the population of Chandigarh, Mohali and Panchkula. Chandigarh has a population of about 11 lakhs, Mohali about 1.7 and Panchkula about 6 lakhs. So the positive cases as reported in this newspaper report, Chandigarh 6, Mohali 3 and Panchkula 1. So uh, and the upper limit, if we just divide these numbers by uh, just remove the last five digits to convert it into per lakh, we see that in Mohali we are already above the upper limit of one or you can say 1.7 uh, per day so we are at about three per day almost double that number so uh, the uh, the way i would look at it is that in case the, the third wave comes mohali would probably be impacted or would probably enter the exponential phase before chandigarh and panchkula and uh, th these numbers shown here are not innocuous uh, look, let's look at the bigger picture. Uh, so this 10 digit number here is India's population a couple of days back. So again, uh, going back uh, to what we said a while back, the cutoff to push the third wave beyond 40 weeks is maximum 10 per million new positive cases per day or maximum 1 per lakh. So again, removing the last five digits, we see that this is India's population in lakhs. So maximum per day, we can afford to have about 14 lakh positive cases whereas presently we are about 30 to uh, uh, 30 to 40,000 so we can have about 14,000 lakhs uh, uh, this, that's India's population so this is uh, the number of positive cases and we are positive presently at about 30 to 40,000 per day so we are almost double or three times that number uh, which shows that we are entering into the exponential phase of the or at least the third wave is going to come earlier than what 20 weeks so there's a lesson for the future waves and pandemics here we can follow the divide and rule policy here and harness the power of one so if we can focus on small units of one lakh population each say mohali has about 1.6 lakh population so if we can target that um, we're going to allow maximum one positive case per day the moment that patient is picked up we are going to do good contact tracing so as to uh, initiate quarantine for the contacts and initiate a good isolation for the positive case so as to decrease this number from going beyond one per day if we can look at focus on that then probably we can actually truly flatten the curve and push the pandemic and use that time in vaccinating the public well uh, 
uh, our test positivity rate seems to be good. It's in the blue phase. Uh, it should be less than five while testing at least one per thousand population per week. Uh, but mind you, this test positivity rate, which is reported, is calculated on the basis of the uh, RT-PCR reports. Uh, we at uh, in, in most places, in many places, are using the antigen which is not captured while calculating this test positivity rate. And uh, in, uh, in terms of genomic testing and surveillance, you can't fix what you don't measure. And this is probably, you know, we started late in terms of that. The target uh, is that at least 5% of the total COVID patients would be sequenced with focus being on reinfections, breakthrough infections, and severe infections developing those receiving the monoclonal antibody cocktails. Uh, we were probably late to start with this, and we are probably getting better with time here. But again, there is a scope for improvement as shown here. In India, we are sequencing about one per thousand cases, whereas we, it needs to be about five per thousand. And uh, we get the report in about two months, which is again too long a period to um, take appropriate action on that. So uh, uh, probably on the bigger picture, there's scope for improvement there. Uh, so a third wave doesn't have to crash on undefended shores. So we can have our uh, preparation right, even if it happens to come. I like this phrase uh, the, given by these uh, authors from King's College London. Uh, here, I would like to talk about another concept called the Delta OC, which is the interval between onset of symptoms and confirmation of diagnosis. So this is phase when the patient is highly infectious, not yet diagnosed to be having COVID, isolation practices may therefore be compromised. And on the contrary, interaction with healthcare workers uh, seems to be increased during this period. Uh, probably all of us came across patients in the last two waves who, who had been symptomatic, had been going to multiple doctors in the community, had been getting their blood works done and probably the CT also done without getting the, the RT-PCR done or the antigen, the diagnostic test done. And this was a phase when they were probably spreading the infection and that probably contributed to the, to the worsening rates. If we can aim to decrease this number and that can contribute immensely towards early testing, early isolation and limiting the spread. And again, going back to the China study that I quoted earlier, they showed that uh, the average interval from the onset of symptoms to lab confirmation with effort can be decreased from 12 days to three days uh, and th th thus improving the overall scenario. Uh, so I'm going to talk about another concept called the golden week concept. The first week from the onset of symptoms, that's probably where we need to work upon. Just like in trauma, we have the golden hour concept or, or MI. So here, within the first week, if we can aim at getting our diagnosis right, timely isolation, early contact tracing and quarantine of the contacts, optimal monitoring and guidance of the patient, and administration of monoclonal antibodies if needed, hand holding in case hospital admission is required. So we see that uh, in COVID, usually the it is by the end of the first week, beginning of the second week, that many patients end up needing admission. So if, if all this can be done within the first week, we can contribute towards reducing ER crowd, overcrowding that happens otherwise when uh, the patient is not yet diagnosed or uh, and lands up in the hospital and we need to wait for the test reports to come to discuss, decide upon their disposition, COVID area, non-COVID area. So all that thing can be avoided if, if, uh, if the emphasis uh, is on early diagnosis within the first week. And here I think us, we medical providers uh, have, have uh, a lot of work to do because many times we've seen that it is us doctors who sort of tend to down prioritize COVID testing in many of these patients saying that uh, we can wait for a couple of days and then test if the symptoms don't improve but that is not the way with COVID. It's early diagnosis with help in that. So uh, I wish that if, in case we do happen to go through the third wave if this one concept that is um, in, in used and plus the strolling severity uh, we can do a much, much better job. So pandemics are periods of paradigm shifts and each of the pandemics that came earlier uh, have taught us something. This is not the first one, this is not going to be the last one, but if we can ensure that we, we learn something beneficial from it, that will be a 
and that will be a, of good use. So Black Death in the 14th century that got us the concept of quarantine. The Great Plague of London taught us the concepts of isolation. Smallpox taught us vaccination. Cholera uh, in London in 1850s that taught us, um, brought us the concept of public health. Influenza last century that taught us social distancing. It was called crowding control at that time. And COVID um, has, um, in a way, has already taught us the power of the collective in terms of being uh, having given us vaccine at such a short uh, time period. Uh, and probably that is the learning that we can take from it: collective intelligence, collective efforts, collective responsibility. Uh, uh, and I hope we'll be able to take these learnings and make a difference. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Palvinder, uh, for convincing us all for COVID appropriate behavior. I must say your manner was very scientific, but at the same time, you were almost counseling us, you know, you were so persuasive with your figures and your tables and the predictions. Uh, I would just like to highlight for everybody again, because it is so important, the summary what you gave us uh, that uh, the strolling uh, rate, that is the baseline infection rate, is most important for limiting or controlling the infection because that can increase the uh, interval between peaks. Presence of antibodies does not prevent infection, may even harm people because they may stop COVID appropriate behavior. And I have seen so many residents getting the, the, their COVID antibodies done unnecessarily. So we must re-emphasize this important point. Social distancing is even more important than vaccination at this point right now. And uh, I think your example of Chandigarh, Mohali and- uh, Anjkula. Thank yeah, you so much. That was really great. I mean, the most convincing way, uh, you know, where pe for people to, uh, to continue with COVID appropriate behavior and try to not go to all those holidays that we see every day, you know, the news coming in. And of course, the Delta OC and uh, uh, the basic, the gist was that early testing, early diagnosis and isolation is most important at this time. So thank you very much. It thank was you so much, ma'am. Yeah, it thank almost, you. you know, counseling us. Yes, Dr. Parijat, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was uh, really uh, uh, impressed by the Golden Week concept what she brought out. Uh, uh, it was uh, really, you know, if every one of us fo uh, follows that, and then the strolling period where we can, you know, um, have, you can buy the time uh, for, uh, you know, vaccinating people and taking appropriate uh, control measures that would really help us to push the third wave ahead. Thank you so much, Dr. Parvinder. Thank you so much. Thank you for this privilege. Thank you. So, yes, uh, okay, Dr. Parijat, you may do. No, you may go ahead, ma'am. Okay. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Ekta Gupta, who is presently a professor and head of the Department of Clinical Virology, Nodal Officer for Viral Hepatitis, Nodal Officer for COVID Diagnostic and Genome Sequencing, who has more than 22 years of clinical diagnostic virology, has more than 100 scientific publications in indexed national and international journals, and author of nine chapters in books. She has to her credit several extramural research grants, both at national and international level in clinical virology. She started two unique courses at ILBS in clinical virology, PDCC in diagnostic virology, and uh, PDCC in transplant virology. So please go ahead, Dr. Ekta. Very good evening to all of you. I'm Dr. Ekta Gupta. I'm the head and in charge of the clinical virology department at the Institute of Liver and Biliary Sciences. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers of HESICON for holding such a wonderful conference and discussing such an important and apt topic of viral pandemics. The topic that I have, would be, have been given today is SARS, COVID, EPASI, CHF, EVD, and what next? This is a very apt topic uh, on today's uh, pand ongoing pandemic. 
So our world is changing as never before. We are growing in population, as you can see from this photograph. Travels and global boundaries have decreased. Travel have increased many folds. So are the microbial pathogens, their adaptations to human lives. We are also continuously under the threat of chemical radiation and other hazards. So the health security is at the greatest stake at the current time. So the human beings are not new to these pandemics. They have been seen from the ancient time, but earlier the pandemics were smaller in number, causing less mortality, but they were of bacterial origin, like plague epidemic, then came uh, the viral, like uh, cholera, plague, smallpox. And then gradually in the last two decades, as you can see, that the viral pandemics have taken over. We had a huge Spanish flu. After that, the HIV AIDS, and then the other respiratory viruses in the form of avian flu, SARS, MERS, and the ongoing COVID-19, which has just started. And I don't know when it is going to end. So how did the pandemic start and spread? Microbes, they are a key part of the wildlife diversity. So these microbial pathogens are also needed for the sustainability and continuity of life of the uh, other zoonotic species like uh, birds, animals, all they require these microbial pathogens. But when the mixing starts taking place, there are uh, environmental changes, there are the land degradations, they are loss of habitat, and the mixing starts. The spillover of these pathogens from the wildlife to humans start. We humans, we take these pathogens and then they become they, these pathogens, they get adapted to the human beings, and then from human to human, transmission starts, and so on and so forth, and the pandemic occur because of the increased globalization and so much of population overgrowth. Viruses, as I told you, have predominantly taken over in the form of the microbes which can cause pandemics. Whether they are the vector-borne viruses like dengue, chikungunya, zika, their new existence in the non-existent areas like dengue in Americas, or they are totally zoonotic, like your Nipah virus outbreaks, your Henra Nipah virus outbreaks. And more recently, the respiratory or the airborne viruses, which we have seen like H1N1 influenza, then your uh, bird flu, and now we are facing these uh, SARS-CoV-2 outbreak, which is going on. So what makes these viruses special and what gives what are the characteristics so that the viruses become you know an important pathogen as a potential pandemic pathogen out of the viruses we know that they are dna viruses and rna viruses so the rna viruses are uh, very very prone for causing the potential and large outbreaks because they have high replication rate they replicate fast there is no um, you know, proofreading capacity, so they are error prone. So the chances of mutations is very, very high. Now these mutations are usually favorable for the pathogen and makes them adapt to a new host very, very fast. They increase their pathogenicity, their transmission. That is why these RNA viruses are important, uh, becoming an important source of uh, causing a pandemic potential. Viruses, they always have some intermediate animal host, animal reservoir, a vector through which they can persist. So they do not die. The human beings are not the dead in host. The continuity of life continues through these animal intermediate hosts. And that is why they can survive in environment. And again, um, when the situations are favorable, can cause the pandemic or an outbreak. So animal, you just requires animal to human or human to human transmission. Viruses are unique because uh, the clinical symptoms, sign and symptoms produced by these viral infections are often overlapping. They're usually asymptomatic in the early phase of infection. And this gives a right potential for them for a rapid spread and because there is a delayed uh, detection. The airborne transmission is possible. Uh, 
uh, either from up the droplet or um, uh, droplet nuclei. So the longer root transmission from person to person is possible with the viral infections. Then the other potential, other uh, advantage to the viruses is that we do not have enough antiviral agents. We do not have our anti knowledge about the antiviral agents is limited. So we do not have very effective uh, antiviral agents. And the vaccine, making the vaccine is often difficult with certain viruses which cannot be cultured, which do not have a good animal host. And all these things makes the virus as micro very, very potential to be able to cause such big pandemics. Apart from this, so the viral is one, the pathogen specific factors I told you, there are other factors like climatic changes, like encroachment of the wildlife habitats, increased global travel, all these things, overpopulation, urbanization have made an ideal scenario for more pandemics to come in the future. This is an old uh, uh, citation. It is uh, from The Lancet in 2012, which clearly shows that what are the areas which are hotspots for any emerging infectious disease. And our country and uh, is uh, Southeast Asia is one of the red, very high risk hotspot for any future uh, pandemic or uh, drug. So what are we, um, mm, what possible viruses to be afraid of, I would create uh, respiratory viral infections as the highest uh, viral infection that we should be scared of, whether it is influenza virus, whether it is coronavirus, or the viruses belonging to the parabic sovereignty family. Influenza viruses. Now, why influenza virus? Because, um, see, as you can see, they are have a wide species existence. They can infect humans, they can infect your uh, swine, they can infect uh, avian. They have different receptors in humans and swine, violin swine, the, which acts as a mixing vessel. The receptors for both are present. This is an RNA virus. Uh, it is a segmented RNA. So what happens in a segmented RNA virus? The genetic reassortment occurs when you get co-infected by avian as well as humans, their genes reassort. Now, when these reassortment bring about minor changes and only few, they lead to antigenic drift, just an antigenic drift. So a newer strain or a newer type can occur, which leads to small outbreaks or local outbreak or higher pathogenicity. But if it is causing a major change in the entire structure, then that is known as an antigenic shift and a new viral strain is formed, which can cause a potential new infection into a new host and that can become a new human uh, virus. And from human to human spread will start and that, that leads to the occurrence of the pandemics. So because of their vast species existence, the phenomena of genetic reassortment and uh, the characteristic feature that whenever they infect animal, it is an asymptomatic fecal shedding. So the acquisition of infection becomes much, much faster. And then you have a mixing vessel like pig, which have receptors alpha-2-3 as well as alpha-2-6 of both human and avian and can lead to a potential new um, viral strain which can cause infection in humans. That is why influenza viruses are the one we really should be working upon. We should be keeping our eyes open for the next um, uh, change of the strain which can occur. Paramyxoviruses, like, again, they have a broad host range. They can infect from vertebrates to fish to mammals. What are the paramyxoviruses? The zoonotic ones which have caused severe, very infectious, highly contagious uh, pandemics like uh, viruses belonging to the Henipa virus family, Hendra and Nipah viruses we know. So the transmission because is again RNA viruses, high replication, can have mutations and so from zoonotic very easy transformation to a, becoming a human pathogen is there. Transmission is primarily by respiratory route. So it's very, very easy for them to cause infections in humans. And they are highly contagious. 
So the zoonotic spillover is very, very likely. And that is why these are the group of viruses. We should be on the lookout and should closely watch these viruses. Coronaviruses, of course. Coronaviruses are the viruses one has to be very, very vigilant and uh, scared of because they, we are seeing how rapidly they are changing and their potential to cause more and more and more uh, severe kind of pandemics. So till 1960s, you will be surprised to see till 1960s, we just had four coronaviruses which could infect humans due to 9E, NL63, OC43 and HQ normal. Within a few years, we saw the jumping of the bad coronaviruses causing infections in humans, but it's, it was limited only to 29 countries. And then within a couple, 10 years, we saw another uh, camel coronavirus, which mers cov again infecting 27 countries, like causing, all the, causing limited spread. But within a gap of six years, we saw COVID-19, which we all are facing currently, which has crossed all boundaries. I think hardly any country, more than 180 countries have shown the involvement. They are already, sorry for this, this date, I may not be updated, but so many deaths. So the coronaviruses have shown from 1960 to 2002, very rapidly jumping 2013 and in five, six years, 2019. So this is the so virus one has to be on a lookout because they will change their form very, very rapidly. So we have to be extremely cautious about the coronavirus infections. How this COVID-19 outbreak occurred and what happened, it was so rapid. See, it was December 8th, 2019, when the first case was recorded in Wuhan. It took some time for us to understand the speed and its transmissibility and pathogenicity. So on 11th March, after three months, finally a pandemic was declared. But the, by the time it was 11th March, I think most of more than 100 countries got affected. So it was that fast in its travel across the globe. So one has to be, we have to learn lessons that if we detect, we have to be so fast because the virus takes only a few months for it to travel so fast. What happened in India? 30th January, we had the first case and uh, we were very fast that we actually uh, published the whole genome sequence in February itself, we could sequence the virus. And March, just 14 group of Italian tourists were there and then the nationwide lockdown. But then in the month of May and June 2020, so the first peak, it was so high. If, Really, uh, all the um, if, uh, did not got effect by the first lockdown. Most of the states started showing the infection. Then they declined. But then, you know, uh, we were also rapid in establishing the net lab network. All government and private sectors rapid diagnostics, very fast vaccine production started. You know, but then the variant came. And in the month of March and May 2021, we saw what was the second peak and the Delta, Delta variant was so infectious and transmissible that so much of mortality infused two of the states are still dealing with this Delta variant pandemic. Although in India, there was one very good thing. The, the testing was very much intensified. The uh, We could make our own vaccine. We developed few kits also. And um, the viral surveillance uh, genome sequencing consortium was also very, very rapidly started in December 2020. But we really have to be very fast ahead of this virus because we know how rapidly. This COVID-19 was a total zoonotic spill. As you can see from this phylogenetic tree, that the SARS-CoV-2 resembles very closely to the bat coronaviruses, pangolin coronaviruses. But unfortunately, the earlier coronaviruses like SARS-CoV-1 and MERS-CoV, it shows limited, uh, just 50% or 79% genome sequence. So it was, there was no doubt that this is a spillover 
from the bats because it showed very close relatedness to the RAPG13 uh, bats, almost 96.2%. And uh, all this hypothesis that it is coming as a zoonotic spillover. It showed very, very um, highly replicating viruses compared to um, uh, the earlier, earlier SARS because the spike protein could very effectively get attached to the ACE receptors and then processed and get internalized. What made this virus different from the SARS-CoV? There are two units of this virus, the spike protein, which are the crown-like projection from the virus, which we call as the spike protein. They have two units, S1 and S2. They are bound by a unique region. And in SARS-CoV-2, there is a polybasic cleavage site. This is known as the cleavage site, which allows the virus to get internalized and be processed faster. So this SARS-CoV-2 had a very unique cleavage site, which was not there, as you can see, in any of the bat viruses, neither the earlier SARS-CoV-1 virus. Now, this makes it having a very good transmissibility, binding capacity to the ACE receptors, and being processed at a very, very faster speed as compared to the earlier SARS viruses. Now, any change or mutation if it occurs in this region, also brings a new variant because it will have effect on the pathogenicity, transmissibility, as well as immune escape. So the variant tracking, variant tracing are very, very important. How variants, viral variants are formed? So viruses, they, as I told you, especially the RNA viruses, which are have an error-prone replication, they bring about changes in the amino acids or nucleic acids, which bring about the changes in the amino acids. And finally, the proteins are affected. And these are the protein in the form of spike protein, which are required for the virus to act. So any change which happens makes it a variant. Now, if that variant brings about a significant change and it alters its um, physical properties and changes it from the original virus, then we call it new viral strain. They become so subsequently we name them variant of interest, variant of concern, if they are affecting the morbidity as well as the mortality uh, and the pathogenicity of the viral strain. We have got uh, four till now uh, variants of concern alpha, beta, gamma, and delta, and we all know what is this delta variant of SARS CoV 2, which was originated supposedly from India and has now taken over the entire globe. How do we name these variants? Because the initial one, which was in 2019, was called as SA lineage, or so depending upon the phylogenetic classification, the pangolin, the influenza database, or whatever database you're using, we name them. But now everybody has started following this B.1, 0.2, and so on and so forth. So the Delta variant is named as B.1617.2, which is the latest uh, variant of concern globally, uh, spreading and causing lots of infection. We were the first uh, lab, the Gotelli Common Lab, to start RTP cell testing from last year, 23rd March. And um, we are also a part of the INSACOG genomic sequencing and we've done. So this is just to bring you that in Delhi state, we found there were three peaks. So it is not only one, uh, uh, two waves, but we found a rapid increase in cases the month of June 2020, which were by B.1216, that is the G variant. And then in November, we had a mixture of cases. This is our own lab data. We had only B.1336 variant. And then in the month of May uh, 2021, most of the infections were by Delta, that is 617.2. So what is needed? The need of, so this I told you that these are the viruses, viruses to check. So we really need very good global viral surveillance systems. Now, COVID-19 has told us what are the weaknesses how our um, you know, public health system can collapse and these viruses can effectively replicate and can cause a massive pandemic. So the early warning system that detects new viral spillover will 
quite ahead of time so that it does not cause so that it is just limited to an outbreak on a global risk based multi sectorial viral surveillance network which can detect the viruses with high consequence humans or in animals and can do a hotspot mapping for these emerging risk is needed and uh, we re for to have a sustainability of this virological surveillance system a strong political commitment a sound governance structure and finances are needed so a very good political will and financial support is needed if you really want early warning surveillance network to work and to warn us ahead just a brief for our postgraduates what a surveillance screening and testing when you are doing systemic you know collation and analysis of data when you really do not know just for the purpose of prevention you're just doing it then it's not a surveillance now when the disease is already known to have spread and you are doing an asymptomatic individual testing then it is known as screening and when it is confirmed by clinical signs and symptoms then it is called as the testing just for graduates and the continuous surveillance or anything and especially the virological surveillance is very very needed because you have to track any new viral viral outbreak you want to determine whether the illness is coming from which area it is coming and to monitor any changes which are happening in the viral agents and uh, so that we facilitate emergency planning and preparedness WHO has uh, been an international body which has come up with the international health regulations and they are the one who track globally all such changes at the public health and viral interfaces if, uh, are happening in india we have a full developed integrated disease surveillance program and their um, uh, main aim of this program is to track and check any development um, of any outbreak or epidemic which is occurring and then have a rapid response uh, to these events. so i would like to end this um, talk today by summarizing that the viral pandemics are bound to occur we really need to consider uh, and um, start having our tracking system very very uh, in place and uh, they should be very apt especially the respiratory viruses should be the target for surveillance activities as i told you they have a very high potential of causing next pandemics apart from tracking global surveillance the normal social behavior of us as individuals in the form of respiratory etiquettes taking due biosafety measures you know cough etiquettes biosafety measures uh, are very very important so that we prevent the further spread of these agents we must start uh, accelerating our efforts towards development of antiviral agents and vaccination programs we must start uh, accelerating our viral diagnostics and give emphasis on viral diagnostic labs bring about awareness and capacity building for viral diagnosis global timely alert system should be in place if we really want to prevent future pandemics and outbreaks thank you all dr parijit yeah uh, thank you so much uh, dr ekta um, the flow was so smooth and so understandable that you have taken us all the way through that how the pandemic started and spread and uh, you know also the uh, details about uh, the years where the pandemics happened uh, more so uh, the difference between the different variants which you have highlighted and also that we the you know needing to have the good global viral surveillance systems in place and what we can do at our national level the bodies are working on to it and they are in place and uh, the simple things that we you also focused on the early surveillance early early surveillance catching the cases and taking all the preventive measures 
uh, which all of us have been saying and in the earlier lectures also that have been highlighted will i think cater to the prevention or you know ex extending the next pandemic so it is what next what next could be anything as what is being seen from your presentation what next could be anything it could be corona it could be anything else so we need to be vigilant about and accelerating our systems like what you uh, uh, finally uh, prompted that we need to accelerate our diagnostic systems we need to be up on our foot to have all our gadgets ready for the vaccinations uh being prepared for uh, you know getting into the new vaccinations if they come up if new uh, uh, viral uh, pandemic come up so gearing up all these things will uh, also make us alert on what next thank you so much for your uh, wonderful presentation uh really you have taken us to our olden days again <laughs> learning about viruses thank you so much thank you thank you so much welcome so i just one request to all the uh, the speakers we are already running 20 minutes late and we have whole session one hour 20 minute session remaining so we we'll lose all the audience so please we begin the next hi shall go ahead uh, tamkin ji go ahead Wait, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah hi neeta uh, this is parishas here hi yeah, how hi. are you nice very to see fine. you after a long time yeah i know very very long time yeah so uh, dr neeta is consultant uh, quality assurance laboratory infection control personnel in ruby hall group of hospitals pune uh she has uh, been closely working with the who on different topics sorry just means... cut it short it's okay let's cut down that don't worry done done so we all know you very well dr munshi so let us go ahead with uh, uh, clearing doubts and resolving controversies uh, what the participants are having so welcome you neeta thank you so much dr parija uh, i don't have a presentation so i'm going to make it really short and uh, try to save in the time um so what i'm going to do is just highlight a few points based on what the speakers have said in clearing doubts and controversies now talking about uh, dr ravi's prions <coughs> oh my god prions is such a rare but spoken of a lot nowadays and uh, we are looking at it mainly from a point of view of uh, disinfection and sterilization of equipment as also um uh, i want to ask him at the end of this talk about uh, specific importance of surgical pathology labs when we talk about brain biopsies because that is one area where we need to focus on um, post mortems are virtually not done nowadays except in a few hospitals the government hospitals so that risk probably is less but when we talk about uh, eeg electrodes when we talk about um, the brain biopsies we have to focus on the disinfection sterilization i'm so glad that he highlighted the various uh, agents by which we can uh, sterilize the equipment because that is one area where we tend to not focus as a part of our infection control program so that is one of the challenges which he has uh, highlighted um now coming to the lessons learned in covid i think um, that was very very interesting he dr khan did make it very interesting but i i'm sure like he mentioned all of us have a lot of lessons learned in covid and one of the biggest lessons was disruption of technology and innovation because uh, during the covid times we have all learned how technology has been disrupted at all levels be it the household where we have all started ordering things online Amazon, Squiggy, Swiggy, Zomato are all doing amazingly well in the healthcare system. Uh, innovation, the healthcare workers and frontline workers have uh, really shown their might despite uh, all the challenges that they have faced over the last, uh, I would say, about eighteen months. And uh, 
one of the things that he mentioned, which I would like to highlight is that non-COVID cases should be tackled. And that was one point that we discussed at our healthcare institution at our hospital. And we found that why, I mean, okay, in the lockdown, we had shut down all non-COVID areas and we had only the COVID um, hospitals that had been converted into COVID hospitals. Non-COVID was virtually non-existent. The question was, why was it non-existent? Why was it that there were no patients coming routinely? We see the hospitals flooded with all the non-COVID cases. Why were there no non-COVID cases coming? And the conclusions that we drew were that during the lockdown, A, there was no travel. There was no local travel. There was no transportation. People were not budging out of their houses. So that, in a way, stopped the pollution. So the, because all pollution-related diseases were gone, the air was clean, there was oxygen to breathe, and people were leading a healthy life. Secondly, people, because they were not moving out of their houses, there were no vehicles on the road, there were no accidents. There were no accidents happening. People were not, I mean, we didn't hear mm -hmm. of any accidents happening on the road. There was no transport. Yeah. Thirdly, uh, we also found that people were not eating out. Restaurants were shut. People had started eating home food. And because of that, I'm sure a lot of the diseases <laughs> were away, averted because people were practically all at home. And not only that, because by virtue of being at home, people had no choice but to, uh, you know, start doing exercises to keep themselves healthy. So they started resorting to yoga, meditation, exercises at home. So on the whole, the health of the population at large, apart from COVID, seemed to have improved. Now, coming to... The COVID part, people had lost a lot of their uh, friends and family and neighbors, and that did take a toll on their mental health. And because people resorted to uh, yoga and meditation, I guess it helped them to an extent. But what he mentioned was to the humaneness of people came out. People went out of their way to help whoever they could, be it by way of taking them to the hospital or providing food or providing medicines, whatever it was, but there was a human angle which had come out, which we saw during the um, COVID. And that was something that reached its peak, that helped one and all. And the best thing is infection prevention practices, which we have been advocating and we all have been vocal about over the years, had automatically <laughs> been instilled into everybody, be everybody. it the slums, be it colleges, be it homes, uh, wherever. I mean, each and every person was conscious about wearing a mask, about social distancing, and using a hand sanitizer, if not washing hands. And this is something which, unfortunately, the pandemic had to come and teach us rather than us crying <laughs> worse about it over the years. So that is yeah. something that we should all be very happy about. Yeah. Now, coming to doctor um, about the COVID third wave, uh, I loved her strolling period, strolling, the strolling rate um, analysis yeah. and the analogy. Um, one of the things that I would like to tell both Dr. Khan and Dr. Chow, that uh, what I felt is vaccinating aggressively true, but what is important and the challenge we face and that we should tackle is Public-private partnership is something that we should look at in every city in the country because alone the government or the private sector cannot handle vaccination of such a huge population. And if every city, the public-private partnership takes on, holds hands and says, let's do vaccination aggressively. I will give you an example. In Pune city, we have um, industrialists and one of the industrialists had taken it upon himself he has formed a COVID positive response group where he has involved doctors, um, administrators from various private hospitals, government hospitals. Then there are industrialists who are ready to help. And they, the way the, the entire group worked during the second wave, getting oxygen concentrators from anywhere and everywhere, getting PPE, providing it to the government hospitals, sending it to the rural areas. So similarly, I think if vaccination is done, by the public-private partnership aggressively, it is only then that we will be able to avert or prolong and reduce the peak of the third wave. And the goal of real healthcare reform must be high quality universal coverage in a very cost-effective way. So if we think that compliance is expensive, then we should tell the administrators that try non-compliance. 
and that is where the expenses will go up and we will know that where we stand and another thing that i think one of the challenges that covid taught us was that we should involve just as we talk infection prevention and control practitioners involving the clinicians who are the end users involving the administrators i think involving the consumers involving people the public at large plays a very important role which we saw in covid to tackle infection prevention and control i mean if covid taught everybody to take care of themselves to prevent this i think i'm sure if we involve the consumer it will help us a great deal in reducing pandemics like you said parijat and like um, ekta said that it is interesting to know that what she told us but it is scary because we don't know what's next right you mentioned that what's next and that's really scary and i think that the government healthcare system has to really pep up they need to be alert they need to be at par with the global platforms for surveillance and diagnosis and percolate that from the center to the state to individual cities and unless we do that actively i don't know how we are going to avert future pandemics so i mean that's how i look at it and i feel that again coming back to public private partnership i would highlight and say that that is the way forward for all of us in a cost effective way to control what we have now i have a few questions to for each of the speakers and um, for dr ravi i would like to ask what policy would you suggest in hospitals for transplants corneal transplants that you mentioned and uh, eg electrodes do we have a policy in place because the cases are really low and far and few but it is picking up so is dr ravi there is he there or he's not there doesn't seem to be there okay then we no 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 ma'am he's not there okay because i was just wondering that should we uh, parijat can you throw some light on this that should we have a policy on uh, tackling prions for eeg electrodes as a part of our infection control manual uh, yeah uh, see i mean uh, it is the uh, hospitals which cater to these group of patients they need to have their policies because it is tough to uh, kill the prions neither with alkalis nor with the acids it takes longer time for uh, the prions to be killed so definitely there needs to be a policy pla uh, placed in specific hospitals where they are you know uh, tackling these patients very but true. i have not read i have not read any uh, uh, any 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 infection control uh, documents where you know this is mentioned that is why you know that's why i was yeah. just wondering that Does anybody need to really put it as part of the protocol yeah. uh, as a part of their infection like yeah please please i just please. wanted to add that i was reading about prions being an obstetrician so uh, i just saw a news item that france has banned you know further research on prions in seven laboratories after some of the healthcare workers they got infected and some of them even died during handling of this so i think what you are uh, saying is very in need of the hour we should have some policy on that right right so i think that's one take home message that and, we could all nita and we need to know what is the prevalence of the prions exactly. in, in common hospitals we are not we are not knowing about that there's no data on this and maybe it's too late by the time we come to know so i think yeah. that is somewhere where we need to focus and see that if we are talking about prions then we should know the prevalence and then the importance and significance of whether we should really look at it as a policy and making a policy in the hospital because it should not be uh, uh, you know impinging on the resources unnecessarily exactly so we have to look at it from a cost effective point of view cost effective point yeah okay then another point ha huh? another point that i wanted to make from lessons learned uh, for dr khan was social media plays a very important role we talk about evidence based medicine but i think social media can make or break a pandemic and that's what we saw during this whatsapp messages coming galore uh, instagram messages on the news they're only highlighting we see sometimes only the negative news coming and i think the role of social media can be very positively used in these pandemics to prevent 
fear psychosis amongst the people. And that I don't know whether we really used it positively during the second wave. It created a lot of fear psychosis amongst the people. So that was one of the things that I thought um, we should little, um, you know, I don't know what we can do or whether we can focus on it, but we can definitely talk about it and somewhere down the line convey it in some form or the other that the governments can hear it. One question I had was, I don't know if Dr. Khan is there or he's also left. With the herd immunity, here, you're there, Dr. Khan? Okay, what in your view is the concept of herd immunity? Would it work? You are in community medicine, so that's Yes, uh, uh, yes. Uh, herd immunity actually, the, uh, her, herd immunity works. Uh, there is uh, evidence uh, that herd immunity works. And uh, even at this time, uh, these uh, zero surveillance studies that have been done, it shows that the large uh, proportion of population has got these antibodies. But the question remains when I, when I, because we all discuss it with the different, on different platforms, we find that whether this antibody that is being measured, is it the right antibody to be measured? Is this antibody which is giving protection or there is something else because uh, the way the breakthrough infections happened uh, in amongst the vaccinated, uh, even though vaccine, the antibodies were very high, but then also we found uh, people uh, suffering from COVID, they got getting affected with COVID. So this question still remains. I think it's a research area still remains that which is the part of the antibody, which type of antibody, which type of cell is actually giving the protection? Are we measuring that? If we are doing that, then yes, if that is there in the population, that herd immunity definitely will work. That is my response. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, that brings me to the same question, another question to Dr. Chawla, that uh, when she talks about the golden week concept, vaccinating people, vaccinated people do get infected again, and but they have minimal symptoms, right? Vaccinated people have very minimal symptoms. This delays testing. So do you have any suggestions, Dr. Chawla, on how to control this kind of infection spread? No, so vaccinated so people are, are, are less likely to develop a severe they disease infected, or less likely right? to die. But then the they can very well pick up the symptom onset. So what the thought is that the moment new symptoms start, the moment patient feels unwell, there are signs of an upper respiratory, maybe low respiratory infection, that is the time when instead of thinking of other possibilities in the midst of a pandemic, COVID should be done upfront within one or three days of symptom onset, whether you're vaccinated or not vaccinated in material. So that is the time when if the test is done and the diagnosis is proven, uh, then, then the rest of the casket can follow. Understandably, these patients who have been vaccinated will stay at home, will recover, will not need hospitalization. Oh, yeah. But to think that you've been vaccinated and therefore you need not get the test done, that is a wrong thought process, which can end up spreading the virus. Because exactly. the, the second thought to that would be that uh, this is not COVID. So you will end up, uh, the person might end up going to the, um, uh, I'm continuing so working. I, I'm and telling you from experience recently, I know people who've had both doses of the vaccine like two months back. Common cold, just runny nose, nothing else. One of them had just a slight malaise. Another person had just a runny nose. So they, and one of them had chills and fever and they went for doing dengue malaria testing. By the way, they said, okay, do COVID, do RT-PCR. I mean, main priority was dengue malaria and it's tested positive. Now, these are the cases who may end up spreading, spreading the disease and causing the wave. So however hard we may try, but this is what uh, so probably I think the worrying. medical fraternity can make a big difference here because if doctors insist that no, this test should be done, then probably the patients would listen. But if we ask oh, yeah. them to tell the patient but these that, are doctors. Okay. I'm telling you about doctors. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. And that brings me to another question that what is your thought okay. on opening up of the economy? Like now there's a lot of talk. People are crying horse at 18 months enough now open up the economy what are your thoughts that should we open up and wait for herd immunity or just bit the open up but follow the precautions so many studies have shown that the travel restrictions and all are of no use at this point 
So at this point, lockdowns and travel restrictions won't help. It is individual contribution, individual COVID uh, protocols. Uh, yeah, protocols that are going to help. So if if I have to go to the market, I can very well decide that I follow my precautions, do my job, and come back home rather than uh, not right. following the precautions and spending more time there. So that individual contribution is the most important thing at this point, I think. Thank you. Mr. Can we wind up in just one uh, one uh, last question to Ekta? Just mm -hmm. one last question to Ikta, that uh, she talked about uh, increasing the viral diagnostic labs. Two questions, actually. One, uh, Dr. Khan mentioned which antibody should we test if we are testing for herd immunity. And second, viral diagnostic labs, she mentioned, absolutely right. But then they have to be cost effective and at government level. So if she could just tell us about which antibody to test, just for the students, I would say yeah. they are there. So we, um, so uh, first, uh, which antibodies to do? So see the viruses and the antibodies, the IgG, SARS-CoV-2, then that we are preventing the infection. They are there to prevent the severe disease because the nasal, it is not a nasal spray. So if you're doing an IgG blood level testing, that just shows you that it can neutralize if there is a rapid viremia and other the side effects. So I believe, these IgG antibody measurement will only tell you that the body's response is there and we will not land up having a severe disease. The infection is up to you for a COVID-appropriate behavior, not allow the virus to enter into your nasal passage. Now, if you really want to see a vaccine, so in the Delta variant, we have also published 80% of our uh, both dose recipient got a Delta variant, including myself and my entire family in Delhi. And uh, we were all vaccinated, but I had a very mild flu, uh, you know, not even fever. It was just an upper respiratory uh, infection that I got. Ideally, in a vaccine breakthrough, when we study, we look for the neutralizing antibody to the receptor binding domain of the virus, because that is the virus behind, if you're talking about the antibodies. Uh, talk uh, Very quickly, uh, telling about the uh, upgradation of the viral diagnostic labs. Yes, COVID has at least given us something in increasing our microbiologist capacity of doing. Earlier, I know RT-PCR used to be a very difficult thing, and now each and all of us, we know, we know sigmoid curve, we know the CT values, we know target genes. And so I really want that this should be piggybacked. And, uh, you know, we should be not doing only restricted to this, other respiratory viruses testing in a cost effective Man, exactly. yes, because yes. multiplexing syndromic testing is the need of the R, but they are so expensive, you have to bring down the cost. So in our we country, must affordability, have, have, affordability, yes. Yeah, but if we can make so many indigenous SARS-CoV-2 kits in six months' time, I think it is the time that we should put, tap a potential of making multiplex respiratory virus or syndromic diagnostic panels available, which are RT-PCR, and they are very cheap. And uh, with the very small turnaround time, because if you're not giving the report to the clinicians, it's of no use. So let's Thank give you. that task to his C to take it to the government. Yes. Thank yes. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much, everybody. Thank you, the chairperson. Yeah. See you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, chairperson, so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Parijal, Dr. Tamkeen Khan, and all these speakers of the session. And now I think we are already late and we should move on towards the next session of the day. That is again a very important one. This is the last symposium, symposium for today. And the topic of discussion is urinary tract infections. And we all know that how important UTIs are because almost a number of females, they suffer sometimes in their life with UTI and how problem, problematic it is for the gynecologists, for the medicine people and for the microbiologists to get it treated. Uh, to chair this session, I am honored to invite Dr. Meher Rizri, ma'am, who is the chairperson, coordinator, speaker, everything for this session. And uh, she is Associate Professor, Department of Microbiology and Immunology, Sultan Qaboos University. She is the International Ambassador for Society for Healthcare Epidemiology of America. She was awarded Young Scientist at JNMCH Aligarh and has more than 100 research papers published and a number of uh, papers in line to get published. And she is the one uh, a role model for all of us to follow. <laughs> that is what all. Uh, that is what all I can say. Thank you so much, ma'am, for giving so much time. Since afternoon, we have engaged you today <laughs> from your busy schedule. Ma'am, your uh, microphone is off.
माइक्रोफोन इज ऑफ अनम्यूट मै मैम मैम प्लीज I think she is going to take help from someone to unmute the mic. मैम 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 प्लीज एक्चुअली डिस्कनेक्ट योर हेडफोन और समथिंग इफ यू हैव कनेक्टेड प्लीज um what's happening um uh, uh, manas uh, you can just display the ma'am ma'am ma just connected ma'am uh, okay. just wait for another right. one minute right. yeah yeah that's right unmute ma'am maybe ma'am has some issue in uh... oh may i do the honors of uh, introducing dr juhi bharat kalita so that we can start the session she is director of laboratory services and senior consultant of microbiology in ayur sundara super specialty hospital and i have heard a lot of good words about her from dr meher rizvi who is working in coordination with uh, dr juri bharat kalita ma'am and she has got junior best paper prize competition um, in 2003 in the indian association of microbiologists and i hope uh, we can just start the session and would love to hear from you ma'am good evening everybody um uh, can i uh, uh, can i do i would like to uh, remove the recorded i'd like to do it live oh uh, sure the recorded yeah. version yeah sure. uh can i share yes yes ma'am please uh, yeah okay good evening everybody um i'd like to thank the organizers of isicon for uh, inviting me to be a part of this conference and uh, we've i've gone through really very lovely presentations uh, today and yesterday uh, so i'm going to be speaking on diagnostic stewardship of urinary tract infections um what is diagnostic stewardship vis-a-vis -vis antibiotic stewardship why is it necessary uh in particular with a uh, urinary tract infection so uh, we all know uh, about antibiotic stewardship strategies and the main aim is to improve clinical outcomes by re reducing unnecessary microbial administration and optimizing the use of antibiotics and to prevent uh, the risks of inappropriate administration like adverse drug effects etc cetera, etc cetera. so uh, the basic focus of you using a uh, an antimicrobial stewardship program is to modulate antimicrobial use after their initiation whereas diagnostic stewardship strategies ultimately aim to have the same goal of reducing the use of antimicrobial so that we can avoid all the associated risks the primarily it uh, it aims to reduce unnecessary detection of asymptomatic bacteriuria um a lot of uh, 
asymptomatic bacteriuria is unnecessarily treated by empirical antimicrobials. And the diagnostic stewardship one, the, uh, intends to go one, st uh, one step upstream to antibiotic stewardship uh, to tackle this program. And the interventions uh, that a diagnostic stewardship program uses starts from the point of the diagnostic test request and ends at, uh, at each step of uh, diagnostic test reporting. So basically, because the final goal is same, it will work synergistically with antimicrobial stewardship interventions. So it is important to have an antibiotic uh, microbial stewardship program before starting uh, or together with an, a diagnostic stewardship program. So uh, why, what is the need for a diagnostic stewardship program, particularly with reference to the urinary tract infections? Urinary tract infections, uh, including the catheter-associated UTIs, are amongst the most common bacterial infections in both inpatient and outpatient settings. The challenges with appropriate uh, diagnosis of urinary tract infections remain, particularly because of the, of the lack of specific signs and symptoms. Uh, even the diagnostic criteria are really not definitive, and there's a lot of variance globally from organization to organization, from author to author. There's a very high incidence of asymptomatic bacteriuria. Contamination of microbiology samples for, of urine continue to be uh, an issue. And uh, frequently, the indications which are used for ordering urine cultures are nonspecific. So, Excessive antimicrobial treatment of asymptomatic bacteriuria and contaminated urine cultures continues to be, and it's quite common. So the interventions, like all other interventions, would use things like education and training, use of feedback, particularly when there is inappropriate uh, treatment or antimicrobial use of a urinary tract infection to modulate uh, the future, future programs and treatments uh, to make sure that there are guidelines uh, for the indication requirements to train the healthcare workers so that correct indication requirements are used and use of something called the reflex culture policies, uh, which I will be coming uh, to later in the presentation. So, the aim would be to have an antimicrobial stewardship and a diagnostic stewardship program. The interventions of both of them need to work synergistically and to order the decreasing of uh, ordering of urine cultures, which are uh, you know with, without any clear indication, so that there is prevention of excessive antimicrobial administration in patients without clearly defined urinary tract infections. Very quickly, statistics of urinary tract infections, I'm using US data here for the sake of convenience. It's amongst the most common bacterial infections in the US. Approximately 10 lakh emergency visit uh, departments are there in the US for UTI. There are approximately one lakh hospitalizations. It is the fourth most commonly reported hospital uh, acquired infection. And over 25 patient percent of the hospitalized patients in the US are catheterized at some time or the other during their hospital admission. There has been a recent meta-analysis analysis, uh, where they were uh, around 2,000 cases of anti-asymptomatic uh, bacteriuria were reported to have a pooled treatment rate of as high as 45%. And this illustrates the magnitude of inappropriate antimicrobial use. So uh, the signs and symptoms of urinary tract infection are, can be nonspecific and difficult to ascertain. So the nonspecific features for which a, uh, a culture is usually ordered includes fever, leukocytosis, and uh, if there is a localized symptom, which is referable to the urinary tract, like suprapubic tenderness, costovertebral angle tenderness, frequency of urine urgency or dysuria, uh, then in cognitively intact patients who have a normal uh, genital urinary tract and they can explain their symptoms, the diagnosis is pretty straightforward. But the problem is much more challenging in eliciting genital urinary symptoms in patients who have limited ability to communicate their symptoms. So this is just a representation of uh, 
the how different site sets of criteria are used in different places across the world and none of the criteria are actually clinically validated if you see uh, this the proposed criteria by McGear and colleagues, they have mentioned things like worsening mental status, worsening functional status as criteria for their whatever organization. And if you see another one by Loeb and colleague, uh, they have mentioned gross hematuria, urinary continence. So if you could, you, the, the, what I'm trying to say here is that the sets of criteria to uh, diagnose a urinary tract infection vary a lot from area to area. Um, so uh, there is a very high incidence of asymptomatic bacteria. So um, bac the bacteria which, which are you know, uh, which come out in patients with asymptomatic bacteria, they're not evil. You do not treat something that's not evil. Uh, asymptomatic bacteria is defined as a colony count of more than 10 to the power of five, uh, power of five in two consecutive urine specimens, if it's a woman, and in one specimen, if it's a man, there has to be complete absence of signs and symptoms. And if it's a single catheterized urine specimen and that has a colony count of more than 10 to the power of two in the absence of signs and symptoms, that is also asymptomatic bacteria. The problem with ASB is that there's a huge variation in incidence by patient population. So in healthy individuals, it could be as uh, around five to 15% in elderly patients who are in long-term facilities, it's as high as 30 to 60%. In patients who have an indwelling catheter, there is an increase of 3 to percent per day. And it, in chronically catheterized patients, they all eventually develop ASP. So it's a 100% uh, incidence. Now, COTI definition currently requires that the urine catheter has to be in place for at least two days. And the urine growing, uh, the, the, there has to be a growth of more than 10 to the power of uh, 5 CFU of at least one organism. And there has to be one predefined sign of infection. That sign of infection could be either a fever or any of the other localized ones. And this, uh, again, highlights the difficulty in having a correct diagnosis or a correct indication of advising a urine culture. Again, <clears throat> Another problem with urine cultures is contamination is very, very common. And even uh, though urine culture remains to be the golden standard, despite all its limitations, cultures become contaminated with periurethral, vaginal, perineal uh, flora, et cetera, because of the location of the, you know, the outlet. And this uh, leads to a lot of false positive results in the microbiology laboratory. So, <laughs> Uh, urine cultures are often ordered without a valid clinical indication. The commonest uh, uh, clinical indication is fever and leukocytosis, non-specific -sym uh, symptoms. There was a study by Lees and colleagues where uh, they found out that 68% of uh, uh, urine cultures were ordered without a valid clinical indication. In fact, they found out a specific... Uh, uh, indications which were as vague as confusion, weakness, dizziness, as dysglycemia, um, you know, as, uh, as indications for sending a urine culture. Um, they also found out that the important driver of inappropriate urine culture and treatment was the knowledge deficit with respect to diagnosis and management of ASB amongst the healthcare workers. In fact, even when ASP was diagnosed correctly, 47% of the respondents indicated that they would still prescribe antimicrobials. And this highlights the importance of educational initiatives uh, uh, made by uh, organizations. Uh, one of them is the American Board of Internal Medicine Foundation. And they started an initiative called the Choose Widely Campaign, and which was found to be quite successful. So, the opportunities of uh, diagnostics to which arise because suboptimal urine culturing is common, wasteful, and potentially harmful. And implementing some or all of these interventions has the potential to decrease excessive urine ordering and antimicrobial prescription in an additive fashion. Uh, the diagnostic stewardship interventions can be done <clears throat> uh, in 
in several points of this process from which starts with culture reporting and ends, uh, sorry, culture ordering and ends with culture uh, reporting. So uh, the interventions uh, are suggested at the point of ordering, at the point of urine collection and transportation, at the point of urine processing in the laboratory. Um, th there is this thing called reflex urine culturing. So you use certain indications uh, to, you know, to go ahead with a urine culture and report it, um, and at the point of urine culture reporting. So what are the interventions which uh, have been tried out at the point of ordering interventions, um, urine culture, uh, sorry, interventions during urine culture ordering? Uh, first and foremost, cultures should be ordered only when clinical indications are met. and. Uh, in asymptomatic patients, culture should be ordered only if there is an evidence-based indication, for example, if it's a pregnant woman or prior to a, a transurethral resection or a to prior, prior to a urologic procedure. Uh, the UC orders should be uh, reduced by providing the clinical staff with written guidance coupled with education that communicates the appropriate indications for urine uh, cultures. So there was uh, this initiative uh, taken by Trotner and colleagues, which is which is called the Kicking Cotty, the No Knee Jerk um, Microbials Antimicrobials Initiative, and what they did here was they reviewed appropriately and inappropriately managed cult cultures, and uh, they. Um, they, they, they took that as a learning opportunity, went back and uh, modulated the way the algorithms were made and, uh, you know, the cultures were ordered. And uh, this was quite successful. Uh, another intervention which has been used successfully is using the pop-up message. Whenever a urine culture is uh, ordered, there is a, a pop-up that comes in the, uh, the in the electronic uh, thing medical system the, uh, against urine testing in the absence of uh, treatments uh, of symptoms and treatment of um, and uh, against treatment of asymptomatic bacteria. Uh, now, the methods uh, that were tried out by the various authors for optimizing urine. Uh, cultures are not without uh, their faults. There was something called an alert fatigue, which was uh, associated with the constant pop-up in the EHR messaging. And in a busy schedule, uh, the nurses found this quite, uh, uh, it was a nu nuisance for them. There were also misconceptions about appropriate urine inductions where the nurses had autonomy to place orders. Again, uh, an emphasis on educating the nurses. And the nurses also said that every time, uh, whenever the physicians were uh, placing orders, the nurses had difficulty in connecting with the physicians to clarify orders. So this was hampering the work and becoming a nuisance. Uh, <clears throat> intervention at the level of urine collection. So uh, urine collection needs to be collected, uh, urine specimen needs to be collected in a manner that minimizes contamination. We all know uh, the importance of perineal cleansing and clean catch midstream urine technique for women uh, while, urine, uh, while uh, collecting urine, but we also know that this is not really uh, practiced. Uh, also, when urine is collected from urine catheters, it should never be collected from uh, the, the catheter bag. Uh, it should only be collected from the sampling pot because the lumen <clears throat> of the, the catheter develops a biofilm and the bacteria stay there and they contaminate it. They contaminate the sample uh, leading to cultures uh, positivity even in asymptomatic uh, cases, uh, sorry, in ASVs. Uh, <clears throat> another intervention at uh, the level of uh, uh, was, was uh, studied by Malin and colleagues, what they did was they initiated uh, competency assessments. Uh, they started competency assessments of the persons who were, who were initiating um, catheter insertion. They implemented a nurse-driven protocol for removing urine catheters. They started a campaign to enhance the EHR uh, documentation, and they uh, they, they insisted on the use of urine collection uh, of uh, urine in collection tubes which contained preservatives. 
Uh, from uh, their intervention, they found that the, there was almost a 50% reduction in uh, the number of urine cultures sent post-intervention. Even the COTI rates came down by almost 40%. So uh, at the level of urine culture processing, interventions uh, <clears throat> uh, should, uh, I mean, these were the following interventions suggested. First of all, at the point of receipt, they, uh, it should be ensured that the urine has been collected in a sterile leak-proof container only, or if it has not been collected properly, it should be rejected. Any urine that has to be kept for more than two hours needs to be refrigerated at two to 10 degrees, or a boric acid preservative should be used to preserve the urine. And this adequately preser preserves the urine for up to 24 hours. If a urine specimen has been sent in an unpreserved vial, then uh, and it is more than two hours old, then the urine should be rejected and a new sample should be asked for. Any inoculation of urine should only be done by a calibrated lab and incubated at the correct temperature. And organisms should proceed for further testing only if they are normal urogenital microbiota and not otherwise. Uh, now, <clears throat> uh, this, there's this in intervention called the reflex urine culturing intervention, uh, which is a relatively novel approach to reducing unnecessary urine cultures. Now, this intervention says that urine cultures need to be per uh, performed only if predefined criteria are met on urine analysis. So at the time of urine analysis, uh, the leukocyte, leukocyte uh, ester status should be positive. There should be more than 10 to the power, uh, you know, 10 leukocytes per high power field. The nitrite status should be positive and uh, there should be presence of bacteria on microscopy. Now at the level of uh, reporting of urine cultures, even though reporting interventions do not mitigate unnecessary urine culturing, they do reduce the number of inappropriate initiation of antibiotic therapy or the unnecessary use of broad spectrum antibiotics. Now, there was a study by McCulty and all where they demonstrated that there was an effective shift of, uh, uh, of you know, uh, of asking for, um, you know, of, of cephalosporin, uh, sorry, amoxicillin clavinenate use when amoxicillin clavinenate uh, susceptibility testing was not given in the reports, only cephalosporin was given in the report. And the replacement was found uh, to reduce the number of amoxiclav uh, prescriptions given. So selective reporting of antimicrobial susceptibilities, it reduces the antimicrobial prescriptions for the treatment of ASB. Uh, further to this, uh, there, uh, there were uh, attempts by Linares and all where uh, these tried to use an educational memorandum added it to the charts of the patient receiving the systemic antimicrobials. This memorandum, reminded the providers of available evidence against ASB and referred them to the institutional guidelines for treating of UTI. They found that the antimicrobial utilization was significantly lower in the intervention group compared to the control. Now, Lees and colleagues uh, used a more radical approach, which was similar to what was uh, used by Daly and colleagues, where they completely seized the routine reporting of urine culture in non-catheterized patients. Uh, so in view of the urine culture, a message would be posted on the EMR, which would say that most positive urine cultures in non-catheterized patient represents ASB and to call the lab for release of the results. Results were released when requested by the provider, and they found that the rate of antimicrobial therapy of ASB decreased from 48 to 12%. Uh, in conclusion, Although urinary tract infections and cotti diagnosis are common in ambulatory long-term and acute care settings, they're poorly defined clinical criteria and diagnosis of true urine infection still remains challenging. Adding to this challenge, ASP is common, approaches 100% in chronically catheterized patients and is often misdiagnosed as urinary tract infection, resulting in unnecessary antimicrobial exposure. So diagnostic stewardship, which is upstream of antimicrobial stewardship can assist in limiting overdiagnosis of uh, 
UTI and reduce the unnecessary antimicrobial treatments. Interventions that require a clear indication when ordering the cultures reflects U UC policies and selective reporting of results have potential to significantly decrease false positive urine cultures and limit prescribing of unnecessary antimicrobials. Um, obviously, uh, to understand the additive if, uh, effects of both uh, these stewardship programs, the antimicrobial and the diagnostic, and the synergistic uh, you know, uh, effects of the, both the programs, future research is warranted. Um, to see if we have, we actually have a, you know, a practical, uh, true clinical benefit. So I have this chart here where uh, the interventions at various points are listed out, but I mean, it's, um, you, you can't read this out, so yeah, so I'll leave this. And um, thank you very much, uh, Maria. Yeah. Thank you, Juri. That yeah. was absolutely lovely and uh, very interesting uh, presentation, Juri, where yeah. uh, you highlighting the importance of diagnostic stewardship and how we should not treat the catheter and how we should not treat a, a culture report and we should go back to the clinical uh, signs and symptoms. So over treatment is absolutely out and uh, good diagnostic that is upstream of antimicrobial stewardship is absolutely in. And I'm very happy that Hisi took up this particular topic because while we're talking about bloodstream infection and you know complicated skin and soft tissue infection and complicated uh, intra-abdominal infection, for some reason, UTI takes the back, uh, backstage, which is absolutely, I think, unwarranted because the quantum of antibiotics given in simple UTI is unprecedented. And if we want to bring in antibiotic stewardship, we need to move to an ambulatory patients. And the one ambulatory group which we need to target is UTI. So exceedingly important topic, Dr. Fatma and Isikon for bringing it up. And I think for the sake of uh, saving time, we will proceed to the next uh, lecture topic, uh, talk, and then we will discuss the questions in the resolving the issues. So we very warm welcome to Dr. Firoz Mohammad Khan, who is a consultant urologist and renal transplant surgeon in Sahara Super Speciality Hospital. We're indeed very happy to have you here. He has started the kidney transplantation program, which is absolutely wonderful. So it will be great to have your inputs on the treatment uh, review of UTI guidelines. Dr. Firoz, the floor is yours. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Firoz Mohammad Khan. I'm a consultant urologist working at Sahara Super Speciality Hospital, Lucknow. First of all, I want to thank the organizers of PCCon 2021 for giving me the opportunity to present the talk on urinary tract infection guidelines. So what are the objectives of uh, UTI guidelines? The first uh, objective is to distinguish between the asymptomatic bacteriuria from urinary tract infection. The others are to identify the population of the patients who require testing and treatment for asymptomatic bacteria and those who do not require treatment for this issue. And to recommend what are the recommendations of empiric treatment for UTI before the urine culture reports are available and to discuss the opportunities for de-escalation of antibiotic therapy uh, once the symptoms are under control uh, from the in the initial phase. So this slide shows there are some few questions which we can consider. The first question is, does my patient, this is, I'm talking about the clinical scenario. So does my patient have an infection that requires antibiotic treatment? This uh, will uh, will throw a light on uh, with this question about the asymptomatic bacteria, where to treat, where not to treat, and uh, those are the groups who are high risk for uh, asymptomatic bacteria and their requirement. Second is, have I ordered appropriate cultures before spirating antibiotic therapy? 
like uh, the urine cultures in some cases blood cultures also and what the empirical therapy should be to initiate in the beginning so once a few days have passed now uh, can i stop the antibiotics in case of uti or can i uh, once in, in the initial phase we start with the broad spectrum antibiotic therapy and after few days once the culture reports are available or when the symptoms are uh, improved can i narrow the therapy or change the indications from iv antibiotics to oral therapy and what should be the duration of treatment overall so coming to the asymptomatic bacteria by definition it is the urinary growth of uh, bacteria in an asymptomatic individual and this is very common uh, it corresponds to commensal colonization of bacteria into the urinary tract so actually it is beneficial for a person because sometimes this asymptomatic bacteria it prevents the super infecting symptomatic uti so uh, if uh, we consider the uh, this is the incidence like in healthy pre this mini bacterial woman it has been seen that is 1 to 5% of patients uh, they have symptomatic bacteria without any symptoms but it is more common in uh, the long term care residents like old age people it whether male or female those who are in the institutionalized uh center they have the highest incidence of asymptomatic bacteria and similarly the patients who are on catheter urinary catheter or uh, they are also probably catheter they are also having a very high incidence of asymptomatic bacteria uh, similarly you can see here uh, patients with the diabetes the male or female or patients who are on hemodialysis they also have asymptomatic bacteria now uh, pyuria the asymptomatic bacteria patients uh, they have asymptomatic pyuria also means the wbc in the urine so similarly here also you can say like asymptomatic bacteria the pyuria also present in same group like patients who are on long term catheters patients on dialysis elderly institutionalized patients pregnant women women with diabetes they have is symptomatic pyuria also but a pyuria patient patient uh, where the pyuria is there is symptomatic uh, with the asymptomatic bacteria it does not indicate infection so antibiotic treatment is not required in most of the cases there are only few conditions where we have to treat the asymptomatic pyuria or asymptomatic bacteria so and sometimes we have to consider the other causes of pyuria also like sexually transmitted diseases interstitial nephritis here we get the asymptomatic pyuria but uh, as i said earlier like uh, the asymptomatic bacteria treatment is not required in all the cases very very few cases very few conditions where we have to treat this asymptomatic bacteria so it is common in healthy non pregnant women diabetic patients long term indwelling catheters so patients who are elderly and uh, in the community or nursing home residents elderly people elderly nursing home residents renal transplant patients patient undergoing orthopedic surgeries or those who have dysfunctional urinary bladder like high pvr or where the any reconstructive surgery of lower impact has been done they also have asymptomatic bacteria very high incidence of asymptomatic bacteria but these group of people they doesn't require treatment for this asymptomatic bacteria because if you treat the asymptomatic bacteria just like in uh, any any patient or any condition uh, there is a high chances of adverse events adverse reactions of those antibiotics development of resistance very common towards the bacteria with multiple medication and uh, there are also increased risk of subsequent uti as i earlier said that asymptomatic bacteria actually they are commensal colonization of bacteria so they protect against the super infecting symptomatic uti so if we treat this asymptomatic bacteria there will be subsequent symptomatic uti maintenance status changes and asymptomatic bacteria bacteria and delirium 
this can occur both independently in elderly people patients who have symptomatic uti they may present with the delirium the but it is they usually they present independently but they sometimes they present together also so if a patient who is having signs and symptoms of systemic infection and is having delirium so here this is the group where empirical antibiotic therapy is uh, needs to be started early now this slide is very important because i was i was telling there are only few indications of uh, treating screening and treating of asymptomatic bacteria so only two conditions the first is pregnant women those who are uh, having pregnancy they if they are on evaluation they found to have asymptomatic bacteria or asymptomatic pyuria they need treatment because here if you treat these patients it prevents the palynephritis in the mother it prevents the preterm labor and low birth weight babies for the uh, infant so this group is very important here we have to treat the uh, the asymptomatic bacteria the other group is where any urological pro procedure is planned where the mucosa breach is expected like uh, uh, if we are going for patient is going for a turp like transurethral resection of prostate stone kidney stones operation or stone in the ureter or stone in the urinary bladder uh, in those cases the screening should be done in culture prior in culture should be available and if culture is positive they needs to be treated because if we don't treat they may land up in sepsis urosepsis so these are the only two groups where we have to screen and treat the that asymptomatic bacteria but the one exception is the patient if we have to place a catheter so in this case placing a catheter doesn't require uh, to screen for a bacteria present or not and uh, not to treat similarly the candidiuria that is candida infection or candida presence of candida hyphae in the uh, urine so if the pd if these patients are asymptomatic they also treatment is not required in this group so where the asymptomatic candidiuria we can see in immunocompromised patients patients with severe disability debilitating disease or those who are on prolonged catheterization they may develop candidiuria but if they are asymptomatic they doesn't require any kind of treatment so coming to the urine analysis and culture so urine uh, urine analysis and culture is required when the patient is having symptoms of uti like high grade fever flank pain malaise and chills if these symptoms are there it, it indicates a kind of pyelonephritis or here the urine culture and urine analysis both are mandatory so but if only foul smelling or cloudy urine is present in an asymptomatic individual urine culture is not required routinely just for any admission or any surgery apart from the urological procedures here the urine culture to sending urine culture is not required routinely just before and after catheter change urine culture is not required as a fever workup is also not uh, culture is not advised it because it is not a test of cure and ensure that urine cultures are tracked properly a positive positive urine analysis presenting a, about 10 wbcs per high power field per ml is considered significant leukocyte assays test positive means wbcs are present and if the nitrites are present positive it means bacteria is present in the urine so it means ki uh, this is a positive urine analysis when the wbcs are more than 10 positive urine culture means if this urine culture this sample was collected just on a void sample no catheter is there here the colony count of more than 10 to the power 4 to 10 to the power 5 colony forming units per ml is considered a significant amount of urinary pathogen so this urine culture will be considered as positive but if 
the sample of urine is being collected by placing a catheter or by some super pubic uh, method. Here, a very less amount of bacteria, like more than 1000 colony forming units per ml of bacteria, is also considered as positive. And blood culture is required when we are suspecting palinocytes or urosepsis. Otherwise, blood culture is sufficient. So here is this condition uncomplicated cystitis, the bladder infection, which is uncomplicated. So in this case, the empirical therapy is oral only. Uh, initially, fluoroquinolones were being very were used like very frequently, but because of very high incidence of resistance and side effects to the fluoroquinolones, it is no longer considered as first line therapy. So now the what is the first line therapies in, in uncomplicated cystitis? The first line therapies are two. The first, the number one is phosphomycin trometrol, a single dose therapy for uncomplicated cystitis. And the second is nitrofurantoin. And the duration of nitrofurantoin is 100 milligram twice a day for five days. The third alternative is trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. Second, the second line option is oral cephalosporins for uncomplicated cystitis. If uh, we have a prior urine culture uh, available, then we should uh, take the urine culture and we can, uh, this urine culture can guide us in empirical therapy. Once the oral antibiotics are started or the patient is uh, on IV antibiotics, then after two days or three days, once the patient's symptoms are reduced, we have to discalate this uh, antibiotics from IV to oral. And they should be treated for three to five days with a narrow spectrum antibiotics. So this is the, uh, these are the different drugs and the dosage and duration of treatment like phosphomycin trimetrol, three gram single dose, nitrofurantoin twice a day, 100 milligram for five days, is similar to trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole for three days. What is the recurrent cystitis? So def by definition, at least three UTIs a year or two UTIs in last six months is considered as recurrent cystitis. Recurrent cystitis could be uncomplicated, could be complicated, both can occur. So this is uh, like, what are the groups of patients who have this uh, recurrent cystitis? So in young premenopausal women, the sexual intercourse and the spermicidal agents are the main causative factors for recurrent cystitis. Similarly, in postmenopausal and dirty women, the atrophic vaginitis due to lack of estrogen or decreased estrogen in the uh, tissues, the atrophic vaginitis occurs cystocene formation or because of urinary incontinence or the dysfunctional bladder like having high PVR, high post wide residual urine will lead to recurrent cystitis. So coming to the treatment options of recurrent cystitis, in case of postmenopausal and elderly women, the local vaginal estrogen creams replacements, the first and most important medications or most important treatment. Then Continuous low dose prophylaxis of uh, anti oral antibiotic, especially the nitrofurantoin, 50 milligram or 100 milligram once a day, especially at bedtime, is very effective in recurrent cystitis. For young and premenopausal women, post coital prophylaxis is also very effective. And those who are uh, educated or uh, those who are having a good compliance, uh, these patients, uh, they, they can have a self-diagnosis and self-treatment protocol also can be followed in these groups of patients. So coming to the pyelonephritis, here in empirical therapy of pyelonephritis are chloroquinolone or trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. 
they have excellent penetration into the kidney it can be given orally given excellent bioavailability of these two drugs but the e coli resistance data of a local hospital or the community has to be considered and if the resistance is greater than 20% in isolates then this should be avoided in that in those cases the second line therapy is ceftriaxone that is cephalosporin third generation cephalosporin and if there is cephalosporin allergy is there or penicillin allergy is there then gentamicin or estronam is also an option Similarly, here also de-escalation of uh, treatment coming from IV antibodies to oral antibody conversion is uh, very helpful and very important. Uh, if susceptible to fluoroquinones or primitive cephalosporin, treatment can be continued or converted to the agent and given orally. If resistance is there, then oral cephalosporin is as I earlier said. So total duration of treatment for fluoroquinones is five to seven days. In case of trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, it is 10 to 14 days of total therapy, and in case of oral cephalosporin, similarly, the 10 to 14 days total therapy is required. What is catheter-associated UTI? A patient who is on catheter develops symptoms of fever and lower abdominal pain, chills. They are suspected to have a catheter-associated UTI. It's very common in elderly people. Those who are on, on prolonged catheter uh, of any because of any reason. So here, urine culture and urine analysis uh, uh, needs to be sent. Same general approach as with a non catheter associated UTI, like patients who are on catheter, catheter should be removed before taking cultures, or it has to be changed before taking the sample. They often have a pyuria. In the because these patients are in catheter, they may have pyuria, but if they don't have symptoms of UTI, it is not considered as catheter restricted UTI. So, in cases of uh, catheter restricted UTI, a sample of urine taken with the culture with the catheter, and if the bacterial count is just more than 1000 colony farming units per ml, it is considered significant or it is considered as positive urine culture. So what is empirical therapy? Catheter to be removed if possible. Otherwise, you have to change the catheter. And other than that, the same line of treatment is there, like uh, upper tract or lower tract infections, which you treat, like palinopardis or simple uh, cystitis, the same protocol of IV antibiotics and the duration of treatment needs to be followed. De-escalation of treatment conversion from IV to paraoral, similar to the previous uh, category of uh, infection. Total duration of treatment here is also um, seven days if the symptoms resolve very fast. Otherwise, 10 to 14 days of total duration of treatment is required in case of catheter-associated UTI. UTI in males. UTI in males is very, very less likely. And if a male develops UTI, it needs proper evaluation because it is considered, in most of the time, it is considered as complicated UTI. There must be some reason, some abnormalities or stone formation is there to have a UTI in males. So most common causes of UTI in male patients are renal stone, strictures of ureters, stricture of urethra, or enlarged prostate. In old age, prostate enlarges, leads to residual urine, high residual urine, and then UTI or the prostatitis. So uh, in the young patients, the prostatitis is common. In old age, enlarged prostate is common. Other, other reasons are epididymitis or sexually transmitted infection. Complicated UTI. UTI occurring in presence of any urological abnormalities or physiological issues like dysfunctional voiding, dysfunctional high BVR, or any structural abnormality in the ureter, in the kidney, or presence of stones, strictures. This is 
and along with that if the uti is there it is, it is called complicated uti so the management of complicated uti includes the the same line of like iv or oral antibiotic depending upon the severity of illness but at the same time the treatment of the underlying cause like if there is any obstruction this obstruction needs to be relieved either by nephrostomies or stents or if the enlarged prostate is the reason then resection of the prostate uh, this the underlying condition of the uh, the underlying associative process has to be taken care of the antibiotic selection depends upon the extent of infection and the severity of illness of the patient total duration of therapy similarly if the patient is responding very promptly the seven dose therapy is enough and if the response is delayed or if this if there is a persistent obstruction here the longer course of duration of treatment is required like right? 10 to 14 days of treatment this is the about the stewardship of the urine culture ordering so the first important thing is the do not order urine culture in the absence of signs and symptoms of uti so patients with urinary catheters and those undergoing preoperative evaluation unless urinary mucosal bleeding is anticipated so only uh, where the uh, urological surgeries are planned where the mucosal breach of the uh, urinary tract is expected otherwise the urinary should not be sent in an asymptomatic patient uh you should work with the lab to determine from where and why urinary cultures are being sent to identify the targets for improvement consider reflex testing protocols with the lab and develop a tool in the phr to promptly provide the, the document indication provides to document the indication for sending a urinary culture and the positive urinary culture stewardship Uh, the first point is ask the patient if he or she is having urinary symptoms before initiating antibiotics ask the colleagues why the urine culture was sent was there a suspicion of a uti at, at some point on develop and follow guidelines for the treatment of for the treatment escalation so the take home message is send urine cultures only when you suspect uti based on clinical symptoms if symptomatic bacteria is common particularly in older people and should not be treated in the vast majority of patients uncomplicated cystitis should be treated with a short course of oral antibiotics and uti in men are rare in the absence of urinary tract pathology seven day course of therapy worked for uncomplicated pyelonephritis if you use a fluoroquinolone but there are high incidence of e coli resistance towards the fluoroquinone there are many opportunities for stewardship in improving when urine cultures are sent and non treatment of asymptomatic bacteriuria and optimization of uti therapy thank you thank you very much thank you dr firoz for that absolutely wonderful presentation you've covered a whole lot of stuff so we started with jury who talked in great detail about asymptomatic bacteria and i'm happy you picked up right from there because there is a huge crisis of over treating a uh, entity which doesn't actually exist and that is uh, you know infection in asymptomatic bacteria and i'm very happy you also talked about the the utility of actually nurturing some asymptomatic bacteria in the urinary tract and they may actually prevent infection with mdr uh, bacteria so i would like to talk more about your whatever you discuss but we'll hang on for about 20 more minutes and we'll uh, start with dr dalia's talk and then we will have a very interesting interactive uh, session so please uh, hang on jury and firoz and we'll wait for dr dalia dr dalia rafat is a assistant professor in jawaharlal nehru medical college and she's a very dynamic uh, young gynecologist she has three projects and one patent and one book to her credit and lots of publications and dr dalia the floor is yours and she's going to be discussing uh, uti in here everyone I am Dr. Talia Rafat, Assistant Professor in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, and today I will be talking about urinary tract infections in pregnancy. And my uh, resources for today's topic are these.
as we all know uti is a common health problem characterized by presence of microbial pathogens in any part of the urinary tract including kidneys ureters bladders or urethra uti is more common in women due to shorter urethra closer proximity of the anus with the vagina and easier entry of pathogenic microorganisms because by sexual activity uti is considered as the most common bacterial infection in pregnancy with increased risk of maternal and neonatal morbidity and mortality and pregnant women have to face the dual risk when they experience utis as the risk is because of the infection as well as because of the exposure to antibiotics which are used for their treatment changes in pregnancy that predispose to women to uti are urethral dilatation due to compression of the ureter from the gravid uterus smooth muscle relaxation under the effect of progesterone leading to dilatation urinary stasis and increased vesico ureteral reflux pregnancy in itself is a relative state of immunocompromise which predisposes to various infection and so uti too during labor owing to frequent urinary catheterization there is increased risk of introduction of bacteria which predispose to uti and during puerperium due to changes in bladder sensitivity and bladder over distension there is this increase susceptibility to uti factors which are associated with higher risk of bacteriuria in pregnancy include younger age history of prior urinary tract infections pre existing diabetes mellitus increased parity lower socio economic status and anatomical and functional urinary tract abnormalities as in non pregnant women e coli is the predominant uropathogen in pregnancy too and the other responsible organisms include klebsiella enterobacter proteus and gram positive organisms including group b streptococcus antimicrobial resistance is an increasing concern in pregnancy also as it is outside pregnancy and in india esbl producing uropathogen is a particular problem even in pregnant women the clinical variants of utis in pregnancy can be asymptomatic bacteriuria cystitis and urethritis or pyelonephritis adverse fetal maternal effects associated with urinary tract infections include maternal complications like preeclampsia anemia preterm labor choreomyelitis and even sepsis and the fetal complications include prematurity fetal growth restriction low birth weight and even intrauterine deaths now dealing with each type of uti in detail coming to asymptomatic bacteriuria it is presence of more than 10 to the power of 5 organisms per ml on clean cat urine analysis in an asymptomatic woman and its incidence is almost same in pregnancy as it is in non pregnant that is around 2 to 7% in pregnancy so universal screening of all pregnant women is recommended at least once in pregnancy preferably at first prenatal visit with a clean cat urine culture pre screening however is not indicated in low risk patients if first test is negative and is only indicated in high risk patients diagnostic criteria includes two consecutive voided urine specimen with isolation of same bacterial strain in counts of more than 10 to the power 5 colony forming units per ml or a single catheterized urine specimen with one bacterial species isolated in a count of more than 10 to the power 2 colony forming units per ml but in clinical practice only one voided urine specimen is obtained and diagnosis and initiation of treatment is made with the count of more than 10 to the power 5 colony forming units per ml without the need of repeat confirmatory culture so if in clinical practice even on one voided urine specimen we can 
start treatment and diagnose asymptomatic bacteriuria in pregnancy. Management includes antibiotics tailored to culture results. Short courses are preferred in order to avoid fetal exposure. Single dose regimens, however, are not as effective as slightly longer regimes. The exception being single dose phosphomycin, which is quite effective. Rationale for treatment of asymptomatic bacteriuria in pregnancy is that it reduces the risk of subsequent development of pyelonephritis, is associated with improved pregnancy outcome, and decreases the rate of clinical infection to just 3 to 4%. Antibiotics which we can opt for treatment of asymptomatic bacteriuria and cystitis in pregnancy includes nitrofurantoin in a dose of 100 mg orally BD for 5 to 7 days, amoxicillin in a dose of 500 mg orally ATRD or 875 mg orally BD again for 5 to 7 days and amoxicillin clavulinate in similar dose for 5 to 7 days. Nitrofurantoin, however, should be, it's preferable to avoid it in first and third trimester. Cephalexin and cephodoxin can again be used for a dose of, uh, for a duration of 5 to 7 days. And trimethoprim, sulfamethoxazole for 3 days. Phosphomycin, however, can be used in a single dose of 3 gram orally. As there is risk of 30% uh, women not to fail to clear asymptomatic bacteriuria following a short course therapy. So a repeat culture is recommended as a test of cure performed a week after completion of therapy. However, if no growth is obtained, there is no indication of further testing in absence of symptoms suggestive of UTI. For positive growth, Repeat treatment tailored to antimicrobial susceptibility testing is preferred and there is no need of retesting following second treatment course. Now coming to acute cystitis, it should be suspected in pregnant women who complain about new onset dysuria, frequency or urgency. And the typical symptoms of acute cystitis in pregnant women are same as that in non-pregnant women with the incidence being 1% in pregnancy. Diagnosis is confirmed by presence of bacterial growth on urine culture with a count of more than 10 to the power 3 colony forming units per ml in symptomatic pregnant women. But if bacteria isolated are not typical uropathogens like lactobacilli, then diagnosis is made only with high bacterial counts, that is 10 to the power 5 colony forming units per ml. Prior to confirming diagnosis, empiric treatment should be initiated in a patient with consistent symptoms and pyuria. Management involves initial empiric therapy, followed by, uh, which can be subsequently tailored by culture results. And for empiric therapy, we have similar options as we have for asymptomatic bacteria like cephodoxin, amoxicillin, clavulinate, phosphomycin, and nitrofurantoin. Again, short courses of 3 to 7 days are preferred to avoid unnecessary fetal exposure. However, in cases of recurrent cystitis, we call it recurrent if there are 3 or more episodes of cystitis during pregnancy, it calls for antimicrobial prophylaxis throughout pregnancy. Prophylaxis can be daily or postcoital if cystitis is thought to be sexually related only. But in condition that potentially increase the risk of urinary complications during cystitis, like diabetes or sickle cell trait, prophylaxis can be preferably started even after first episode of cystitis. Management of recurrent cystitis includes prophylactic antibiotics, in, a do, in low dose prophylaxis like nitrofurantoin in a 50 to 100 milligram oral dose, daily at bedtime or postcoital, and cephalexin, sorry, or cephalexin in a dose of 250 to 500 milligram orally, daily or postcoital. 
are coming to acute pyelonephritis, which is infection of upper urinary tract involving renal pelvis and parenchyma with an incidence of 1 to 2 percent in pregnancy. It is acute in onset and usually presents in second or third trimester. Pregnant women may become coital and are at risk of both medical and obstetrical complications. Patient can present with symptoms of fever with chills and rigors, malaise, upper lumbar pain, anorexia, vomiting, dysuria, increased frequency, and we can elicit signs of tachycardia, costal vertebral angle tenderness, the urine might be turbid or even bloody. Management includes hospital admission and empiric starting of parenteral broad spectrum beta lactams. The choice of should be guided by local microbiology, susceptibility data, and expected patient tolerance. Fluoroquinolones and aminoglycosides, which are often used for prophylaxis of pyelonephritis in non-pregnant individuals, should be avoided in pregnancy if possible. The options which we have for mild to moderate pyelonephritis includes ceftriaxone, cefepine, estronam, and ampicillin plus gentamicin if we don't have other options. Whereas for severe pyelonephritis with an impaired immune system or incomplete urinary drainage, we can opt for prisillin, tezobactam, meropenem, atropenem, doripenem. Once patient is afebrile for 48 hours, they can be switched over to oral therapy guided by culture results to complete a total of 10 to 14 days course treatment. Oral options are mainly limited to beta-lactams or trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. But if symptoms persist beyond first 24 to 48 hours of initiation of treatment, a repeat culture and renal ultrasound should be performed to rule out persistent infection and urinary tract pathology. Obstetric management in pyelonephritis it itself is not an indication for delivery. But if induction of labor or cesarean for standard obstetrical indication is planned in a patient who is on treatment of pyelonephritis, it is preferable to wait until patient is afebrile, as long as delaying delivery is relatively safe for the mother and the fetus. There are six to eight percent chances of recurrent pyelonephritis. So after an initial episode, even one episode of pyelonephritis calls for antimicrobial prophylaxis throughout remainder of pregnancy. And the options we have for Antimicrobial prophylaxis are again low dose nitrofurantoin or cephalexin. However, there is risk of breakthrough bacteriuria during preventive therapy. So, performance of at least one later culture, preferably in third trimester, is advised to ensure success of preventive therapy. And if the follow up culture is found to be positive, Antimicrobial therapies started based on susceptibility and preventive regimes should be reassessed and adjusted. So, the key takeaways for today's talk are that urinary tract infection is a common but preventable cause of maternal and perinatal morbidity and mortality. Pregnancy increases susceptibility to UTIs owing to hormonal, anatomical, and physiological changes. And UTI in pregnancy can present as asymptomatic bacteriuria, acute cystitis, or pyelonephritis. So all pregnant women should be screened for UTIs in pregnancy. Currently, urine culture is the gold standard for diagnosis. Antibiotics are standard treatment for asymptomatic and symptomatic UTIs in pregnancy. Their overuse, however, can contribute to antimicrobial resistance and unnecessarily expose the fetus to drugs. Pyelonephritis and recurrent cystitis in pregnancy 
requires prophylactic antibiotics throughout the pregnancy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Dahlia. I hope you're there. A very nice presentation again. And I think the take home message, I hope we have listeners here who are who have heard these excellent uh, talks. And when I heard them, you know, I felt I was living in utopia where everybody is talking about the perfect guidelines and how uh, things should actually be. And I hope they are exactly the way uh, it has been presented by our speakers. I'll just present my screen because I, I would love to have a little discussion uh, in the clearing of doubts and resolving uh, controversies. Uh, so just bear with me for a minute and then I'm going to come back. You cannot sc uh, start screen share while other participant is sharing. So if you could just give yeah, me yeah, that yeah, Yes, my ma'am. Ma 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 start, please. All right. Thank you. So we had an excellent discussion with the panelists on UTI, where we tried to discuss you know, the diagnostic and the antimicrobial stewardship aspects of UTI, which is so very important. And it was discussed, asymptomatic bacteria was discussed, cystitis was discussed, recurrent UTI was discussed, complicated UTI, as well as, of course, corti and pyelonephritis, simple pyelonephritis and complicated pyelonephritis. And uh, you know the important thing is that uh, asymptomatic bacteria is important in pregnancy and it is not important in a non-pregnant, uncomplicated person, including elderly people, which Dr. Firoz uh, uh, mentioned. So uh, I'd just like to ask you a couple of questions. I don't think Dr. Dahlia is here. So Dr. Firoz, uh, since you mentioned that there should be a focused investigation, uh, is there a policy for mentioning the follow following in the requisition form? Do you have an electronic system in Sahara or are you sending paper investigation slips? Yeah, actually we are sending paper investigation uh, slips. Yes, yeah. so because, yeah, yeah. So what happens, I'm talking from the microbiology end of it, and if we don't have the electronic system, so we can't go back to your patient. We don't exactly know what's happening. So uh, when you suspect cystitis or pyelonephritis, do you make, do you or your residents actually mention it on the paper slip? Uh, actually, when we send clean culture, we do, uh, it is always mentioned in our prescription, like the patient is having fever or changes, or right, or bank right. pain, whatever clinical it, symptoms, yeah, I, the patient is saying. So we, we mention it that. That is, I hope this is heard by all our other friends who are sitting on the clinical side because, you know, we're sitting with the urine sample and we see 10 to the power 5 and we don't know when it was collected and how it was transported and we have this bacteria sitting there which is resistant to maybe uh, uh, piperacillin tazobactam as well and we get really hyper and we send the report back to you. So it's important that we understand what is happening with the patient rather than really assess the urine sample. And then again, is the patient symptomatic or asymptomatic? If that information could be given to us, we will deal it in a different way. We may not process, as you mentioned so correctly, Dr. Firoz, that asymptomatic bacteria may not be a treatable syndrome at all. So if we know that, then we try to do diagnostic stewardship with that. Again, the grouse which we have is simple and complicated UTI first or recurrent episode of UTI. And are you thinking that the patient has community associated UTI or hospital acquired UTI? So uh, I would like your comments on this, Dr. Fidoz. Uh, a patient like as a patient is admitted and for a long, longer duration of uh, like stay is long. In that case, there is always a possibility of having a hospital infection. Or if the patient is earlier admitted somewhere, some other hospital, he has now partially improved, and, or he's not improving, he came back to the uh, hospital. So in that case, there is a possibility of hospital yes. infection. Otherwise, yes. yeah, of the patient Yes, so exactly. So I hope uh, if the postgraduate sitting in was usually, you know, the requisition slip is made by a junior person, and usually the postgrad or the intern. 
So if we can tell them, you know, when you are talking to them and you're sending a sample, if we just tell them that, you know, please mention the bare basic clinical data, which will of course ultimately benefit you and the patient rather than we sending a report, which has absolutely no meaning because we did not know uh, what was the, what was the, the history behind that particular sample. So empirical management, Dr. Firoz, uh, what is your go-to drug for simple cystitis? Uh, most frequently, we use naturopathic time on a OPD basis. But nowadays, uh, like phosphomycin, because it is single uh, dose therapy, so the phosphomycin also is being used very frequently now. But the problem with phosphomycin is this is phosphomycin tramadrol. Uh, there is one ingredient in this uh, product which, is, which sometimes causes the diarrhea to the patient. That has to be told upfront to the patient. Otherwise, uh, they will come back saying that I oh, am having diarrhea. The diarrhea was not there. Now I was suffering from UTI. And now I'm having diarrhea also. So that has to be told specifically yes. to the patient. Yes. That yes. That's very effective. True, true. So the phosphomycin trametrol or and uh, or uh, the uh, natoferin That is true. Doctor Jury, would you agree? Yeah. I, I, yeah, I would. Yeah, so nitroferentoin, phosphomycin, and maybe if we have the data for uh, cefazolin, as mentioned, or we have data for cefiroxime, then we could, if, if necessary, we could resort to those drugs as well. So complicated cystitis. I'd rather talk about simple pyelonephritis, Dr. Firoz. What is your go-to drug for simple pyelonephritis? Yeah, pyelonephritis also, we start with the, uh, like chloroquinolone, levofloxacin, 750 milligram once a day. And if the patient, like uh, clinically, if it's looking like a you know, uh, high grade fever, flank pain, severe flank pain, like the severity is you know, towards the uh, more severe disease, then uh, we start with uh, third generation cephalosporins also, or oral in the second generation. Otherwise, just levofloxacin sometimes is sufficient. All right. You don't think of trimethoprim uh, uh, at all, cotrimoxazole at all? Yes, yes, ma'am. It is very effective drug. But nowadays, I don't know, this drug is not being used very frequently, not very commonly. And right. this is the older drug, and but it is very effective. Very, effective. very nice. And what about urosepsis? You have a patient with urosepsis. In urosepsis with prior I history of hospitalization. It has come yeah. with urosepsis and had a prior history. What would you recommend for empiric management? Second, uh, the third patient is alosporin, along with the man glyphosate, if the serum cleared pain. Uh, like real functions are normal. Just reduce the combination of telescopic and the manipulation. That is not the first one. That is very good to hear. So you don't go to piperacillin and tazobactam straight away? Uh, no, no. no. I, uh, personally, I don't use the piperacillin and tazobactam. But if the patient is having reports with the counts of 20,000, 25,000, very high grade fever, two, three days, four days history, or the count showing uh, tones or like obstruction in the kidneys, in that case, we straight away we go to the carbapenem. Right. Carbapenem. Okay. If the serum creatinine is normal, one gram DID, if the serum creatinine is on a higher side, then we start with 500 milligram uh, three times a day. All right. Sometimes so you, 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 I see. I see. Okay. So now I'd like to ask Dr. Jury. Dr. Jury, what is, in your opinion, the importance of a local targeted antibiogram? Um, See, uh, if you're uh, you're in Lucknow, yeah, Lucknow, and you get an infection as a community person of Lucknow, so the antibiogram, you know, if from a hospital in Lucknow or the you know the the locality uh, of of, of uh, where you stay, that would be able to indicate the correct empirical drug for you. You get my point, but if you're in Muscat and you start using the antibiogram of uh, Lucknow, which is a little unlikely, like you probably be using an antibiogram of Muscat in Lucknow. Uh, I'm trying to be funny there, so, uh, <laughs> so the thing is, it wouldn't work because no, the antibiogram the pattern would be different in uh, in both areas. So the antibiogram which is used should always be a local. When you cannot use the antibiogram of Delhi for treating a patient who is local to Kohati. 
Absolutely, absolutely. So, Dr. Firoz, do you have a local antibiogram of UTI, simple UTI in your institution? Yes, ma'am. Our microbiology department, they, um, uh, time to time, they give antibiogram of the hospital. That is absolutely splendid. And that is, you know, the need of the hour uh, where the microbiology department, apart from just sending you the reports are very important. We also tell you what is the antimicrobial structure, what is the resistance pattern, and of course the etiology, so that you can tailor your guidelines as per your institution rather than following, say, national guidelines or maybe ITSA guidelines or whatever. So it is better to tailor it. And I would recommend that all microbiologists start, uh, you know, developing targeted that is simple UTI separate, uh, hospital acquired UTI antibiogram separate and so on. So Dr. Firoz, what is your go-to guideline? Uh, for uh, UTI. For, for UTI. Uh, like uh, if the patient is having just a simple cystitis, patient presented to OPD with simple cystitis, young women, no need of urine culture, just give one dose of phosphomycin from a 12 grams single dose or nitrofurantoin 100 milligram twice a day for five days. And this is the time, like 80% of the patients respond very well. They don't have any residual symptoms. Excellent. Otherwise, if they, like if their symptoms are not resolving or uh, they have a recurrent, again, uh, episode of uh, scientists, that we need a urine culture support uh, to just yes. to guide our treatment. Yes. So you've actually put the, the, the point that I wanted to place, you know, you have guidelines, right? And, and you're getting a local antibiogram from your institution, but the guidelines say that empiric management is the usual norm. A lady comes with simple cystitis, you're going to give her the treatment and send her. And if she comes back, then you're going to naturally send a sample to the microbiology laboratory. So that means that our antibiogram is skewed. It's skewed towards recurrent UTI. It's skewed towards the hospitalized patients because we don't have data of simple UTI. So what I would recommend to everybody who's listening is that can we have a policy that every third person with simple UTI, you send a sample, of course, talk to the microbiologist and say, you know, I'm sending it so that you can build me an antibiogram which is representative of simple UTI in my city or the people who are coming to my institution. I think that would be very relevant for all the clinicians. And of course, I'd, I'd like to point, I mean, I'd like, I'd, we don't have time, so I'm just going to proceed. But we need to know the resistance profile of E. coli was the most common organism. And you are aware of it. We don't have Dr. Dahlia, but I would love to also ask her if she has her antibiogram. So Dr. Jury, I would like to ask you as far as diagnostic stewardship is concerned, do you think there is any importance of uh, rapid screening in asymptomatic bacteria in pregnant no. women? No, not in uh, pregnant women. Uh, pregnant women definitely need uh, cultures to be done because there are inherent risks of having an asymptomatic bacteria, uh, you know, uh, post delivery, it could cause serious complications. So uh, definitely uh, no rapid screening methods in asymptomatic bacteria. Oh, sorry, in pregnant women. Yeah, because we'd rather just send them for culture. In Cultures, yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. So no need to waste time and money yeah. mm -hmm. in uh, rapid screening for asymptomatic. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Now, uh, we don't have Dr. Dahlia, so Dr. Jury and Dr. Firoz. This is a small case study for both of you. <laughs> <laughs> You're taking a test. <laughs> you know, it's, 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 really, it's really to understand where we are. And it's a fun, fun experience. Please don't take it personally, anybody. So we have a 24-year-old prim primary gravida who presents 32 weeks of uh, gestation with cystitis. So, Doctor Doctor Jury, what empirical therapy would you recommend in this pregnant lady? Uh, one of the cefalosporin drugs. All right, all right. So that's something which could be given, Doctor Firoz. You're not a gynecologist, but still. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. Cefalosporin is uh, definitely it is a very safe drug. Same drug. I agree absolutely, and uh, we would like to send a urine culture sample because in a in a pregnant woman we would like to actually know what is the susceptibility profile. Uh, the interesting thing is, of course, you could give a cephalosporin like cephalexin, for example, or amoxicillin if the susceptibility profile is allowing you to do that. But the good news is that nitrofurantoin and phosphomycin can be safely yeah. given in a pregnant woman, except in the first and second trimester. For, uh, in fact, just the 38 
242 weak in nitrofilin toin. So this is a slight uh, distinction which I think we should keep in mind. And also trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, except for the first trimester, it's quite safe. So if you, what I'm trying to tell you is that we can use these drugs specifically for UTI and preserve the others for other infections. Now, Dr. Firoz, we have a 64-year-old diabetic gentleman with severe symptoms of UTI. He is afebrile, alert, has no abdominal or costovertebral pain. What would you like to do? Uh, he is having severe symptoms of UTI, but he is afebrile. Yes. This is something. Cystitis. Assume this is okay. cystitis. Okay. okay. Yeah. So if he is having symptoms of cystitis, he needs uh, treatment. Like yes. we have to start with the uh, nitrofurantoin. 100 milligram mm -hmm. twice a day. Yeah, but because it's a male patient, here the urine culture should be sent. And if there is, he is giving his, a history of recurrent episodes of society, then definitely he needs an upper tract evaluation. Because uh, in male, UTI is not common. And if it is there, it, it, there must be some cause, some uh, anatomical factors, or like he is diabetic, so his sugar should be checked, whether it's uh, under control or it is very high. So that that is a risk factor for no, UTI. Excellent. I'm so happy you said you would like to do a culture and you would start with nitrofurantoin. That's really very brave of you. And uh, he comes back uh, with no relief on the third day. And the microbiology report says that it is ESBL E. coli. Sensitivity is as follows. So, Juri, what is ESBL? Okay. Uh, ESBL is uh, basically the full form would be extended spectrum beta lactamase. So these are a set of enzymes which inactivate the beta-lactam ring in the beta-lactam antibiotics, which, which would be the penicillin group of antibiotics and the cephalosporin group of anti antibiotics, except for cefamycin. I mean, the other, all of them have beta-lactam rings and uh, uh, any uh, organism which uh, is enabled to produce ESBLs will, uh, I mean, uh, none of the beta-lactam antibiotics will work on them. Yes. So no cephalosporin, none of the penicillins will work on them. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Now, Dr. Firoz actually did the smart thing. He ordered nitrofurantoin in the first place. But what you can see here is a very interesting uh, uh, finding that like everybody to understand that in ESBL, you find that nitrofurantoin is still working, phosphomycin is still working, and trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole may also be working. So please don't rush to any higher end drug weight, of course. And that is, uh, in, in so what does it mean? That even if I have high ESBL prevalence in my center, I can still safely give nitrofurantoin and phosphomycin. And as Dr. Firoz very nicely mentioned in the study, that if the trimethoprim uh, sulfamethoxazole uh, res resistance is less than 20, Percent one can easily give all these. So you still, what are you doing? You're saving on your fluoroquinolones and you're saving on your kephalosporins. So uh, Dr. Firoz, wonderful that you thought of nitrofurantoin as your first choice. Uh, okay. Sorry, Dr. Firoz, one more. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <sir. laughs> yeah. This is chronic prostatitis. He is afebrile, he's alert, he has uh, low abdominal pain. Uh, and a urine sample is sent to the microbiology laboratory and is given ciprofloxacin. Resistance to fluoroquinolone is 18%. Is this an appropriate choice? Yes, ma'am. Ciprofloxacin, yeah. Yes, I agree. Ciprofloxacin, why would you say ciprofloxacin is a good choice for prostatitis? Because this uh, penetration of ciprofloxacin in the prostate is uh, very good. Very good. The penetration Absolutely. of this antibiotic is very good. Very good, very good, exactly. And now where I think the microbiologists should now be interacting with the clinicians and tell them that if the fluoroquinolone resistance in our area is more than 10%, then it should not be given as an empirical management. It can be given if I'm sending you a report saying it's sensitive, that's a great idea. But otherwise, you may land up uh, having a patient who comes back to you, which is exactly what happened with this gentleman. And he comes back on the fourth day and the luckily you had sent a sample. I mean, that's what I think everybody would be doing. And it comes back with Lepsella pneumonia. And you see this susceptibility profile. So ciprofloxacin, unfortunately, is resistant. Ah, so, Juri, what type of resistance is being exhibited by this bacteria? 
sorry putting you in the dock all the time both of you rather <laughs> i'm sorry i i was looking at something else uh yeah i'll just look at this once again come yeah so uh, uh, so what were you saying again what type of resistance is being exhibited by this bacteria so this is an esbl yes this is an esbl dr firoz yes. you know that this is a esbl thank you juri yes yes ma'am Yes. Yeah, so, it is ESBL. It's Klebsiella pneumoniae ESBL, definitely. Yeah, because you know it's resistant to all your third generation Klebsiella. Not typically. Yeah. Yes, it's resistant to Zefepime, and you can see it's also resistant to Moxiclav. Now, amongst these drugs, which ones do you think you could still give? Of course, nitrofurantoin is out. Prostomycin is out because it did not penetrate the prostate. Yeah, the doxycycline can be given. Doxycycline absolutely can be given, and the new guidelines say that even azithromycin uh, can be given. Excellent, that yeah, is yeah. so so nice of you. So that's exactly what we can do. And the message is: please don't rush to piperacillin tazobactam. Please don't rush to meropenem. Uh, though of course you know it's ESBL. So the message is: don't get scared of ESBL. There are many many other drugs which can be used. So try to save your uh, cephalosporins for something else. Absolutely. I think I, I don't know if we'll proceed. Uh, how would you manage recurrent? I think we'll just skip this because you've already discussed this so well, and I think you also discussed this very well, Dr. Firoz. The negative impact of recurrent antimicrobial treatment. I mean, this is something which we need to remember and understand that recurrent UTI need not be treated all the time. You know, you have to look at the patient's profile because studies are now. I mean, would you, Dr. Firoz, would you like to talk yeah. about this? uh basically it is about that um, uh, asymptomatic bacteriuria but if the patient is having recurrent uti means recurrent symptomatic uti so uh, that needs treatment okay. yeah if the patient is having a symptomatic recurrent uti these patients require treatment and the most common treatment which we follow is to give a nitrofurantoin 50 mg sometimes 100 mg once yes. a day at bed time for 3 to 6 months Yeah, and right. apart from that, we uh, spend in uh, young sexually active uh, females. We advise them to uh, maintain the sexual hygiene. That is the uh, thing which uh, we should talk talk about. Sexual yeah. hygiene means before intercourse, just pass urine for both partners, and after immediately after intercourse, they should go and pass urine and clean. Because oh. otherwise, uh, the recurrent UTI is not going to get treated. Yes, yes, I do agree with you. But I was just reading up some latest guidelines, and they're talking about if a patient is healthy and has simple recurrent cystitis, you know, uh, the problem with uh, repeated antibiotics. Now, sometimes the clinician may give broad spectrum antibiotics and may give long uh, duration of antibiotics, or may give uh, antibiotics outside the guidelines. And what happens ultimately with these people is they may land up with organ damage, may land up with allergies. And may land up with a poorer quality of life. So there's American guidelines on neurology which came out, and have a very interesting take on it. So anyway, this is uh, something which everybody will have a different added a point about it. Doctor Juri, what do you understand by collateral damage? Would you like to tell us something about this? In yeah, the okay. Context? Yeah. So uh, collateral damage is when uh, you're using a particular antibiotic, and because of that, there is selection of. Uh, of organism which is resistant to that particular uh, antibiotic or to other antibiotics uh, because of antibiotic use there may be colonization by unwanted organisms organisms for example the gut flora might be replaced by something like you know uh, clostridial difficile or something some other uh, thing uh, gut organism which is path pathogenic uh it it can lead to the selection of multitrick organisms and uh, so uh, for example like cephalosporin use has been linked to uh, subsequent infection with vancomycin resistant enterococci to esbls uh, you know producing klebsiellas uh, to beta lactam resistant uh, enterobacter species etc uh, again uh, quinolones uh, which are also used so widely they've been linked with um, infection with methicillin resistant uh, staphylococcus aureus and with increasing quinolone resistant to um, to gram in gram negative bacilli so uh, yeah so 
antimicrobial use. Uh, so, so that, so th that's basically collateral damage. I, I do agree with you, and it's something which we all need to understand that we really yeah. play for with the microbiome. You know, the vaginal microbiome, the gut microbiome, and the interesting data now is that you know you alter the gut microbiome, you're also altering your brain. <laughs> you go into stress disorders and mental stress and. Uh, maybe people talking about fecal transplant. So we need to be very careful when you're giving antibiotics so that we don't really work around, play with our antimicrobiome. Do we have time? I don't know, but this is, I think we, we'll make this the last one because Dr. Firoz talked about it. Dr. Firoz, would you like to see this? 24 year old female underwent routine uh, checkup. Are we finished? Okay. Is that the end? Have we finished our time? That's fine. Yeah. Uh, doctor, we'll just ask Dr. Firoz this uh, particular yes, thing. Yes, ma'am. Uh -huh. This last one and we finish, all right? 24-year-old uh, female goes mm -hmm. for a uh, prior checkup before an elective cholecystectomy. And a lot of routine investigations were done, of which one was urine. And this report was sent. Uh, ma'am, uh, because uh, as I earlier said in my uh, slides, that uh, uh, any surgery, any prior surgery, which is not uh, like involving the urinary tract, breaching the mucosa of the urinary tract. So in that, in this, uh, in all the cases, the treatment of the um, asymptomatic bacteriuria is not required. Absolutely. So if it is, if it is supposed to be just col not cholecystectomy, some like prostate surgery, kidney stone surgery, uh, in that case, definitely this culture needs to be treated yes. uh, before uh, undergoing the surgery. But here, it is not required. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much. A last Thank message. You, Thank you so much. And uh, forget this. I would like to just leave the message here, which is coming up in a big way in, in, in the world of urology, is that do we need to treat every healthy woman with cystitis? Can we think of antimicrobial sparing protocols? Can we think of non-antimicrobial, you know, like pharmaceutical symptomatic managements? And that's something which we will have to start thinking of sometime or the other. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jury and Dr. Piroz for yeah, being such a sport pleasure, yeah. and going through this uh, session. I really enjoyed thank it. Thank you. I have thought that you would do this. <laughs> I could have expected it from you. <laughs> thank you so much, ma'am. So, <laughs> okay. I hope, uh, ma'am, we have an undergraduate day when we were scared of ma'am. But I'm hurry, okay? I'm as old as well. I'm not, I'm not an scared. undergrad. <laughs> Ma'am, me but and Dr. Feroz, we both are having Nams as students, and we used yeah. to hide our faces. <laughs> so you were just like, a, I hid behind the video. Ah, I'm not sure. 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 Ah, but I'm very proud of my students and my colleagues that you sat through it and you sweated it through with me. And I'm really proud that you actually walked the talk. What you talked is what you actually said. And I hope we all start doing that so that we preserve the antibiotics for the future generations. So thank you, Fatma. Thank you, Juri. Thank you, Firoz, thank you. for that lovely Firoz, experience. Uh, for Dr. Firoz, there is another question in the chat box also from Dr. Manzoor. If you want, you can answer in, in your private <laughs> message. <laughs> oh, okay. okay, okay. Thank, you. thank you so much. All of you, thank you so much. Nice. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. yeah, it was a pleasure. Yeah. Bye. 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 I hope you'll join tomorrow also, all of you. Yeah. Right. I'll sure, be there. Sure, sure. <laughs> yes, Fatima, lovely. You've done a great job and I'm really yeah, proud Absolutely, Fatima. Yeah. Thank you. Great job. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the organization, yeah, just organizing this uh, conference is uh, really being done from, uh, by Dr. Fatima. <coughs> okay. And the leader is on the map and I'm very proud of that. It's a Herculean okay. task. So keep it up. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Manas and the team. Now, shall we leave now, Manas? Yes, yeah. ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Okay, bye. bye.